The man known to history as Rudolf Hess was born on the 26th of April 1894 in Ibrahimia, a suburb of the city of Alexandria in the Nile Delta of northern Egypt. His father was Johann Fritz Hess, the owner of Hess & Company, a large import-export business which shipped goods from Egypt to Germany and had been founded in the 1860s to benefit from the new trade routes established by the completion of the Suez Canal in 1869, linking the Red Sea to the Mediterranean and negating the need for ships to travel around Africa to get from Europe to Asia. Rudolf's mother was Clara Hess, the daughter of a wealthy textile industrialist in Germany who had met Johann as a result of their respective family's business interests. Rudolf was their first child. Two others followed, a boy, Alfred, in 1897, and a girl, Margareta, after a long interval of 11 years in 1908. Rudolf was born in Egypt at an unusual time in the country's history. It had been a province of the Ottoman Empire for over 300 years, but during the course of the mid-19th century, Britain had gradually begun to unofficially take over Egypt in advance of the construction of the Suez Canal, a major project which was necessary for Britain to improve communications between London and the jewel of its empire, the British Raj of India. Thus, Hess effectively grew up in a British protectorate. Following the completion of the canal in 1869, many expat communities of merchants and traders from European countries popped up here, and the German community was significant enough in Alexandria that Hess was able to attend a German-language Protestant school there during his youth. His youth was formative and left him convinced of the racial superiority of people from countries like Germany and Britain, without whom Hess believed Egypt would be mired in pre-modern stagnation. He had already adopted that view by his teenage years, at which time he was sent to Switzerland by his father to begin studying economics and finance with a view to taking over the family business in due course. He studied there for a year between 1911 and 1912, before heading to Germany to take up an apprenticeship in the city of Hamburg. This video is in paid partnership with BetterHelp, the online therapy site used by over 4 million people to help you live a happier, healthier life. Is something interfering with your happiness or preventing you from achieving your goals? Then BetterHelp might be the solution for you. BetterHelp connects you with a credentialed therapist who is trained to listen and give you helpful, unbiased advice. With BetterHelp, you can bypass the difficulties associated with face-to-face -face therapy, as you can have your therapy sessions as a phone call, as a video chat, or even via messaging if you prefer that. Whatever's the most comfortable version of therapy for you. If you think you might benefit from therapy, consider BetterHelp. Click the link in the description or visit betterhelp.com slash people profiles. To get started, you'll fill out a questionnaire to help assess your specific needs. And then you'll be matched with your therapist, in most cases within 48 hours or less. People spend hours in the gym every week, so why not give your mind the same kind of attention? You'll be able to schedule therapy sessions at a time that's convenient for you. And if the therapist you're first matched with doesn't feel like the right fit, which can be common when starting therapy, you can easily switch to a new therapist at no additional cost. Clicking the link in the description helps support this channel, and it also gets you 10% off your first month of BetterHelp, so you can connect with a therapist and see if it helps you. While Rudolf was growing up in Egypt, Europe was becoming a place of growing tension. The German state had only recently come into existence. Prior to 1871, when the new German Empire was formed, Germany was a region made up of a few dozen smaller states, of which the largest was Prussia. When they were united in 1871, it upset the economic and political balance of Europe and Britain, but others were also perturbed by Germany's growing power. As a result, the European powers began dividing into two armed military alliances from the 1880s onwards, one centered on Germany and the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and the other comprising Britain, France, and Russia. Years of escalating tension caused by military, economic, and colonial rivalry 
as well as competition for land in regions such as the Balkans, saw the European diplomatic situation deteriorate precipitously. Then, in the summer of 1914, the heir to the throne of the Empire of Austria-Hungary, Archduke Franz Ferdinand, was assassinated by a Serb nationalist in the streets of Sarajevo, and the political crisis which ensued slowly escalated over a five-week period until all of the major European powers declared war on each other by early August 1914. It was the beginning of the First World War and a series of events which would have an enormous impact on Hess's life. At the time of the outbreak of the First World War, Hess was 20 years old and living in Germany, learning the family business. Within weeks, he had enlisted in the 7th Bavarian Field Artillery Regiment. His wartime service was extensive. For instance, he was soon involved in the First Battle of Ypres in the late autumn and early winter of 1914, one of the first major battles on the Western Front in northwestern France and Belgium, a region that would become the crucible of the entire war. He was soon earning promotions and awards for distinguished service, receiving the Iron Cross and being promoted to colonel in 1915. He then served at the bloody Battle of Verdun in France, which dragged on for most of 1916, before being posted to the Romanian Front in the Balkans Theatre in 1917. Throughout these periods of service, he was injured on several occasions, being hit by shrapnel multiple times, though these injuries were not extensive and he was soon back in service after a few weeks' convalescence. By 1918, he had determined to become a fighter pilot in the new field of aviation combat, but by then the war had swung dramatically against Germany, following the entry of the United States on Britain and France's side, and in early November 1918, as supply shortages and political unrest ravaged Germany internally, the country was forced to surrender to the British, French and US. The war was over, but the political scars which it created would continue to have drastic consequences for Europe. In the aftermath of the First World War, Germany entered a period of pronounced turmoil. In the closing stages of the war, Germany's imperial ruler, Kaiser Wilhelm II, had abdicated. A German Republic, named after the town its representatives first met in, Weimar, was declared. But the country was completely unstable for the two years that followed. For instance, German socialists and communists, who were inspired by the communist revolution that had occurred in Russia in 1917, began launching insurrections themselves in cities such as Berlin and Munich across Germany. On the other side of the political spectrum, right-wing nationalists were determined to prevent the left-wing socialists seizing power and were also bitter about the result of the war. The problem was compounded as the Treaty of Versailles, which concluded the war in 1919, restricted Germany to having an army of 100,000 men. As a consequence of this, hundreds of thousands of German men, who otherwise would have remained in the military after the war ended, were demobilized. They began joining right-wing paramilitary organizations, such as the Freikorps or Free Corps, which were engaging in running street battles against communists and other groups across Germany in 1919. In time, these gave way to new political groups, which were based on the idea of refuting Germany's post-war position and also finding scapegoats within German society to blame for the country losing the war. Many of these focused on the Jewish people as being responsible at a time when anti-Semitism was rife across nearly all of Europe. Hess soon became one of these young German men entering into extremist politics. He was discharged from the German army within weeks of the war ending, while he was further disillusioned by the collapse of the family business, which had been largely taken over by the British administration in Egypt during the war. Embittered, he gravitated towards both the Freikorps and the Tula Society in early 1919, the latter of which was a new political group that was rabidly anti-Semitic, and committed to the idea of resurrecting a sort of medieval German state which would dominate much of Central and Eastern Europe. By the beginning of the spring of 1919, he was active in both organizations in the Bavaria region of southern Germany, particularly in the regional capital of Munich, where there was a quasi-political war in process between right-wing groups such as the Freikorps and left-wing socialists 
who wanted to establish a communist state along the lines of that which was being fashioned in Russia following a political revolution there in 1917. Thus, Hess was involved in clashes between paramilitaries here in the spring and early summer of 1919. It was a formative period which would fashion Hess's political ideology as both a right-wing nationalist and as a committed anti-Semite. Germany's politics began to settle down eventually, as the new republic gained control of the situation in cities like Berlin, which had experienced its own attempted socialist coup in the Spartacist uprising of January 1919. As it did, the country began to prosper and enter a period of cultural vitality in the 1920s. However, the politics of Bavaria, and Munich in particular, continued to have an extreme edge to it. Out of the movements such as those of the Tula Society and the Freikorps, a new right-wing party emerged there in February 1920, the National Socialist German Workers' Party, known more widely as the Nazi Party, was anti-Semitic, zealously nationalist, and committed to reversing the humiliation which its members believed had been inflicted on Germany according to the terms of the Treaty of Versailles. Hess had enrolled in the University of Munich in 1919 and had been influenced while there by the teachings of Karl Haushofer, a professor of geopolitics who advocated for the idea that Germany should rejuvenate itself in the aftermath of the war by initiating new conflicts to acquire extensive Lebensraum or living space in Eastern Europe. He soon joined the Nazis and would bring this idea to the party in due course. Hesse's private life also changed during these years. In the spring of 1920, while he was still studying at the University of Munich, he had met a fellow student by the name of Ilse Prohl. They soon began seeing each other, but it would be seven and a half years before they were married, an unusually long courtship by the standards of the 1920s. Moreover, even when they did marry, they did not start a family for another decade and it was not until 1937 that Rudolf and Ilse would have their one and only child, a boy named Wolf Hess. If Hess's family life was limited, it was perhaps because he had become so devoted to the Nazi cause during the early 1920s in ways which would hinder his relationship with Ilse, although she shared his politics. Around the time he met his future wife, Hess had also heard a rising member of the Nazi party an Austrian veteran of the German army, Adolf Hitler, speak at a political meeting for the first time. Hess was impressed by his fiery rhetoric. So too were many others, and shortly afterwards, Hitler rose to become the leader of the party, replacing its first chairman, Anton Drexler, in 1921. Hess soon struck up a close relationship with Hitler, one that would become very close in the years that followed, and it was through this that Hitler made the concept of acquiring Lebensraum in Eastern Europe central to Nazi ideology. Hess and Hitler's relationship would become closer still in the mid-1920s. This was owing to the events of the early winter of 1923. Between his first rise to power within the party in 1921 and the autumn of 1923, Hitler had become increasingly convinced that the party needed to seize power in Munich through a military coup along the lines of those that had been attempted in many parts of the country in 1919. Thus, in the course of 1923, he and the other senior members of the party began planning an uprising in Munich, one which would be facilitated by the growing paramilitary wing of the Nazis, the Sturmabteilung or SA. The revolt was initiated on the 8th of November 1923, when over 2,000 Nazis and SA members tried to seize key locations in Munich, beginning with the Burger Breukeller Beer Hall in the city. However, the Beer Hall Putsch, as it became known, was a shambles, and within hours the city authorities were able to establish a major police presence in Munich which brought the city under control. Hitler fled the city, but was arrested two days later. Hess, who had been involved during the putsch in detaining city officials outside of Munich, fled in its aftermath, along with many others who had been involved, to Austria. But he was soon convinced to return and face sentencing. In the trials that followed throughout November and December 1923, Hitler was sentenced to five years in prison, 
a rather lenient punishment for the leader of an attempted coup. Hess was given 18 months. Both men were sent to Landsberg Prison in the southwest of Bavaria. The Nazi party was banned by the state government, but this would prove ineffective. In fact, the period of incarceration proved a formative one in the ascent to power of Hitler and the Nazis. While imprisoned at Landsberg, Hitler began dictating his political manifesto to both Hess and another Nazi member who was sentenced there with them, Emil Mauris. This sprawling, paranoid, anti-Semitic treatise was subsequently entitled Mein Kampf, meaning My Struggle, and was published in two volumes in 1925 and 1926. By the time the first volume appeared in print, its author was already a free man. The Bavarian state government, elements of which were sympathetic to the views of the Nazis, decided to release Hitler from Landsberg in mid-December 1924, having only served a year of his sentence. Hess was released ten days later, and within just two months, Hitler had also successfully petitioned the Bavarian government to lift the ban on the Nazis which had been imposed in the aftermath of the Beer Hall Putsch. Thus, somewhat incredibly, these individuals and their party, which had attempted a military coup just over a year earlier, were able to once again go about their business from the spring of 1925 onwards. Hess had become an unofficial secretary to Hitler while incarcerated at Landsberg. This position was formalized in the aftermath of their release as he was appointed private secretary to the Führer of the party in April 1925, with a fixed salary. It was the beginning of a period in which Hess would become known as Hitler's closest confidant, an individual who the leader always made time for, no matter what else was occurring. Indeed, the Nazis were wallowing in a political wilderness during the second half of the 1920s. The party had decided that they would attempt henceforth to seize power in Germany through the electoral system, but despite retaining a significant base of support in Bavaria and Munich in particular, they remained a party with only very limited support throughout Germany, despite the efforts of individuals such as Joseph Goebbels to establish new branches of the party in Berlin and elsewhere. Looking back today, it is difficult at times to remember what a collection of misfits, failures and political hacks the Nazi leadership, of which Hess was a part, were in the late 1920s. They would have remained as such, a party with a very small base of support in Bavaria and little else, had it not been for the events of the autumn of 1929. That year, a momentous economic crisis struck the developed world following the collapse of the stock markets on Wall Street in New York City. A catastrophic economic depression followed, one which led to mass unemployment across Europe and the Americas during the early 1930s. In time, it would eventually lead to rapid inflation in some countries and the loss of people's life savings. Germany was particularly badly affected, and as millions of Germans suffered and became despondent, they began to adhere to more extreme political groupings in their country. And as this occurred, the Nazis, who had garnered a tiny percentage of the vote in elections up to that point, gradually became more and more popular. Thus, when the Reichstag elections were held in September 1930, the party increased its vote percentage from about 2.5% nationally to over 18%. As a result, Hitler and his adherents claimed 107 seats in the 577-seat Reichstag. It was the beginning of a dreadful political revolution in Germany. Hess continued to acquire greater influence within the Nazi party as it was beginning to grow massively in popularity in the early 1930s. As the private secretary and spokesperson for Hitler, Hess found himself traveling the country with the Nazi leader as Hitler addressed huge audiences at political rallies across Germany, while the party gained ever more supporters. This placed Hess in a powerful position, where he could effectively control who had access to Hitler, a man fast becoming the most powerful politician in Germany, and one whom many people believed was effectively a chancellor in waiting. As he could ensure individuals' access to Hitler, or at least that their message or request for an audience would be passed on to the Führer, Hess developed significant powers of patronage, and all of this began to lead to greater official titles. Eventually, in 1932, he was placed in charge of the party liaison staff, 
a role which meant that he effectively controlled personal access to Hitler during campaigning, as well as being appointed chairman of the party's Central Political Commission. This meant Hess was largely the senior administrator within the Nazi party by 1932, although others, such as the head of the SS, Heinrich Himmler, and the chief propagandist, Goebbels, did, admittedly, have more control over policy matters. Hess was about to ascend to a position of considerable significance within Germany. This would be based on the Nazis' final seizure of power. By 1932, the economic situation in the country had become terminal, as the Great Depression showed no signs of abating. German banks were on the brink of collapse and the political situation was in freefall. Then, that summer, new Reichstag elections were held. In these, the first since September 1930, the Nazis once again increased their support dramatically, doubling their vote to 37% and claiming 230 seats in the 608-seat Reichstag. Yet this was not an outright majority, and the centrist political parties were unwilling to do business with the Nazis if it meant Hitler becoming Chancellor of Germany. As a consequence, a technocratic government was cobbled together, one which attempted to govern the country for a few months. However, this too proved ineffective, and new elections in November 1932 allowed Hitler to stoke fears amongst political centrists about the rise of the Communist Party of Germany. Thus, early in 1933, an agreement was reached between the Nazis, political centrists, and the leaders of the German business community that Hitler would become Chancellor of Germany in an effort to provide a more stable government and concretely address the economic situation. Unbeknownst to many of those who facilitated this, it was effectively a death sentence for the German Republic. Within weeks, Hitler used his new position to manufacture a political crisis and used that to pass an enabling act, which allowed himself and his fellow Nazis to effectively rule by decree. The Weimar Republic was over, and the Nazi Third Reich had commenced. Rudolf Hess had become a significant figure within the Nazi party during the late 1920s and early 1930s, based to a considerable extent on his personal relationship with Hitler and then on his promotion to a number of significant official positions within the party apparatus. However, this all paled into insignificance with his ascent following the Nazis' seizure of power in Germany in the spring of 1933, the extent of which must have surprised many within the Nazi senior hierarchy itself. Just weeks after the passage of the Enabling Act, Hitler appointed Hess as one of the 16 Reichsleiters who were created at this time. These Reichsleiters, or Empire leaders, were effectively the senior members of the Nazi party, who made up the new governing body of Germany. Most of them were also individuals who were appointed to ministerial positions within the new German government, and this indeed was a distinction which was awarded to Hess shortly afterwards, when, on the 1st of December 1933, he was made a minister without portfolio. This was a striking rise to official political office for an individual who had only first won a seat in the Reichstag in fresh elections which were held in fraudulent circumstances in March 1933, after Hitler had been appointed as Chancellor. However, all of these promotions in 1933 were dwarfed by the decision in the months following his ascent as Chancellor by Hitler to appoint Hess as Deputy Führer or deputy leader of the Nazi party in mid-April 1933. The significance of this might have been lost on individuals such as Himmler, Goebbels, or another contender to become second in command of the government, Hermann Goering, at this stage. But if they were in any doubt as to Hesse's seniority, this was displaced in September 1933 when Hitler decreed that Hess should cease to be termed a Reichsleiter and instead be addressed henceforth as the Deputy Führer in acknowledgement of his seniority amongst the other Nazi leaders. What this meant was that Hess was effectively Hitler's designated successor at this time, should anything happen to the Nazi leader. And it was in this capacity that he began acquiring an ever greater list of powers in the mid-1930s, monopolizing control over many aspects of Nazi policy relating to finances, health and education. 
He was also responsible for the signing of legislation into law and for organizing political events throughout Germany, notably the massive Nazi rallies which were organized at the city of Nuremberg annually after their seizure of power in 1933. Hess also had extensive powers to monitor individuals who were deemed enemies of the party. As such, Hess's position in Germany expanded greatly in line with his appointment as Deputy Führer. We might ask at this point exactly how ideologically committed to the Nazi cause Hess was. Was he a virulent anti-Semite and German nationalist, or was he primarily a zealous follower of Hitler above all else? The answer is both. There is no doubt that Hess was personally committed in an almost fanatical fashion to Hitler, but there is also no disputing the fact that he was committed to the same ideological values as his master too. Hess, for instance, needed no convincing that Germany's recent history needed to be viewed through the prism of a Jewish conspiracy to destroy the country. For instance, he viewed the League of Nations, which had been set up to ensure international peace in the aftermath of the First World War, as an instrument of an international Jewish plot, and also perceived many of Germany's enemies, such as the Soviet Union, as being controlled by Jewish politicians. It is interesting to speculate, given his pronounced paranoid delusions in these respects, exactly to what extent Hess had influenced some of Hitler's views that he stated in Mein Kampf years earlier. Moreover, Hess was also passionately convinced of the need to rejuvenate Germany and of the racial superiority of the German people over others such as the Slavs of Poland and Eastern Europe. While he may have been a zealous adherent of Hitler's, Hess did not need any convincing about the merits of the Nazis' racial ideology. Hess was far from alone in his ideological stance and the first years of the Nazi regime's reign in Germany saw a series of virulently anti-Jewish laws introduced into the country. On the 15th of September 1935, the Reichstag, which had become little more than a showpiece designed to rubber stamp what Hitler and the other senior Nazi leaders had already decided upon, passed a series of legislation aimed at the persecution of Germany's half a million Jewish citizens. The Nuremberg Laws, as they became known, effectively robbed Germany's Jews of their rights in Germany. Indeed, depending on the bloodline of the country's Jews, they were officially deprived of their citizenship. Other elements of the legislation forbade Jews from marrying non-Jewish Germans, while Jews were also heavily regulated in terms of their ability to employ non-Jewish Germans. Numerous measures were also put in place to restrict the Jewish community's ability to conduct business. The Nuremberg Laws were the first major step in a series of escalating persecutory measures which the Nazi state would implement in the coming years, culminating in the pre-war period in the infamous Kristallnacht, or Night of the Broken Glass, of November 1938, when thousands of Jewish businesses and synagogues were attacked and tens of thousands of Jews were either killed, attacked or detained. Because of his newfound position of seniority within Germany and his closeness with Hitler, Hess would also have been central to deliberations in the mid-1930s around German rearmament. One of the most significant terms of the Treaty of Versailles that had brought the First World War to an end was that Germany was restricted to an army, henceforth of no more than 100,000 troops, while it was completely prohibited from having an air force and anything other than a token navy. The Weimar government had exceeded these figures by keeping tens of thousands of troops enlisted in an unofficial capacity, but the German army remained small throughout the 1920s and into the 1930s. The Nazis quickly set about reversing this situation, arguing on the international stage that Germany had been humiliated for long enough and that it was only right that it should be allowed to move on from the war which had ended 15 years earlier. Berlin made an announcement in early 1935 that it would begin recruiting hundreds of thousands of men into a new German army, while a German air force to be called the Luftwaffe was also to be established. Thus, within a short period of time, the Nazis began rearming their country and in the spring of 1936, they moved troops into the Rhineland of Western Germany, a region which they were prohibited from placing troops in under the terms of Versailles. 
It was the beginning of the march to a war of revenge which Hitler had desired since 1918. Hess's role in German affairs continued to expand as this rearmament process was underway. In 1933, he had been placed in charge of establishing the Volksdeutsche Rat, meaning the Council of Ethnic Germans, a body which was responsible for reaching out to ethnic German communities living outside the borders of Germany, notably in places like Austria, the Sudetenland of Czechoslovakia and Western Poland. Some of these regions had formed part of Germany prior to the First World War, and the council was established with a view to improving Nazi relations with the German communities here in advance of reacquiring direct control of these territories, whether through diplomatic means or through war. Hess oversaw the management of the council and efforts within it to disrupt the politics of Germany's neighbours and agitate for return of lands lost in 1918. He was also directly involved during these years in the drafting of the Nuremberg Laws and other legislation aimed against groups such as Romani people and Jehovah's Witnesses, who the Nazis were also hateful of. He also acted increasingly as Hitler's representative in negotiations and conferences with the heads of the German business community, notably the presidents of companies such as IG Farben, Krupps and others which were deeply in league with the Nazis. Hess was Hitler's right-hand man as the march to war escalated in the late 1930s. As we have seen, the regime had begun rearming in 1935. This escalated in early 1938 as Berlin began to try to reclaim lands which it had lost in 1918 and other lands which the Nazis wanted to form into a greater Germany through aggressive diplomacy. This had been underway in many ways since 1933 in Austria where the Austrian Nazi party had attempted to undermine successive governments in Vienna. A different form of Austrian fascism emerged to fend off Germany's efforts to subsume the country, but by early 1938 German interference had become so intense that a referendum was declared on the matter of uniting the country with Germany. Preempting the result of this, Hitler ordered the German army into Austria in mid-March 1938. No major violence occurred, but the measure ensured that the union of the two countries, known as the Anschluss, was voted through easily days later. Thereafter, Hitler began pressing claims to much of Czechoslovakia, a country which was effectively annexed in two intervals in late 1938 and the spring of 1939, as Britain and France tried to avoid a new war by appeasing Hitler. However, when Czechoslovakia was fully dismembered in March 1939, it was clear that any further act of aggression would mean war. Thus, when the Nazis invaded Poland on the 1st of September 1939, Britain and France responded by declaring war in turn on Germany. The Second World War had commenced. Hess's roles changed substantially with the outbreak of the conflict. He became increasingly involved, for instance, in the measures being taken to organize the occupation of Poland in the autumn and winter of 1939, following a swift, successful military campaign in September and early October. Much of this revolved around identifying the country's three and a half million Jewish people and preparing for their persecution under German rule. For instance, Hess was responsible for overseeing the establishment of a registry of all Polish Jews and also the adoption of policies which would effectively commence the creation of Lebensraum in Poland by stripping the current inhabitants of the region of their rights. Thus, Hess's sphere of activity increased to include administrative responsibilities in Poland. Much of this was against his own inclinations and Hess wanted to be more active in combat. The deputy Führer had a lifelong interest in aviation, having signed up to join the nascent German Air Force in 1918 towards the end of the First World War. He had subsequently learned to fly in the late 1920s and participate in aviation races throughout the 1930s. Consequently, when Hitler initiated the war in September 1939, Hess had sought to join the Luftwaffe and to fly active missions in the war. Yet Hitler had forbidden this stating that Hess was too important a figure within the regime to risk his life flying standard aviation missions. This prohibition was later reduced to a one-year ban, 
but when Hess finally took to the skies during the war, it would be for an altogether stranger mission than he had envisaged in 1939. The Second World War was a slow conflict at first. Poland was conquered by the Nazis in a matter of weeks, and thereafter there were months of inaction on all sides as Britain and France tried to rearm as quickly as possible. This belated effort on their part proved costly, and when Hitler finally ordered the German Wehrmacht westwards in the spring of 1940, Denmark, Norway, the Low Countries and France were all conquered in a matter of a few months. Thus, by the late summer that year, the Nazi state stood in control of virtually all of Central Europe and much of Western Europe, while those states in these regions which remained outside of Nazi control such as Italy, Switzerland and Spain were either allies or neutral in the war. Only Britain stood against Germany, and that late summer and autumn, a massive campaign began by land and sea to bomb the country and choke off its resources to force London to submit. This latter campaign, which has come to be known by various terms such as the Blitz, meaning the bombing of British cities by the German Air Force, the Battle of the North Atlantic to refer to the German Navy's efforts to strangle Britain's supply lines by attacking its merchant navy at sea, and the Battle of Britain, more broadly, would provide the backdrop to one of the defining episodes of Rudolf Hess's life. During the course of 1940 and early 1941, Hess and Hitler's relationship began to deteriorate. This was not because of a major incident or falling out between the pair. Rather, it was simply that Hess was deprived of the personal contact and interaction with the Führer, which so much of his career and position had been based on since the mid-1920s. The reason for this was Hitler was now largely basing himself out of military compounds in Germany and Poland as he prepared for a vast invasion of the Soviet Union in the summer of 1941, as he spent more time absent from Berlin and Munich, where Hess continued his administrative work, the pair interacted less and less. It was at this particular juncture that Hess began making plans to engage in one of the most peculiar acts of the entire Second World War. From the early autumn of 1940, Hess began initiating contact with the Duke of Hamilton, with a view to having him act as an intermediary with King George VI of Britain. Hess believed they could collectively initiate peace proceedings between Nazi Germany and Britain. Hess's motives in doing so, which were kept secret from Hitler and all the other Nazi leaders, and which were effectively treasonous as a result, seemed to have been born out of his concern regarding the feasibility of invading the Soviet Union without first ending the war with Britain. Hess's efforts on this issue continued through the autumn and winter of 1940. By this time, he had come to believe that King George was effectively opposed to the British government, led by the Prime Minister Winston Churchill, concerning the commitment to continue the war with Germany. As such, he believed it would be possible to use Hamilton as an intermediary with the King and establish peace with Britain. To that end, in November 1940, Hess began making preparations to fly to Britain himself, piloting a Messerschmitt Bf 110 fighter bomber plane. As part of this, he began customizing one of these planes to increase its fuel load and fit it with equipment he might need for his mission. And then, on the 10th of May 1941, Rudolf Hess, the deputy leader of Nazi Germany, set off on a solo flight from Germany over the North Sea towards Britain. Just over five hours later, having been detected by the RAF and running short of fuel, he parachuted out of his plane in the skies over southern Scotland at 23.06 pm local time. Hess later described his pride in having successfully made it to Britain on his mission. He didn't last long unhindered though. Less than an hour after landing, he was apprehended and detained south of Glasgow. Following his initial detention, Hess claimed to be a German officer called Alfred Horn. Posing as this individual, he then requested to be allowed to meet with the Duke of Hamilton. It was only when this request was granted and he met with Hamilton the following day that Hess revealed his true identity and disclosed the purpose of his mission. 
the deputy Führer must have been surprised when Hamilton did not have as positive a reaction as Hess had been led to believe he would have to his mission. Instead, Hamilton headed south to disclose what had occurred and to confer with Churchill in London. Here, it was determined that Hamilton would meet with Hess again at Buchanan Castle in Stirlingshire in Scotland, where he had been detained. Thus, a second meeting was organized, at which Hess detailed his proposals for peace. Hess believed a mutually beneficial dispensation could be arrived at if Britain made peace with Germany. Through this, Germany was to be given free reign to rule the European continent, while Britain would be allowed to retain its independence and also control over its vast overseas empire. As Hess saw it, it was a logical mutual agreement for the British and Germans, two of the racially advanced European nations to come to. His captors, however, disagreed, and it became clear to Hess in the days that followed that his mission had been completely in vain. Meanwhile, back in Germany, news of Hess's unsanctioned mission had reached Hitler by midday on the 11th of May, just 12 hours after Hess had parachuted to the ground in Scotland. It was delivered via a letter Hess had prepared prior to his departure. Despite Hess outlining his reasons for his mission and trying to justify them on the basis that they were in Germany's best interests and favourable to the war effort, Hitler reacted furiously. He quickly stripped Hess of all his positions, abolishing the position of Deputy Führer and assigning his duties to Martin Bormann, another senior administrator within the regime. In an effort to manage the political fallout, a bizarre program of arresting and persecuting astrologers and faith healers whom Hess had been known to consult was also initiated in order to suggest that the deputy Führer had acted as he had after being influenced by occultists of some kind. Thus, Hess was completely disowned by the Nazi regime as a result of his mission. In Britain, his situation was equally dispiriting. After learning that his mission had been futile, he was briefly imprisoned in the Tower of London before being sent to Mitchett Place in Surrey, a fortified mansion designated as Camp Z, where he would spend nearly a whole year under house arrest. Hess's first years in detention in Britain would see the course of the war begin to shift dramatically. When he first flew into Scotland in the early summer of 1941, the Nazis had reached a position of enormous strength, having conquered a vast part of Europe from the Bay of Biscay in western France east to Poland and the western parts of what is now Ukraine and from the northern stretches of Norway, south to the Balkans. Campaigns were also underway to conquer Greece and North Africa in conjunction with Hitler's ally, the Italian dictator Benito Mussolini. However, just six weeks after Hess landed in Britain, Hitler initiated a vast invasion of the Soviet Union. At first, this went very well for Germany, and it seemed that the Nazis would soon be able to force the Soviet leader, Joseph Stalin, to cede most of Eastern Europe to them as well. But that winter, the German Wehrmacht began to meet with more determined resistance in Russia outside the cities of Moscow and Leningrad. Then, in December 1941, the United States entered the war against the Nazis after it was attacked by Hitler's other major ally, the Empire of Japan. Thus, in 1942, ominous reversals of fortune began for Hitler and his accomplices, as the campaigns in both North Africa and on the Eastern Front in Russia began to shift in the favour of the Allies. Things were faring no better for Hess in Britain. At Mitchard Place in Surrey, he was under house arrest. His circumstances here were comparatively favourable to those of an average German prisoner of war in Britain, and certainly better than those of the average prisoner of war in German custody on the continent. For instance, Hess was allowed to move freely about the rather pleasant surroundings of much of the mansion house and was able to write home to his family in Germany. The major deprivations were that he could not listen to the radio or read the newspapers, and the mansion and grounds were guarded by over 150 armed soldiers. This information blackout ensured that Hess did not receive any news about the course of the war, which he might be able to use to manipulate his situation. Yet, despite the rather pleasant circumstances in which he was imprisoned, Hess's psychological state was deteriorating throughout the spring and early summer of 1942. 
as he claimed that secret forces with special psychic powers were attempting to control figures like Churchill. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the Nazi in Hess associated these secret forces with a Jewish plot. There is debate to this day, though, as to whether or not Hess was feigning his psychological deterioration. One of the terms of the Geneva Convention on the Treatment of War Prisoners stipulated that those who were mentally incapacitated had to be repatriated to their home nation, and Hess was possibly trying to get back to Germany through this loophole. In mid-June 1942, Hess's situation changed considerably. Early on the morning of the 16th, he attempted to commit suicide, or at least make it seem as though he were attempting to take his own life by jumping over a railing of a staircase at Mitchett Place and falling onto a stone floor below. The fall didn't kill him, but he did fracture his left leg. Thus, he was forced to use crutches for weeks thereafter, and a decision was taken based on his deteriorating mental health and increasing assertions that he was being poisoned at the mansion house to send him to Maindiff Court Hospital in southeastern Wales on the 26th of June 1942. Hess would spend the remaining three years of the war confined here. His circumstances didn't really improve while there. The surroundings were certainly less pleasant, though as the war continued to go favorably for the Allies, Hess was increasingly allowed access to the newspapers and given a radio. He complained regularly of suffering from a wide range of ailments related to his internal organs, Complaints which his physicians, who at first were unaware that Hess was a lifelong hypochondriac, might have taken seriously at first, but soon learned to ignore. Thus did the former Deputy Führer of Nazi Germany spend the last three years of the Second World War. By this time, the war was heading towards an inexorable conclusion. In late 1942, one of the most significant clashes of the entire conflict had been fought between the Germans and the Russians for control of the southern Russian city of Stalingrad. It had ended in the first disastrous German defeat of the entire war. Then, in the spring of 1943, with a large injection of US personnel and supplies, the Western Allies were able to gain victory in the North Africa campaign, forcing the Italians and Germans out of both Libya and Tunisia. That summer, they followed up on this by opening a southern front in Sicily in southern Italy. However, this proved to be a more limited new front compared to the one which was opened in Western Europe in the summer of 1944 following the D-Day landings in Normandy. Within weeks, the Allies were able to liberate Paris, just as the Russians advanced into Poland. By the end of 1944, despite a last, desperate counteroffensive by Hitler in the Ardennes region of Belgium and Luxembourg, that December, the Western Allies were preparing to invade the Rhineland early in 1945, as the Russians began their military buildup in Poland in advance of invading eastern Germany. The war was effectively over. It was simply a race to see who would capture Berlin first. Back in Britain at Maindiff Court Hospital, Hess was not responding well to news of developments on the continent. On the 4th of February 1945, he attempted to commit suicide for a second time by stabbing himself with a blunt bread knife. By that time, he was aware that the Russians were advancing on Berlin from the east of the country, and the British, Americans and other Western allies were attempting to make their descent on the German capital as well before the war ended. Perhaps it is a sign of his mental decline that Hess believed the bread knife could ever inflict a sufficient enough wound to kill himself and the surface gash required little more than two stitches afterwards. Thereafter, he engaged in a hunger strike. However, this too was abandoned when he was informed that he would be force-fed if he continued on that path. By now, the British government was determined to keep Hess alive for the purposes of having him appear at the major war crimes trial which was being planned for the Nazi leadership once the conflict was over. They were sorely in need of senior members of the regime to stand trial as the war drew to a conclusion. As with Berlin surrounded by the Russians in late April 1945, Hitler killed himself on the 30th and his designated successor Goebbels followed suit a day later on the 1st of May. 
Thus, although he had been in custody in Britain for four years by the time the war in Europe officially came to an end on the 8th of May 1945, Hess would be one of the senior defendants at the planned war crimes tribunal. Hess was repatriated to Germany in the autumn of 1945 for the purposes of standing trial before the International Military Tribunal, which had been established to oversee the war crimes trials at the city of Nuremberg after the war. He was to be tried, along with the remaining senior members of the Nazi regime, in the headline first trial. Individuals such as the head of the Luftwaffe and Hitler's designated successor for much of the war, Hermann Goering the head of the Wehrmacht, Wilhelm Keitel, the war economy minister and Hitler's architect, Albert Speer, and the head of the general government of occupied Poland, where the Holocaust of millions of Europe's Jews had primarily been carried out after Hesse's flight to Scotland in May 1941, Hans Frank. There were 23 men involved in all in the trial. Generally, these individuals were to be tried with having incited the war, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and broad violations of the laws governing warfare. The trial, watched intently by the world's media, would be held at Nuremberg from November 1945 onwards and lasted nearly 11 months. Hess was in poor physical condition when he arrived to Nuremberg in the autumn of 1945. He weighed little more than 10 stone and was paranoid that his captives in Britain had been poisoning his food. As a result, he had brought samples of what he had been fed with him to Germany, with the goal of presenting them as evidence of his mistreatment in Britain. But these were immediately confiscated. When the time for the trial came, he started to claim that the amnesia he was suffering from already in Britain had worsened. Moreover, he refused to acknowledge the legitimacy of the court, claiming that the entire tribunal was effectively a show trial, at the end of which he expected himself and all of his fellow defendants to be found guilty and executed. He was wrong in this. While Goering and several others who had a clear and direct hand in the Holocaust of the continent's Jewish people and other groups such as the Romani were indeed sentenced to death, others were spared. Hess was amongst them. While he was deemed to be guilty of having helped to incite the war, his defense lawyer argued that Hess could not be held responsible for the Holocaust and other war crimes which had largely occurred after Hess made his flight to Scotland and was imprisoned. Accordingly, he was sentenced to life in prison, but spared the death penalty. Hess began serving his sentence at Spandau Prison in Western Berlin in July 1947. He was confined there with six others who had been placed on trial with him at Nuremberg including Speer, the foreign minister, Konstantin von Neurath, and the two senior heads of the German navy under the Nazis, Karl von Donitz and Erich Reder. The prisoners were held under difficult circumstances early on, with strict rules forbidding them from conversing with one another and severe limitations on their access to writing materials. As time went by, these restrictions were loosened. Hess, however, remained a broken figure. He continued to believe his food was being poisoned, refused to have any visitors, and was known to cry out in his sleep. Despite this situation, he continued to be confined at Spandau, as an assessment in 1957 deemed him well enough not to warrant being sent to a psychiatric unit. Moreover, the prison was gradually emptying. Four of Hesse's fellow Nazi prisoners were released in the mid-1950s, having either served their sentences or on the grounds of severe ill health. The final two others, Albert Speer and Baldur von Schirach, who had been the Nazi governor of occupied Vienna, were released together on the 30th of September 1966, having both served their 20-year sentences. Thus, henceforth, Spando Prison, which had 600 cells, housed Rudolf Hess as its sole prisoner from 1966 onwards. Three years after Speer and von Schirach left Spandau, things began to change slightly. Although for many years he had been in contact with his wife Ilse and son Wolf, as well as his daughter-in-law Andrea, whom he had never met in person, he had repeatedly declined their requests to visit him. But following a period of illness in 1969, when he was moved briefly to a medical hospital to treat a perforated ulcer, 
he relented and allowed them to visit. It was the first time he had seen his wife and son since 1941. Thereafter, many individuals began to petition for his release, particularly as he began to suffer from many different ailments, including prostate cancer. However, these would all be declined on the grounds that Hess had never shown any remorse for his actions and was still a committed anti-Semite. His unwillingness to feign some remorse to advance the case for his release was just one aspect of Hess's unrelentingly peculiar approach to those who visited him. For instance, when historians showed up to interview him in an effort to better understand why he had flown into Britain in 1941 without telling anyone in the Nazi leadership what he was doing, Hess would tell them he had been inspired to do so by supernatural forces which visited him in a dream. Rudolf Hess was found dead on the 17th of August 1987 in a room in the garden at Spandau Prison which had been converted to allow him a summer reading room. He had apparently hanged himself using an extension cord which he had strung over the latch of one of the windows of the room. Although a suicide note was found on his person and the allied bodies which had been charged with overseeing Spandau Prison for four decades quickly ruled his death a suicide, some doubts were raised at the time. Hess, after all, was in his early 90s by that time, and many people believed he could not possibly have managed to hang himself. However, there seems little reason to think otherwise. Why would any other power with access to Spandau have suddenly decided to kill him after 40 years of being imprisoned there? Additionally, it was noted at the time that Hess's mental state had never been good and he had previously attempted suicide at Spandau in 1977. Following his death, Spandau Prison, of which he had been the sole prisoner for 21 years, was demolished to prevent it becoming a neo-Nazi shrine. Rudolf Hess was in many ways the last of the senior Nazis to die. Rudolf Hess is one of the strangest of all the senior members of the Nazi regime to assess. While many studies have often commented on his personal relationship with Hitler, there is also no doubting he was an ideological Nazi, one who was both a committed right-wing nationalist and an anti-Semite, while also espousing the racial hierarchy which allowed the Nazis to have no compunctions about mass-murdering millions of Jews, Poles, Romani, Russians and other peoples across Europe during the Second World War. Moreover, he was absolutely central to the operations of the party once the Nazis seized power in 1933 overseeing the passage of legislation and even drafting parts of notorious ones such as the Nuremberg Laws. While subsequent events would complicate his reputation, there is no doubting that Hess was every bit as committed to the Nazi ideology as Hitler, Himmler or Goebbels. Indeed, we will never know how much he might have influenced some of Hitler's own ideas as he was drafting Mein Kampf at Landsberg Prison in 1924. Despite all of this, Hess is more difficult to assess than figures like Himmler and Goebbels. This is all because of the events of May 1941, when Hess decided to fly on a solo mission to Britain with the goal of initiating peace talks between Britain and Nazi Germany. His mission was a complete failure, but because of it, many people have judged Hess less harshly than some of his associates within the Nazi leadership. But there seems to be little reason to do so. Hess's actions might have been driven by his declining mental health, but they were nevertheless quite in line with Nazi ideology. The deputy Führer was not trying to bring about peace in Europe through his mission. He was simply trying to ensure that Britain was no longer an adversary before Germany went to war with Russia. Given the apocalyptic plans which the Nazis had for Eastern Europe, had they defeated the Soviet Union, there is little sense in finding some redeeming quality in Hesse's efforts to simply shore up Germany's western borders in order to more effectively wage war in the east. Moreover, Hess never showed any remorse for his actions and remained committed to much of the Nazis' ideology down to his death, more than four decades after the war ended. He lived and died a full-blooded Nazi throughout his life, and neither his complicated psychology nor his actions in 1941 changed that. What do you think of Rudolf Hess? Should he be judged in the same way that the other senior members of the Nazi regime have been? 
or do his curious actions in heading to Scotland in 1941 to initiate peace talks exonerate him to some extent of his crimes? Please let us know in the comment section. And in the meantime, thank you very much for watching. The man known to history as Erich von Manstein was born on the 24th of November 1887 in Berlin. His full name was Fritz Erich Georg Eduard von Manstein, a name which clearly indicated his aristocratic background. His father was Eduard von Lewinsky, a general of the Prussian military and an aristocrat of that same state. The Prussian state was the largest of the dozens of Germanic states in the early 19th century. In 1871, under its highly skilled political leader, Otto von Bismarck, Prussia had succeeded in uniting the various German states into a new German empire, one which was dominated by Prussia. Thus, von Manstein was born into a family that was high up in the aristocracy and military of not just Prussia, but the new German empire. Erich's mother was Helena von Sperling. Erich was his parents' tenth son, and because Helena's younger sister, Hedwig, was unable to have children with her husband Georg von Manstein, they allowed the couple to adopt Erich. Thus, while Erich's biological parents were Eduard and Helena von Lewinsky, his adoptive parents were Georg and Hedwig von Manstein, and it was that name he would bear throughout his life. However, whether it was his von Lewinsky relations or his von Manstein adoptive family, nearly all of them were involved in the Prussian military. In total, nearly two dozen members of Erich's immediate or close family were members of the Prussian military, and as scions of the Prussian aristocracy, a huge number of them were also of the officer class. Thus, there was little doubt as to what career young Erich would be encouraged to enter into. Erich grew up surrounded by military icons, although the new German state was largely at peace in the 1890s when he was growing up. It had not always been so. Back in the 1860s and early 1870s, when Prussia was still one of many German states, it had engaged in a series of wars with Denmark, Austria, and then France. In the course of these, it had succeeded not just in acquiring new territories from these three countries in regions like Schleswig-Holstein in the north and Alsace and Lorraine in the west, but it had also brought the 30 or so other German states such as Bavaria into a pan-German alliance. Eventually, following a speedy victory in the Franco-Prussian War, which Prussia initiated in 1870, a new German empire was declared in 1871. This united the German states into one country, but it was dominated from its inception by Prussia, which had already controlled vast parts of northern and eastern Germany, as well as parts of what is now northwestern Poland. As such, even as a new German state came into existence, its military was dominated by Prussian military families such as the von Mansteins. This would remain the case well into the 20th century and would shape the course of Erich's life. In line with his family's background, young Erich was sent to the Lyceum, a pre-military training school in Strasbourg, in 1894, when he was just seven years of age. The German state had established a major military presence here, in the foremost city of the region of Alsace and Lorraine, which it had conquered from France 20 years earlier. This was a provocative act, one which was indicative of the rising tensions across Europe over the emergence of Germany as the foremost political, military and economic power on the continent, one which now rivaled Britain as a European power. In Strasbourg, von Manstein began some early elements of his training to become a military officer one day. Then, in 1899, he advanced to a cadet school, where he was widely interpreted as being an above-average student during his teenage years. In the mid-1900s, he began advanced training at various locations, eventually within the Prussian War Academy in Berlin. This would last years, through to the early 1910s, and as it was occurring, Europe was increasingly dividing into two armed military alliances, one headed by Germany and including the massive Austro-Hungarian Empire, the other consisting essentially of Britain, France and Russia. Tensions between these two armed camps would soon escalate in ways that would shape von Manstein's life 
and the history of the 20th century. In the summer of 1914, the growing tensions between Europe's major powers finally spilled over into direct conflict following a regional crisis in the Balkans involving the assassination of the heir to the throne of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Archduke Franz Ferdinand. In early August, Austria, Hungary and Germany declared war on Britain, France and Russia, one after another. The German military plan was to launch an assault into northern France through Belgium with the goal of seizing Paris quickly and knocking France out of the war, as had been done at the time of the Franco-Prussian War, nearly half a century earlier. To this end, von Manstein was quickly involved on the Western Front, notably the significant capture of the town of Namur and the surrounding fortifications in the first weeks of the conflict. However, he was quickly transferred thereafter to the Eastern Front in Poland, where the Germans were beginning their plans to confront the Russians. The war would soon stagnate into a stalemate on both fronts, with extensive trench warfare in northeastern France in particular. What is significant about von Manstein's transfer between the two arenas is that, in 1914 and 1915, he gained experience of Germany waging war in both Western and Eastern Europe, something which provided him with a basis for devising strategies in both theatres many years later. Von Manstein was shot and injured late in 1914 and spent six months back in Germany recuperating. However, thereafter, he was redeployed to both the Eastern Front against the Russians and in the Balkans, where a complex war was being fought, with both alliances having acquired allies amongst countries such as Greece, Romania and Bulgaria. Then, in 1916, he was sent back to France to play the role of a junior officer in the planning of offensive operations around the town of Verdun, in what would become one of the most significant engagements of the entire war on the Western Front. Thereafter, he was returned to the Eastern Front, and then to the Western Front again in 1918. All of this was vital training for the young von Manstein, who would not see a major war again until 1939. As a result, like many of the German officer class of the Second World War, his experiences of combat and command were shaped as a much younger man during the First World War. But it was ultimately an experience of defeat. In 1917, the United States entered the war on the side of Britain and France, and with the increased resources available to the Atlantic Allies filtering into France, Germany found itself on the back foot militarily. This, combined with Germans being starved of basic resources at home, led to serious unrest in the country, which eventually spilled into violent disturbances. In early November 1918, the ruler of Germany, Kaiser Wilhelm II, abdicated, and just days later, German surrender to Britain, France and the Americans was agreed. The First World War was over. The terms under which the war was brought to an end were highly unfavourable to Germany. Although the country had gained massive tracts of land from Russia in a separate treaty in 1917, Britain and France forced the new Weimar Republic, which had taken control of Germany, to renounce this land and much more besides on Germany's eastern flank in order to create a new Polish state. Austria-Hungary also suffered a similar truncation, and entirely new countries came into existence in Central Europe, such as Czechoslovakia, formed out of lands which had been formerly held by Germany and Austria-Hungary. On top of this, Germany was obliged, under the terms of the Treaty of Versailles, which brought the war officially to an end, to accept unequivocal guilt for having caused the war, and to pay major war reparations for years to come, in order to reimburse France and Belgium in particular for the devastation inflicted on their countries. In order to ensure this money was paid, the French and Belgians were allowed to occupy parts of Western industrial Germany for years to come. Finally, as a guarantee that Germany would not upset the future peace of Europe, a clause of the treaty also required the German Imperial Army to be disbanded entirely and replaced with a trimmed-down Reichswehr which was not to exceed the size of 100,000 men. Furthermore, the country was completely prohibited from having its own air force. For the majority of German soldiers and officers, the Treaty of Versailles meant they lost their positions within the army. Not so for von Manstein, who had garnered a reputation as an effective strategist and logistician during the war. 
Accordingly, he was one of the chosen few who were retained as part of the Reichswehr into the 1920s. This was a period of immense unrest in Germany, as localized revolts in cities like Berlin and Munich broke out across the country in 1919 and 1920. The limited German military was consequently stretched thin trying to control the situation and there were extensive opportunities for von Manstein to rise within the ranks. By 1921, he had been appointed as a company commander, and in the years that followed, he began teaching military history and tactics, before finally being promoted to the rank of major in 1927 and gaining appointment to the general staff of the Reichswehr, the organizational command of the German military. Eventually, he would be appointed as a lieutenant colonel in the Reichswehr. He also became a family man during the 1920s, marrying Jutta Sibylle von Lösch in 1920 after a courtship of three days. They had three children in the years that followed, Gisela in 1921, Gero in 1922, and Rüdiger in 1929. These were not just formative years in von Manstein's military career and family life. The 1920s and early 1930s also saw the rise to power of an extremist group in Germany. The National Socialist German Workers' Party, or Nazi Party, had emerged from the fractured politics of Bavaria and the city of Munich in particular in the early 1920s. Led by an Austrian demagogue named Adolf Hitler, they were a fringe group who wanted to overturn the Versailles Treaty and impose an extreme form of racial politics on Germany one which blamed groups such as the Jews for all of Germany's woes, and argued that new wars should be launched by a revitalized Germany to conquer vast territory from groups such as the Slavs of Eastern Europe, whom they viewed to be racially inferior. For much of the 1920s, there remained nothing more than a small party in Bavaria, with a following amongst the profoundly disaffected. But when the economies of the Americas and Europe were hit by the Wall Street crash, and then the Great Depression from 1929 onwards, their message of anger and revenge began to resonate with German voters. They made major gains in the Reichstag elections of 1930 and became the largest party in the country in 1932. Thus, after a brief period in which the centrist parties had attempted to block their path to power, Hitler was able to ascend as German Chancellor early in 1933. He and his followers quickly dismantled the Weimar Republic and created a one-party state. This would all have enormous consequences for von Manstein's future years. One of the first issues at hand for the Nazis upon seizing power in 1933 was to begin overturning the provisions within the Treaty of Versailles for Germany to remain largely demilitarized. A reorganization of the military saw von Manstein quickly promoted to the position of a full colonel in the spring of 1934. But the real shift began early in 1935, when Hitler announced to Britain and France that Germany intended to begin rebuilding its military to a strength of nearly half a million men, in direct violation of the Versailles Agreement. In tandem, a new air force named the Luftwaffe was to be established. As part of these measures, the administrative organization of the German military, renamed the Wehrmacht, was reformed in the months that followed. Von Manstein's talents were recognized when, on the 1st of July 1935, he was promoted to the position of head of the operations branch of the Army General Staff. This was effectively one of the most senior administrative and operational positions within the beating heart of the German military command in Berlin, and it was soon followed with an additional promotion to the rank of General Major making von Manstein a senior military commander within the new German Wehrmacht. One might ask at this point exactly how close to the Nazi leadership von Manstein was. Was he an adherent of their political positions, or was he simply an army commander who fortuitously gained promotion as Hitler and the Nazis began rapidly expanding the German military in the 1930s? The answer is that there is extensive evidence to suggest that von Manstein's politics were very much in line with Nazi ideology. There is significant documentary evidence extant today which testifies to his belief that the twin forces of the Bolshevik communists of Soviet Russia and the Jews of Europe were joined in some imaginary plot to destroy the German people. As such, he perceived Germany's mission as being to prevent the rise to power of the Bolsheviks 
throughout Europe, backed by a Jewish conspiracy. There is also contradictory evidence which suggests that he was willing to oppose the Nazis on occasion. For instance, in 1934, he was one of the few German military officers who opposed the introduction of the so-called Aryan Paragraph, a stipulation which was introduced into military doctrine that individuals had to have Aryan blood, which was code for German blood, in order to serve. However, overriding this again is von Manstein's speech at Hitler's 50th birthday in April 1939, in which he wholeheartedly endorsed the Nazi Party's racial and political ideologies and claimed that he would welcome a world war to see their vision implemented. He would not have long to wait. German remilitarization in 1935 had been just the first step in the country's advance to war. Originally, the Nazis had intended on waiting until 1941 or 1942 to go to war. But in the late 1930s, they realized that Britain and France's remilitarization was slow enough that they would be best to strike quickly. As a result, in 1938, Germany's foreign policy became more aggressive, annexing Austria into a greater Germany in a quasi-military diplomatic coup in March of that year. Further land grabs on Czechoslovakia occurred in the autumn, but this simply prefigured the wholesale annexation of the country in the spring, as well as the seizure of some territory in the Baltic states region at the same time. By now, the British and French were declaring that they had had enough. If Hitler proceeded to try and make good on his claims to land in Poland, they informed Berlin they would have no option but to declare war in defense of Polish independence. This is exactly what happened in early September 1939 after Germany invaded the country. It was the beginning of the Second World War, which von Manstein had spoken of just months earlier at Hitler's birthday. Von Manstein was immediately involved in the war. Prior to the invasion of Poland, he had been promoted as the Chief of Staff to General Gerd von Rundstedt, the commander of Army Group South, who was to oversee the military incursion into Germany's eastern neighbor. In this new capacity, he played a significant role in developing the operation plan for the invasion. Here, one of his favored approaches, which he would advise Hitler to deploy in multiple theaters, was on display. It was von Manstein who advised that the 10th Army under Field Marshal Walter von Reichenau should attack in force to break through the Polish lines and then surround much of their forces west of the River Vistula. A thrust could then be made to seize the Polish capital, Warsaw, quickly. This approach of von Manstein's was partially integrated into the plan for the invasion. It proved effective and was one of the reasons why the campaign was so successful. Within weeks of invading Poland on the 1st of September 1939, the Germans were victorious, with the last remnants of resistance surrendering on the 6th of October. The occupation of Poland also provided the first opportunity for the Nazis to put their racial policies into operation on a major scale. Poland was home to over 3 million Jews, a figure which dwarfed the 500,000 or so who lived in Germany when they seized power there. Germany's Jews had already experienced increasing persecution since 1933, and many had decided to flee the country. But this would pale by comparison with what developed in Poland in the years that followed, as the Jewish people were rounded up into ghettos where a systematic policy of starvation was implemented. More immediately, von Manstein and his fellow commanders would have been aware of the first actions of the Einsatzgruppen. These were brigades of members of the SS, a paramilitary wing of the Nazis, comprising only the most ideologically committed members of the military. They were first deployed in Poland, traveling in the rear of the German army itself and effectively mass-murdering thousands of individuals who had been identified as potential leaders of any Polish resistance to German occupation. By early 1940, Operation Tannenberg, as it was codenamed, had led to the mass murder of over 100,000 Polish politicians, intellectuals, and other figures. These atrocities would become all too prevalent in Eastern Europe in years to come, and despite claims which von Manstein would later make that the commanders within the military did not approve of such actions, there was little to any resistance offered to the actions of the Einsatzgruppen by the commanders of the German army in Poland during the invasion and initial occupation. 
von Manstein's contributions to the eastwards campaign into Poland had gained him greater respect, not just within the high command of the Wehrmacht, but also within the Nazi leadership. Accordingly, when the planning process got underway for a westwards drive into France to be launched in 1940, von Manstein's advice was listened to. There were competing theories as to how this offensive should be undertaken. The initial plan, codenamed Case Yellow, had largely been devised by Colonel General Walter von Brauchitsch and General Franz Halder of the Army High Command, in conjunction with their staff. This called for an approach similar to that which the Germans had attempted back in 1914, of skirting the main fortifications erected by the French in western France and instead invading through the Netherlands and Belgium. Von Manstein felt this would lack surprise and instead counseled Hitler that the attack should also have a wing, move in strength along a more southerly line through the Ardennes forest region of Luxembourg, southern Belgium and northeastern France. This would largely outflank the Maginot line of defensive fortifications to the south, but would also allow the Germans to make a second pincer movement towards the coast, trapping the French and the British expeditionary force in between it and the more northerly force. Although many within the Army High Command were unconvinced of the merit of von Manstein's proposal, Hitler was won over by it and ordered the generals and their staff to incorporate elements of it into the wider plan for the invasion of France. This invasion ultimately came later than the Western Allies expected. After the quick conquest of Poland in the autumn of 1939, a period of unusual stability was seen as Germany prepared for its next move and the British and the French desperately tried to rearm and conscript hundreds of thousands of troops. When hostilities did resume in the spring of 1940, it was only for the purposes of a brief campaign in which Denmark and Norway were quickly occupied by the Nazis. Thus, it was not until the early summer of 1940 that the long-awaited invasion of France was initiated. On the 10th of May, the Germans made their initial move into Belgium and the Netherlands, as planned originally. Then, as the French and the British expeditionary force moved northeast to engage them in Belgium, a second pincer attack was launched through the Ardennes into northeastern France, as von Manstein had counseled. The weeks that followed would prove exactly how effective this strategy was. The British and the French were not able to deal with the ferocity of the German onslaught in mid-May 1940. Divisions of German troops, led by groups of panzer tanks, which never seemed to stop moving day or night, charged westwards at their lines. Within a week or so, the German front lines were nearing the English Channel. Even back in Berlin, Hitler was astonished by the speed of the army's advance. As a result of it, von Manstein's plan had largely worked. The British expeditionary force and much of the French army now found themselves trapped between two separate German armies, one in Belgium and one in northeastern France, which had proceeded into the country following the Ardennes strategy von Manstein championed. Faced with this impossible situation, the British began retreating to the port town of Dunkirk, which they still held, desperate to remove their forces from France back to Britain, a feat that was achieved in the space of a week in late May and early June. Over 330,000 British soldiers were evacuated, a feat made possible by a combination of the desire of Hermann Goering, one of the senior Nazi leaders, to claim the glory for himself by having his Luftwaffe effectively bomb the expedition into oblivion while trapped in Dunkirk, along with distractions created by the remnants of the French army elsewhere in northeast France, and the sheer daring of the British rescue operation, one which involved hundreds of merchant ships and fishing boats. It was only for this reason that von Manstein's plan had not achieved total success in capturing the British expeditionary force in its entirety. The Germans entered Paris on the 14th of June 1940. The French government had fled into exile days earlier and the city was taken unopposed. Thereafter, France was divided into an occupied zone in the north and west and a region in the south and east which was handed over to a collaborationist French regime based out of the town of Vichy. No sooner were they ensconced in Paris than German attentions turned towards defeating Britain. As an island with a more substantial navy than Germany's, this would prove altogether more difficult. There were competing arguments as to how Germany should proceed within the Army High Command. 
One faction believed an extended blockade of Britain by sea and air should be used to force the country into submission, but others favoured a brief bombing campaign followed by an amphibious landing across the English Channel. This would knock Britain out of the war quickly and ensure that Germany did not have to worry about a threat in Western Europe before it turned eastwards again. Von Manstein was in favour of this latter strategy, but he, like all others who supported it, were overruled in October 1940, when Hitler ultimately took the decision to postpone the invasion of Britain and instead begin preparing for an invasion of the Soviet Union to the east. By this time, von Manstein had been promoted to the rank of a full general and had been awarded the Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross in recognition of his contribution to the invasion of France. He was also appointed as the commander of 56th Panzer Group in March 1941 as part of the planning for what would eventually be termed Operation Barbarossa, named after a medieval German emperor. This was the tactical plan for the invasion of the Soviet Union, the largest land military operation ever undertaken. It would involve over 3.5 million German army personnel and over 600,000 motorized vehicles. By now, Hitler and his generals were convinced of the merits of short, fast campaigns, where they quickly overwhelmed their enemies. As such, the plan for Operation Barbarossa was to invade the Soviet Union in the summer of 1941, proceeding east and northeast, taking cities like Kiev along the way and ultimately seizing Leningrad and Moscow before the winter set in. With this done, the Russians would almost certainly capitulate like the French before them. Von Manstein was assigned to the Northern Wing Army Group North, which was to thrust through the Baltic states before ultimately moving to capture Leningrad. Operation Barbarossa was an enormous success to begin with. From its first launching on the 22nd of June 1941 through to September 1941, the Germans advanced rapidly, taking huge tracts of land in eastern Poland, the Baltic states and Ukraine, and capturing hundreds of thousands of Soviet prisoners of war and thousands of tanks and armoured vehicles as they went. The Soviet leader Joseph Stalin even considered negotiating a peace whereby his government would acknowledge Germany in its possession of these regions. For Manstein's army group covered less land owing to its operational objective to move towards Leningrad. Nevertheless, this was a region where some of the densest Russian troop presence was found, and it was not unusual that they encountered stiff resistance. By the late summer, his unit was preparing for a descent on Leningrad, but met with counterattacks by the Russian Red Army. There were victories in this for von Manstein, notably the encirclement and capture of a unit of some 12,000 Soviets and 140 tanks in Staraya, Russia in mid-August but also some setbacks. Ultimately, as the Russian positions were increasingly reinforced, the German advance slowed in the autumn. For Manstein's forces were in Novgorod, just south of Leningrad, when he received news on the 12th of September that he had been promoted to the command of the German 11th Army, hundreds of kilometers away in Ukraine. Von Manstein had been promoted to oversee the 11th Army after its previous commander, Colonel General Eugen Ritter von Schobert, was killed in a plane crash. Von Schobert had been preparing for an assault on the Crimean Peninsula in southeastern Ukraine, in particular by seizing the major port city of Sevastopol. The region was strategically important as it guarded the route from Russia to Romania, a key ally of the Nazis from which Germany received a huge proportion of its oil supplies. The Crimea needed to be secured in order to prevent any effort by the Russians to launch a counterattack into Romania. This task was now handed over to von Manstein, who quickly sent his forces, numbering approximately 200,000 strong, and a major division of Romanian troops into the peninsula. Crucially though, they lacked major air support. Despite this impediment, the Russians fell back speedily on Sevastopol itself, and by the early winter nearly all of the Crimean Peninsula was in German hands. However, the town would take longer to capture. A lengthy siege occurred at Sevastopol, one which von Manstein initiated in November 1941, but which would drag on until the summer of 1942. In part, this owed to the onset of the cold Russian winter. This was not harsh in the southerly climes of the Black Sea, 
but further to the north, the German advance was stalling outside Leningrad and Moscow in what would prove to be the first serious setback the German armed forces had yet experienced during the war. For Manstein's plans for capturing Sevastopol were further delayed in the early winter of 1941 by the onset of severe rains, which delayed the German attack on the city. Then, when an assault was finally launched on the 17th of December, it was quickly hindered by a Russian counter-offensive as an amphibious expedition landed on the eastern side of the Crimean Peninsula, a region known as the Kersh Peninsula. Von Manstein and his fellow officers had specific commands from Hitler not to fall back from the Kersh Peninsula, ones which were disobeyed in the face of the heavy Russian counterattack in the dying days of 1941 giving the Russians control of a beachhead here in eastern Crimea. As a result of the new front in the east of the peninsula, the major assault on Sevastopol was once again put on hold to deal with the threat on the Germans' eastern flank. What followed was months of bloody conflict as the Russians heavily reinforced the Kersh beachhead and attempted to drive the 11th Army out of the Crimean peninsula entirely. It was ultimately a very costly failure. Von Manstein's men stood firm and the attrition rate amongst the Russians was catastrophic, indeed as it was all across the Eastern Front during the war. As they launched sortie after sortie against the German lines in the late winter and early spring of 1942, hundreds of thousands of Russian troops were lost. For Manstein's 11th Army lost tens of thousands, but the number was only a percentage of the deadly death toll on the Russian side. By the late spring, the Russians were demoralized and much reduced in number. This was also the occasion for Hitler to finally acquiesce to von Manstein's repeated requests to be granted substantial air support in the Crimean Peninsula. In early May, the 800 planes of the German 8th Air Corps were dispatched to the Crimea under the command of Wolfram von Richthofen. These proved decisive in the weeks that followed in allowing von Manstein to finally take the offensive against the Russian 44th, 47th and 51st Army's position on the Kersh beachhead. With von Richthofen's planes flying over 1,500 sorties a day and the Germans battering their position with artillery, the Russians were effectively sitting ducks. Thus, by the time the Kersh beachhead was secured by the Germans on the 19th of May, the death toll against the Russians from the Kersh offensive had topped half a million men. And with this done, von Manstein was finally free to turn his attentions back to Sevastopol. With the support of the 8th Air Corps and without any further distractions to the east, he was quickly able to seize the city after a siege of a few weeks in the early days of July. Thus, after a grueling eight-month campaign, the peninsula was finally fully under German control. What was perhaps most striking about von Manstein's command of the 11th Army during the Crimean campaign was the ratio of casualties on both sides. Von Manstein's men had comprehensively defeated a numerically superior enemy, losing less than one man for every five Russians who perished. Yet, there were many casualties besides. The brutal Einsatzgruppen, whose sinister work von Manstein would have become aware of back in Poland, in the autumn of 1939, were again brought into operation in the Crimean Peninsula, as they were all across Ukraine and Russia in 1941 and 1942, as the German army advanced. Unlike in Poland, von Manstein was actually in charge of operations here, yet there is no evidence to suggest that he tried to obstruct these brigades of SS troops in their activities. Indeed, the Einsatzgruppen involved were supplied with vehicles, ammunition and other supplies directly by the 11th Army. There is no doubting that von Manstein knew exactly what they were doing and that many of his own troops were guilty of atrocities as well during the Crimean campaign. All of this is significant in terms of claims von Manstein would later make about the German army being largely innocent of the crimes the Nazi regime was perpetrating, such as the Holocaust of Europe's Jews, which was just being initiated as the Crimean campaign was underway. Von Manstein's effectiveness in overcoming superior numbers had been noticed by Hitler, and he was ordered north within days of victory in Crimea to Leningrad, the siege of which city had stalled the previous winter and which had settled into a stalemate. He arrived there in late August, 
but it would prove a short-lived sojourn in the north. First, a Russian counteroffensive limited the possibility of a quick German victory there that autumn, but more significant were developments to the south. In the summer of 1942, Hitler and the generals had determined on a new strategy for winning the war in the east, codenamed Case Blue. The new plan was to strike into southern Russia in order to secure the rich oil fields of the Caucasus, which would both provide a boon to the German war effort and economy, and also massively reduce the supply of oil available to the Russians. This, it was imagined, could bring about the complete collapse of the Soviet war effort and ultimate victory for Germany in the war. A daring strategy such as this was needed, as the United States had entered the war in December 1941 on the side of Britain and the Soviet Union, and the campaign Germany was undertaking with Italy in North Africa was souring as well. It was clear that the drift of the war was turning in the favor of the Allies, and so the Nazis needed to take measures which would tip the balance in Eastern Europe back in their favor. Case Blue was that strategy, but it would necessitate seizing a key site in southern Russia, the city of Stalingrad. Von Manstein was not appointed to the overall command of activities in Stalingrad. That ultimately dubious honor fell to Field Marshal Friedrich Paulus, commanding the German Sixth Army. With an initial force of over a quarter of a million men and 500 tanks, Paulus had moved towards Stalingrad in late August 1942 and had succeeded in securing most of the city on the west bank of the River Volga by mid-September. However, thereafter, their advance on the eastern side of the river stalled as the Russians had reinforced their position here considerably. A massive buildup of troops thus commenced in September and into October as both sides began channeling huge resources into what was increasingly viewed as the crucible in which the fate of the war on the Eastern Front would be decided. Violent clashes occurred across the city in the early weeks of the battle, but it was not until mid-November when the Soviets launched a huge offensive codenamed Operation Uranus that the Battle of Stalingrad entered its most bloody stage. The Russian strategy was to encircle Paulus's 6th Army in Stalingrad by moving north and south of the city and then circling back to strike at the German rear, which was largely held by the near 200,000 Romanian allies who were fighting with the Germans at Stalingrad by this time. These were weaker troops who were more vulnerable to a Russian offensive, and there was now a possibility that Paulus would be surrounded and cut off within the city. In response to these developments, Hitler ordered the creation of a new army group, Army Group Don. Von Manstein, who by now held the title of a full field marshal, the highest general rank within the German military command, was appointed to command it on the 21st of November 1942. In the weeks that followed, as he planned a counteroffensive codenamed Operation Winter Storm, the Russians completed the encirclement of Paulus's 6th Army in Stalingrad. They were now cut off from the German lines by land, but Hitler and the head of the Luftwaffe Hermann Göring were convinced that Paulus could be supplied by air for months to come. Stalingrad, the Führer commanded, was not to be abandoned and no breakout through the Russian lines should be attempted. Thus, for Manstein's effort to break through the Russian lines from without and end the encirclement of Paulus's men was launched on the 12th of December 1942. However, despite some initial successes on the first days of the initiative, by the end of the first week of the counterattack, it was clear that the Russian perimeter was too strong for von Manstein's army group Don to break through. Accordingly, on the 18th of December, he sent a request to Hitler that Paulus should be allowed to attempt a breakout and abandon Stalingrad. Hitler refused. After the initial onslaught in mid-December and the failure of it, there was little that von Manstein's forces could do as the Russians continued to pump ever greater numbers of men into the lines surrounding Stalingrad. And as they were reinforced, the possibility of Paulus attempting any breakout with the nearly quarter of a million troops he had under his control in the city itself became ever more remote. Moreover, additional Russian counteroffensives were now being mounted to capture cities such as Rostov. In response to these and the futile situation which now obtained in Stalingrad, von Manstein was placed in charge of a new army group south, 
made up of Army Group Don and the remnants of other divisions in early February 1943. This was just as Paulus and his men, over 200,000 of them, starving and disease-ridden by now, surrendered in Stalingrad to the Russians, who surrounded them on all sides. It was the first time a German field army was entirely defeated in the war and was a symbol of how the Germans were now hurtling towards defeat. The war for the remainder of 1943 was a mixed affair. For instance, in the north, the siege of Leningrad continued and was not fully broken until January 1944. However, to the south, the Russians were advancing westwards, but without a second front open anywhere in Europe as of yet, the Germans still had reserves with which to launch a new counteroffensive themselves. This would be aimed at securing the Kursk salient, a few hundred kilometers to the southwest of Moscow. Von Manstein was given one of the senior most roles in this initiative on which the last desperate German hope of victory in the East now rested, in part because he had yet again secured a quick but significant victory after being placed in charge of Army Group South in recapturing Kharkov in a four-week battle there in February and March 1943, at the end of which the casualty rate was eight times greater on the Russian side than on von Manstein's side. In its aftermath, Hitler began committing much of Germany's remaining resources to von Manstein's efforts to counterattack into Kursk in what would become known as Operation Citadel. In retrospect, the strategic thinking behind the counterattack on the Kursk salient seems baffling. Hitler was informed by his generals that he would be much better off pulling back from Russia and engaging in a strategic defense of Poland and Ukraine. But he nevertheless went ahead with the strategy, hoping for some miracle breakthrough. When Operation Citadel was launched on the 5th of July, von Manstein commanded the southern wing with Field Marshal Walter Mordel commanding the north. Despite committing over three quarters of a million men, nearly 3,000 tanks and over 9,000 artillery units to it, the Germans were outnumbered by Russian forces numbering over one and a half million troops and over 5,000 tanks. Moreover, the Russians had ample advance warning of what the German plan was and had dug trenches and planted mines all across the Kursk salient in advance of the attack. This was owing to the British having intercepted intelligence of the operation which they passed on to their Russian allies. Thus, when the offensive began, it soon ran into a quagmire, difficulties which were compounded by the arrival of news that the Western Allies had initiated the opening of a second front in Europe by invading Sicily on the 9th of July. Thus, Hitler called off the offensive just days later. But it would take weeks before von Manstein could fully extricate his forces from the vicious fighting across the salient. Kursk remains the largest tank battle in history. With defeat at Kursk and with any free troops being funneled towards Italy to deal with the invasion of the peninsula there, von Manstein and the other commanders in Eastern Europe were effectively fighting a rearguard action in the months that followed, desperately trying to stop the Russian advance with dwindling resources. By mid-autumn, this consisted of a steady retreat to the River Dnieper, during which war atrocities were again evidently committed by von Manstein's troops with the destruction of the countryside to induce famine conditions. Here, a line was held through the early winter of 1943. But von Manstein's pleas for reinforcements were falling on deaf ears with Hitler, as the Nazis prepared for the inevitable opening of a third front somewhere in Western Europe, one which would eclipse the southern front in Italy in scale. As a result, Kiev, the capital of Ukraine, lying on the Dnieper, fell to the Soviets in mid-November after a brief siege of less than two weeks. Inevitably, by January 1944, von Manstein was forced to completely abandon the defensive line, which had been established along the course of the river. Moreover, with the breaking of the siege of Leningrad to the north, new Russian forces were now able to commence a westward drive into Poland. The war from early 1944 onwards was one of attrition as the Russians advanced from the east and the Western Allies advanced north through Italy and from the summer of that year from France where the Third Front was opened. There was no escaping the reality of German defeat by then. However, von Manstein did not spend it in service. In mid-March 1944, 
while he was still commanding the retreat across western Ukraine, Hitler had issued a command that all divisions everywhere were to fight to the death. There was to be no surrender. Von Manstein objected to this directive and was commanded to fly to meet Hitler in person. This he duly did at the Führer's mountain retreat, the Berghof, in Bavaria on the 30th of March 1944. There, the Nazi leader awarded von Manstein the Swords of the Knight's Cross, one of the highest honors bestowed on any member of the German military, before promptly dismissing him from his command. This was not in itself a highly unusual development, and Hitler had become highly volatile in his attitudes towards his military commanders in the final years of the war. Although he was not informed of it at the time, von Manstein was not to be reassigned to another command for the remainder of the conflict. Von Manstein spent the last year of the Second World War largely dealing with health concerns. He had developed a serious cataract problem in his eyes while serving on the Eastern Front, which he now had operated on. However, this led to an infection, and for a time, there was a possibility that he would lose his vision. It was while he was recuperating back in Germany in the months that followed that the war entered its terminal stage. The Russians began to overrun Poland in the autumn of 1944, while at the same time, the Western Allies advanced quickly through Western Europe, seizing Paris within weeks of landing in the north of the country that summer. By the end of the year, the situation was dire, with the Western Allies building up their forces in eastern France for an offensive into Western Germany early in 1945, and the Russians preparing to do the same in eastern Germany. Not even one last belated counteroffensive by the Germans through the Ardennes Forest, where von Manstein had advised Hitler to send part of the German army five years previously, before the invasion of France, could yield much by way of results. Thus, in the spring of 1945, the noose began to tighten. In January 1945, von Manstein and his family, who had lost his son Gero in October 1942 on the Eastern Front, were forced to leave their home at Liegnitz as the Russian army advanced. They took refuge in Berlin, though it was only a temporary reprieve, as the German capital was the ultimate goal for both the Russians and the Western Allies. When he reached the capital, von Manstein attempted to arrange a personal meeting with Hitler to offer him his services as a military commander, but the Nazi leader, who was an increasingly drug-addled shell of a man, confined to the chancellery bunker in the center of the city, refused to grant him an audience. As a result, the von Mansteins continued to move west to avoid being entangled in the Battle of Berlin, which commenced in mid-April 1945. They eventually settled, like many other high-ranking members of the Nazi party and German military, near the Danish border, well out of harm's way. It was here, while again receiving medical treatment, that von Manstein would have received news that Hitler had killed himself in Berlin on the 30th of April 1945. Just over a week later, on the 8th of May, hostilities ceased in Europe. In the weeks that followed, people who were connected with the regime from all over Germany were identified and arrested. Von Manstein was somewhat belatedly interred in August 1945, as a result of his having been receiving medical treatment at the time. Long before the war ended, the Western Allies had begun preparing for its aftermath. In particular, they were concerned with the prosecution of those who were responsible for the war crimes committed by the regime. By 1945, the casualties of these war crimes numbered well in excess of 10 million people, some 6 million being Europe's Jews, while millions of Romani, Poles, Russians and other groups had also been mass-murdered as slave laborers and prisoners of war who were not afforded proper treatment under the terms of the Geneva Convention. When one considers that the war had been caused almost exclusively by Germany, then the Nazi regime was culpable for the deaths of tens of millions of people. However, the Western Allies had determined that not all Germans would be held responsible for the country's crimes. A great proportion of Germans had never voted for the Nazi party during its rise to power or supported it after 1933. Moreover, the collective war guilt which had been imposed on Germany's population following the First World War had partly facilitated the rise of the Nazis. Consequently, by the time the war ended, 
It had been concluded that only those who were directly responsible for fomenting the war and committing crimes against humanity and war crimes would be prosecuted. This would include, as a matter of course, the surviving senior members of the Nazi regime and the Waffen-SS, who had run the concentration camps and made up much of the Einsatzgruppen. Within weeks of the war ending, trials were being organized to be held at the city of Nuremberg, where the Nazis had held their vast annual rallies when in power. From the inception of the International Military Tribunal at Nuremberg, from Manstein, who was initially detained but whom it was quickly determined would not stand trial, was committed to defending the reputation of himself and the wider German army. In time, he would become the foremost proponent of what has become known as the myth of the clean Wehrmacht. This holds that the leaders of the German military were either unaware of the crimes being committed by the Nazis and the SS in the concentration camps and elsewhere across Europe between 1939 and 1945, or were not in any position to prevent what was happening. As part of his efforts in this regard, von Manstein appeared at the first trial at Nuremberg, that of the leaders of the regime such as Goering, the war armaments minister Albert Speer, and the deputy Führer of the Nazi party between 1933 and 1941, Rudolf Hess. There he testified against his former masters and also helped draft a 132-page document which tried to exonerate the Wehrmacht and attribute all of the guilt for the war to the Nazi party and the SS. In this light, von Manstein and his co-author Siegfried Westphal presented the German high command as being military officers who were following the chain of command. Von Manstein and Westphal claimed that it was the Nazis, not the German military, who were responsible for the Holocaust and the mass murder of millions of civilians and prisoners of war on the Eastern Front, acts which were perpetrated by the Einsatzgruppen and other elements. Indeed, von Manstein even stated that he had disobeyed many orders where they contravened the accepted rules of war. Thus was born the myth of the clean Wehrmacht, one which was augmented and added to by many other senior military commanders. The myth did not last fully intact for long. Von Manstein left Nuremberg in 1946, feeling as though he had rescued his own reputation and that of many of his fellow officers from ignominy. But no sooner had the trials of the Nazi leadership and heads of the SS concluded that many people began reconsidering the role of the Wehrmacht in the horrors of the war. Archival evidence, which clearly showed generals such as von Manstein receiving orders which contravened the accepted rules of war and then acting on them, were uncovered, and the military's complicity in the murder of millions of people on the Eastern Front was revealed. It was, for instance, clear that von Manstein had been perfectly aware of the actions of the Einsatzgruppen in the regions where he was commanding on the Eastern Front throughout the war. Accordingly, in 1948, the British arrested von Manstein, having been pressured to do so by the Soviets. He was placed on trial, along with several other senior commanders of the Wehrmacht, in the autumn of 1949. There, he faced nearly 20 different charges, all relating to his conduct as a commander on the Eastern Front, notably following the invasion of the Soviet Union in the summer of 1941. At this trial, it was clearly demonstrated using documentary evidence and the testimonies of those who had served with von Manstein between 1941 and 1944 that he had agreed in principle with the Nazi high command in its desire to exterminate both the Jews and many groups of Eastern Europeans. Accordingly, after a trial which lasted several months, von Manstein was found guilty of nine different crimes and sentenced to 18 years in prison. Despite the length of his sentence, von Manstein would only ever serve just over three years in prison. His term was first commuted to 12 years early in 1950, and then he was released early in May 1953. There were many reasons why his sentence was drastically reduced in this way. For one, his defense counsel during his trial, the British lawyer Reginald Thomas Paget, published a book in 1951 defending his now convicted client and his record, while there was a general policy in the early 1950s of releasing German war criminals early as West Germany became a key Western ally in the intensifying Cold War between the US and its allies on one hand and the Soviet Union on the other. 
Thus, von Manstein was released after serving only a fraction of his sentence. Thereafter, he was quickly brought on as a military advisor to the West German government in its creation of a new army to stave off the threat from communist East Germany. In 1955, he also published a memoir in which he yet again attempted to exonerate himself and the Wehrmacht from the crimes of the Nazi regime. He did not die until the 9th of June 1973 from a stroke at the age of 85. When he did, he was buried with full military honors in West Germany. Erich von Manstein is one of the most intensely debated figures within the German military command during the Second World War. There is no doubting his military capabilities. These were recognized early on, and he was one of the small number of German military officers who were retained when the much-reduced Reichswehr was formed in the aftermath of the First World War. He rose steadily through the ranks, and when the Second World War was eventually entered into in 1939, he was in a position to offer his advice to the central planning offices. As a result, he was able to profoundly influence the strategy used in invading France in the summer of 1940 by advancing through the Ardennes region rather than along a more northerly route in Belgium. Consequently, von Manstein was perhaps responsible more than any other individual, with the exception of the German tank commander Heinz Guderian, for the astonishing military victory which the Germans won over the French in May and June 1940. Thereafter, he was promoted and served in many senior capacities on the Eastern Front, leading the Crimean campaign, playing a major role at Stalingrad and throughout the German retreat across Eastern Europe in 1943. While his major successes were largely confined to his role in the invasion of France and the victory in the Crimean campaign, there is no doubting von Manstein's abilities as a military commander. However, it is not his ability as a commander that has been the source of debate concerning him. Rather, von Manstein's career has been widely contested, owing to his central role in the formation of the myth of the clean Wehrmacht. No sooner was the war over in the summer of 1945 than the general began cooperating with the Allies and producing reports, which all aimed to alleviate the guilt of the German military high command and place the blame for the Nazis' atrocities firmly on the shoulders of the Nazi party leadership itself and groups such as the Waffen-SS. He was initially quite successful in this and escaped prosecution himself for several years, and even when he was finally convicted and sentenced, von Manstein served only a fraction of this time and was quickly rehabilitated afterwards. Moreover, the myth of the clean Wehrmacht remains a powerful feature in assessing the German military during the war down to this day. It may well be that aspects of it applied to some of the main German commanders, several of whom resigned their positions or did their level best to obstruct Nazi policy in Eastern Europe and elsewhere. But that is hardly the case with von Manstein. His views were, broadly speaking, in line with those of the Nazis, in being rabidly anti-Semitic and perceiving the peoples of Eastern Europe from the perspective of German racial superiority. It is hardly surprising then to find that he was responsible for committing widespread atrocities himself in Poland, Ukraine and Russia between 1939 and 1944. Thus, for all that von Manstein attempted to exonerate himself and his fellow generals, he was just as complicit in the crimes of the Third Reich as many of the Nazi leaders. What do you think of Erich von Manstein? Were his claims of the supposedly clean Wehrmacht who were not responsible for the worst crimes of the Nazi regime somewhat plausible, or was he just as culpable in conquering parts of Europe which the Nazis and SS then unleashed their genocidal policies on? Please let us know in the comment section, and in the meantime, thank you very much for watching. The man known to history as Ernst Kaltenbrenner, was born on the 4th of October 1903 in the town of Ried in Imkreis in Upper Austria, not far from the city of Salzburg near the German border. His father was Hugo Kaltenbrenner, a lawyer in Ried im Imkreis, and his mother was Teresa Udvadi. Together she and Hugo had several more sons. Friedrich, who was born almost exactly two years before Ernst, and then Werner and Roland, 
born in 1905 and 1910, respectively. Ernst's childhood and teenage years were relatively unremarkable. He was sent to the nearby town of Raab in Upper Austria for his primary schooling, but thereafter was dispatched to Linz, one of the biggest cities in Austria, to attend the Real Gymnasium. This school had been established under the auspices of the Austrian imperial government back in 1851. Several years before Kaltenbrunner arrived at the school, a child called Adolf Hitler had been a student there. He and Kaltenbrunner's paths would cross again. Another child, who also attended the Real Gymnasium in Linz, but at the same time as Ernst, was Adolf Eichmann. The two became firm friends, and their associations with each other would continue through their lifetimes. Kaltenbrunner's childhood was otherwise nondescript, though it is notable that his family home was a nationalist one, firmly believing in the mission of the Austro-Hungarian Empire to rule over a wide range of disparate people across the southern stretches of Central Europe and southeast into the Balkans, where the Austrians had replaced the Ottoman Turks as the major power during the course of the 19th century. Kaltenbrunner came of age in a period of conflict. Long before he was born, the continent's politics had been destabilized by the union of the 30 or so smaller German states into a German empire in 1871. Germany's emergence upset the balance of power in Europe, where it now became the foremost power on the continent itself and a challenge to the British Empire, the global superpower of the late 19th century. By the time of Kaltenbrunner's birth, the major powers were dividing into two armed alliances, one centered on Germany and the Austro-Hungarian Empire, of which the Kaltenbrunners were subjects, and the other eventually comprising Britain, France, and Russia. In the summer of 1914, when Ernst was just 10 years old, war arrived when a regional conflict involving the Austro-Hungarian Empire and Serbia in the Balkans ballooned into a continent-wide war. It soon expanded into the First World War, as other nations such as Japan became involved and then the United States in 1917. The entry of the latter power on the side of Britain and France tipped the conflict in their favor, and in November 1918, the war ended in the total defeat of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and Germany. Though he was just barely a teenager when the guns fell silent, Kaltenbrunner's life would be shaped by the fallout from this first global conflict. The political landscape of Austria shifted dramatically in the months following the end of the First World War. For over 600 years, the country had been ruled by the House of Habsburg, a noble line which had created an enormous empire in Central Europe and the Balkans covering modern-day Hungary, Czechia, Slovakia, Croatia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, and parts of Serbia. Defeat in the war brought the House of Habsburg to an end and saw the empire disintegrate as new nations such as Hungary and Czechoslovakia declared their independence. In response to this situation, a new Republic of German Austria was established in late October 1918, shortly before the war ended. The new government, which was formed in Vienna, quickly determined that Austria might best be served in this rapidly changing world by uniting with Germany into a greater Germany. They subsequently initiated talks with the new Republican government in Germany, even as the end of the war unleashed political, social and economic chaos across both countries. These talks continued into the spring and summer of 1919, but by then, Britain and France had become implacably opposed to Austria and Germany uniting. Thus, when the Treaty of Saint-Germain, the peace agreement between the victorious powers and Austria, was signed in September 1919, it included a clause which forbade Austria from uniting with Germany. Nevertheless, this was not the end of the matter, and the issue of German-Austrian unification would be resurrected again in the 1930s with serious consequences. Kaltenbrunner was too young to have fought even in the latter stages of the First World War, though he would have been politically cognizant enough to be aware of what was occurring around him in a destabilized Austria in the late 1910s. Shortly afterwards, 
he headed for the city of Graz himself, where he first began studying chemistry, but in 1923 decided to follow in his father's footsteps and switched to studying law. Eventually, he earned his PhD from the university there, before heading back to Upper Austria to work in the courts in Salzburg in 1926. He remained there for nearly two years before establishing his own legal practice in Linz in 1928. As we will see, he became politically active in Austrian nationalism, both during his student days in Graz and when he returned to Upper Austria in the mid-1920s. Another notable feature of these years is the toll they took on Kaltenbrunner's physical appearance. He was a keen amateur fencer when studying at Graz, and it is widely believed that it was this hobby which resulted in several large scars to his face. However, the details of how he obtained these injuries are not certain, and others claimed he was involved in a serious car accident in his younger years. Regardless of how they were obtained, the result was that Kaltenbrunner, who was well over six foot tall, was left with a striking, almost sinister look. Many people would report feeling intimidated by his presence in future years. While Kaltenbrenner was earning his law degree, the political situation across the border in Germany was one of chaos. Following the end of the First World War, the country had been gripped by a series of bloody revolutions as communist groups and others tried to seize power in cities like Berlin and Munich in late 1918 and into 1919. These had all failed eventually, but this political environment had allowed for the emergence of right-wing reactionary paramilitary organizations and political groups. One such group, founded in Bavaria in 1920, was the National Socialist German Workers' Party, or Nazi Party, a group who wished to reverse the terms of the Treaty of Versailles, which had imposed harsh peace terms on Germany at the end of the war. The party was led by an Austrian, one who was rabidly anti-Semitic, and eventually led the Nazis in the direction of believing that a massive Jewish and communist plot was attempting to destroy Germany. They attempted a coup in Munich in November 1923, one which was suppressed in just over a day, and after which many members fled over the border to Austria, where branches of the party had also been established in 1920. Despite a crackdown back in Germany following the Beer Hall Putsch of 1923 and Hitler's brief imprisonment in its aftermath, the Nazis would continue to be a malignant force in German politics into the second half of the 1920s. As noted, Kaldenbrenner had been raised in a family which favoured nationalist politics and he himself had become involved with several nationalist political parties in Austria in the early 1920s while studying at the University of Graz. These included the Independent Movement for a Free Austria, a far-right political group. In 1929, he revealed his political sympathies for Nazism when he agreed to represent the Austrian branch of the party in several legal issues it was dealing with. It was unsurprising then that he decided to join the Nazis himself in October 1930. This was at a time when the wider Nazi party in Germany and its southern neighbor was beginning to gain increasing amounts of support after years in the political wilderness. Both countries had been badly impacted by the Wall Street crash of 1929 and the Great Depression which followed it. As jobs were lost and life savings were wiped out by hyperinflation, Many individuals in both countries began turning to extremist political parties, such as the Nazis, as a way of expressing their resentments. Kaldenbrunner rose quickly within the Austria branch of the party, and by 1931 was a major district official in his native Upper Austria. Later that year, on the 31st of August, he also joined the SS, a paramilitary wing of the Nazis headed by Heinrich Himmler one of Hitler's closest associates. Kaltenbrunner was beginning his ascent within the Nazi party as the wider organization was gaining massive amounts of support in Germany. For instance, in the Reichstag elections of September 1930, it increased its vote share to 18% and became the second largest party in Germany. 
Less than two years later, it increased this to 37% in fresh elections and became the largest political party in the parliament by some margin. As a result, in January 1933, Hitler was able to pressure the centrist and center-right political establishment to make him Chancellor of Germany. Within months, the Nazis succeeded in completely undermining the democratic process in Germany and turning the country into a one-party dictatorship. The situation was different in Austria. In legislative elections held there in November 1930, the Nazis only acquired 3% of the vote, which translated into zero seats in Parliament. Nevertheless, in the months that followed, the party began to gain favour amongst more and more Austrians, particularly so from May 1931 onwards when Credit Anstalt, one of Austria's largest banks, declared bankruptcy, rocking the financial system of the Americas and Europe even further and creating enormous economic difficulties in Austria itself. No further parliamentary elections were held in Austria during the early 1930s and so it is difficult to assess exactly how extensive the Nazi party's support had become there by the time Hitler became Chancellor of Germany in January 1933. Yet it was certainly quite sizable and had gained much from the collapse of Credit Anhalt, a bank which was founded in the mid-19th century by the Rothschilds, a banking family of Austrian Jews. This was exploited by the Austrian Nazi party to stoke anti-Semitic sentiment in the country and garner greater support from 1931 onwards. Ultimately though, the growth of Nazism in Austria was curbed in the spring of 1933, just as Hitler and his accomplices were passing an enabling law in Germany to allow them to rule by decree there. In part inspired by the example of Germany and partly out of concern about Hitler's calls for German unification with Austria, the Austrian Chancellor Engelbert Dollfuss effectively suspended parliamentary democracy in Austria in March 1933 and initiated the country's own type of fascism by declaring a new party, the Fatherland Front, to be the only legally recognized political party in Austria from May 1933 onwards. This was influenced by Benito Mussolini's brand of fascism in Italy. Its remit, Dolfus envisaged, was to bring political and economic stability to Austria and to prevent the Nazis from taking over the country. By this time, Kaltenbrunner was one of the most senior figures within the Austrian Nazi movement and he, along with other prominent members of the Austrian SS, such as Arthur Seiss Inquart, were in regular contact with Himmler about how to undermine the Austrian political system from within. Owing to his subversive activity, he was arrested by the Austrian government just days after marrying Elisabeth Eder a fellow member of the Austrian Nazi party, on the 14th of January 1934. He was detained at a detention center which was newly erected at Kaiser Steinbrüch on the grounds of conspiring against the state and for membership of the Nazi party, which had been prohibited by Dollfuss's government in the summer of 1933. Kaltenbrunner was just one of approximately 50,000 Austrians who were arrested in the second half of 1933 and the first six months of 1934 for their associations with the Nazis. Over the next months, he led a hunger strike here, and there was major unrest in February as riots broke out. This caused severe disquiet in the town of Kaiser Steinbrüch itself, and the detention center was abandoned in May 1934, at which time Kaltenbrunner was released. Therefore, he was a free man again by the time Dollfuss was assassinated by Nazi agents in Vienna on the 25th of July 1934. Whether Kaltenbrunner knew of the plan to kill the Austrian Chancellor is unclear. Dollfuss was succeeded as Chancellor of Austria by Kurt Schuschnigg, an Austro-fascist of a slightly milder disposition than his predecessor. Schuschnigg faced the same problem as Dollfuss of trying to suppress Austrian Nazism as its proponents built up their strength over the border in Bavaria in southern Germany. Throughout the mid-1930s, Austrian Nazis operated from here. 
slipping over the border to undertake sabotage missions and attack Fatherland Front officials. Kaltenbrunner was often amongst them, traveling to Passau in Bavaria by train on several occasions to bring in money and resources to Austria to aid the Nazi effort to undermine the state there. At the same time, he had risen to become one of the leading figures within the Austrian SS, and some of his trips to southern Germany were to pass on intelligence to Himmler and his new protégé as head of the Nazis' security services and intelligence networks, Reinhard Heydrich. As a result of all this activity, Kaltenbrunner was arrested on several occasions in the mid-1930s on suspicion of treason and other offences, though he was never successfully prosecuted. He did lose his license to practice law, though. Meanwhile, the insurgency by the Nazis into Austria from Bavaria continued. It resulted in hundreds of deaths and attacks on thousands more during the mid-1930s. Despite his best efforts to prevent the growth in support for the Nazis within Austria, by late 1937, Schuschnigg's government was in a difficult position. Under Hitler's rule, Germany had begun aggressively rearming in 1935 in violation of the Treaty of Versailles. By late 1937, this had reached a point where a military intervention in Austria by Germany would see the country easily conquered. Simultaneously, Hitler's rhetoric about Germany and Austria uniting, a move increasingly referred to as the Anschluss, meaning connection or political union, was becoming more and more inflammatory. As Nazi terror tactics in Vienna escalated and Berlin's demands increased in the first weeks of 1938, Schuschnigg decided to call a referendum in Austria to decide on the issue of uniting with Germany. His goal was to win this and settle the issue, going so far as to promise his other political opponents in Austria that fresh elections would be held if their supporters rallied against the Nazis. However, before Schuschnigg's gambit had a chance to pay off, Hitler ordered German troops over the border into Austria on the 12th of March 1938. The ground had been well prepared in advance by leading figures of the Austrian Nazi movement, such as Seyss Inquart and Kaltenbrunner, and the takeover was bloodless. Four weeks later, the Anschluss was ratified by a plebiscite, which passed by 99% and in which political enemies of the Nazis, such as the Austrian Jews and those of Romani descent, were prohibited from voting. Kaltenbrunner and many other Austrian Nazis who had risked much during the mid-1930s to further the Nazi cause in Austria were commensurately rewarded for their commitment following the Union of Germany and Austria. The country was officially designated as the province of Ostmark, of which Arthur Seiss Inquart became the first governor. Kaltenbrunner was appointed as the Minister of Public Security within Austria and was promoted to the rank of Brigadeführer within the SS. Although the German Reichstag had largely become a ceremonial body by 1938, the acquisition of a seat was a sign of an individual being held in favor by the Nazi senior leadership and so Kaltenbrunner's ascent as a member of the parliament in April 1938, when Austrian members were added, was a further sign of his growing power within Nazi Austria. Finally, he was also made an SS and police leader for the Donau administrative region, a posting which effectively made him the most senior police figure in all of Austria. In this role, he was involved from the summer of 1938 onwards in efforts to begin persecuting Austria's Jewish communities and also to establish a branch of the Gestapo, the Nazi secret police in Vienna. Kaltenbrunner was also heavily involved in the months following the Anschluss in the establishment of Mauthausen concentration camp. This was established outside the town of Mauthausen, approximately 20 kilometers from Linz in early August 1938. Concentration camps such as this which were effectively prisons, which could be built quickly and cheaply to house political prisoners and the ideological enemies of Nazism, had been built throughout Germany since the rise to power of the Nazis there in 1933. Mauthausen was the first concentration camp established in Austria. Here, socialists, Jews, Romani, 
homosexuals and anyone else considered an enemy of the state in the new reality Austria found itself in were detained in cramped conditions. Most were given extremely limited rations and effectively starved to death while they were made to work as slave laborers, mining and building munitions and aircraft for the impending Nazi war effort. Eventually, several satellite camps were established near the village of Gusen so that the entire camp complex could house 85,000 prisoners at maximum capacity. All told, by 1945, some 190,000 prisoners would pass through mauthausen gusen concentration camp, of which it is estimated that nearly half died owing to the severity of the conditions of the camp which Kaltenbrunner had a major hand in first establishing in 1938. While Kaltenbrunner was involving himself in the development of the concentration camp at mauthausen gusen Hitler was bringing Europe ever closer to the precipice of war. The Union of Germany and Austria had been prohibited under the terms of the Treaty of Versailles, but there was no appetite for war in Britain and France over the issue, particularly so when public sentiment in Austria had been so broadly in favor of the Anschluss. However, no sooner had swastika flags begun flying over government buildings in Vienna than Hitler and his associates in Berlin began pressing German claims to the Sudetenland in western Czechoslovakia. This was a region with a predominantly ethnically German and German-speaking population which the Nazis claimed was also rightfully part of the greater Germany they were trying to create. On this occasion, the British, French and even Benito Mussolini's fascist government in Italy objected to German claims. However, at a summit of European leaders convened in Munich in September 1938, Hitler managed to convince the British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain that if Germany was granted the Sudetenland, it would be the last territory he would seek. Chamberlain acquiesced, but he maintained to Hitler that any further aggression would result in war. Chamberlain's actions at Munich have typically been seen as a wholly misguided strategy of appeasement, but this unfairly ignores the fact that the agreement bought Britain and France time to begin rearming should Hitler break his promise. They did not have long to wait to see if he would or not. In March 1939, just six months after the agreement at Munich, the Nazis effectively dismembered the rest of Czechoslovakia, annexing parts of it and created occupied protectorates out of the rest. The city of Memel in the Baltic Sea region was seized from Lithuania at the same time. Still, Britain and France did not react. But when Hitler began pressing claims to Poland, within a short period of time, the situation changed. London and Paris now once again claimed that if the independence of another sovereign nation were threatened, they would have to act. The Germans initiated a false flag operation in an effort to make Poland look like the aggressor in late August 1939. But no one was fooled. Thus, when German tanks and infantry divisions rolled over the border into Poland on the 1st of September, Britain and France responded by declaring war on Germany. The Second World War had commenced. In the course of it, Kaltenbrunner would move from being a middling Nazi official in Austria to one of the most senior figures of the entire Nazi hierarchy. Kaltenbrunner's further ascent within Austria reached a new height in the early summer of 1940 when he was promoted to the position of police president of Vienna. At the same time, he was made an Untersturmführer or junior storm leader within the SS, one of the senior officer grades of the paramilitary organization. Kaltenbrunner was now the most senior police figure within Austria. Over the next year, he made considerable strides in expanding the Nazi intelligence services throughout the country in a bid to identify and root out any opposition movement which might emerge there during the war. Preemptive steps had been taken to prevent this in 1938 and 1939, arresting approximately 100,000 individuals who were deemed to be opponents of the Nazis out of Austria's population of nearly 7 million people. But new resistance movements sprang up during the war, particularly around the Roman Catholic priest 
Heinrich Meyer, whose followers were able to obtain schematics of German warplanes and pass them to the Allies. Kaltenbrunner's secret police had limited success in breaking up Meyer's organization, but considerably more in dismantling resistance groups such as the Austrian Freedom Movement, whose most prominent members were eventually identified, tried, and sent to concentration camps. While Kaltenbrunner was expanding his intelligence network and overseeing the policing of wartime Vienna, the wider European conflict was going very well for Germany. The initial campaign into Poland had foreshadowed events elsewhere, as the country was effectively overrun in four weeks. By early October, Warsaw was in German hands, and the Poles were effectively defeated. A lull in hostilities occurred that winter, so much so that the people in Britain and France began to talk about a phony war. But this was the quiet before the storm. In the spring of 1940, German tanks rolled over the northern border into Denmark, and paratroopers landed into Norway's main cities and ports as both countries were brought under Nazi occupation in a matter of days. Then, in May, the long-expected invasion of France was initiated. In a blistering military campaign, the Nazis crushed the resistance in northeastern France and Belgium, and then trapped the British Expeditionary Force, consisting of more than 300,000 men in the port of Dunkirk. Only a daring rescue operation in late May and early June stopped these men from being captured or massacred. Nevertheless, by midsummer, Paris had been captured and France was defeated. The Nazis were triumphant throughout Western and Central Europe. Only Britain stood against them. The first years of the war changed the Nazi state's situation in many ways. One of the most substantial changes was in terms of the number of Jewish people that were now living within the borders of the Reich or the territory that it occupied. Ever since their rise to power in Germany in 1933, the Nazis had implemented increasingly oppressive laws which effectively disenfranchised Germany's half a million Jewish people and made them second-class citizens. The goal here was to coerce Germany's Jews into leaving the country and moving abroad. On the 9th of November 1938, this anti-Semitism took on an even more sinister edge when thousands of Jewish homes, businesses and synagogues were attacked across Germany in government-orchestrated pogroms. Hundreds of Jewish people were killed and thousands more interred in concentration camps from which the majority never returned. Some of the worst of these attacks on what became known as the Night of the Broken Glass, or Kristallnacht, occurred in Vienna, which had one of the largest concentrations of Jewish people anywhere in the Third Reich at that time. Kaltenbrunner was central to overseeing the attacks in Vienna during Kristallnacht, an operation which was unofficially led by the SS. The war changed the situation again. There were approximately three and a half million Jewish people living in Poland when it was conquered in the autumn of 1939. Thus, the policy of coercing Jews to leave Nazi-held territory was much less practical here. Dystopian plans were developed to resolve the so-called Jewish question in the course of 1940 by Kaltenbrunner's old school friend Adolf Eichmann, who was now working within the newly established Reich Security Main Office which was overseen by Reinhard Heydrich, Himmler's second-in-command of the SS. Eichmann's scheme involved the mass detention of Europe's Jews and their forcible deportation to the East African island of Madagascar. It was, though, eventually concluded that this scheme was impractical, particularly so from early 1941, when Hitler had fully determined that Germany would invade the Soviet Union that coming summer. When the invasion was initiated in June 1941 and much of Ukraine, eastern Poland and western Russia were quickly overrun, this brought over two million more Jews under Nazi rule. With all of Europe seemingly having fallen before them in the summer and autumn of 1941, a new approach to the Jewish question was decided upon by Hitler, Himmler and other senior Nazis such as Heidrich. They called it the Final Solution The Final Solution was effectively a plan for the mass murder of all of Europe's Jews. 
Elements of this were already being rolled out as the German army advanced eastwards into the Soviet Union in the late summer and autumn of 1941. Brigades of SS death squads known as the Einsatzgruppen followed in the rear of the German army and massacred entire communities of Jewish people throughout Ukraine and other regions. Elsewhere, it would involve the systematic identification and arrest of Europe's Jews. They would then be sent to a number of concentration camps, primarily located in Poland, where the vast majority would be gassed to death within hours of their arrival. This genocidal operation would be overseen by the SS, of which Kaltenbrunner was a member. The logistics of identifying all of Europe's Jews would be overseen by Heidrich's Reich Security main office, where officials like Eichmann were in charge of making sure the trains to the death camps ran efficiently. Figures like Kaltenbrunner were to oversee the regional aspects of this by using the police services under their control to identify any Jews attempting to hide in cities like Vienna. In the end, an estimated 65,000 Austrian Jews, constituting the majority of those who had not fled Austria prior to the outbreak of the war in September 1939, were identified and killed as part of the final solution. Kaltenbrunner was central to these events in Austria. In the early summer of 1942, events unfolded in the Protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia, the administrative zone which had been formed out of much of Czechoslovakia in 1939, which would have a bearing on the rest of Kaltenbrunner's life. The previous autumn, Reinhard Heiderich, the head of the Reich Security Main Office, an umbrella organization which oversaw all of the policing and intelligence services across Nazi Europe, was appointed as the stand-in governor of Bohemia and Moravia. The Czech resistance had been growing stronger in 1941, and Hitler had determined that Heydrich, who he once referred to as the man with the iron heart, was the best person to crush the unrest there. Heydrich certainly made inroads quickly, executing hundreds of people within weeks of taking up his position in Prague and arresting thousands. But his actions also aroused widespread animosity, and plans were quickly underway to assassinate Heydrich. It would take months for a plan to be put into action, but on the 27th of May 1942, Heydrich was badly wounded in an assassination attempt outside Prague. He died a week later in hospital, leaving the most senior office in Europe's intelligence and policing services empty. Himmler temporarily stepped into the role as head of the SS, but with his responsibilities in other areas stretching him thin, a successor to Heydrich would eventually be needed. Kaltenbrunner was appointed as the head of the Reich Security Main Office in succession to Heydrich on the 30th of January 1943, after much prevarication on Himmler's part. His appointment was a major surprise to many who did not consider him to be a candidate for a position which effectively made Kaltenbrunner the most senior figure within the SS, other than Himmler himself. Many had expected that Heinrich Müller, the head of the Nazi secret police, the Gestapo, would be given the post. At the same time, Kaltenbrunner also succeeded Heinrich as president of the International Criminal Police Commission, or ICPC, the forerunner of Interpol. As head of the Reich Security Main Office, Kaltenbrunner was now in charge of an umbrella organization which oversaw seven different departments, each handling various elements of the intelligence and policing services. For instance, the Gestapo was subsumed within Department 4, which also contained the offices run by Kaltenbrunner's childhood friend Adolf Eichmann. Department 6 oversaw intelligence gathering abroad, while other departments handled administration and matters such as standard policing in the Reich and occupied territories. As head of the Reich Security Main Office, Kaltenbrunner became a pivotal figure in the Holocaust of Europe's Jews and other groups such as the Romani, which Heydrich had played an absolutely critical role in initiating during 1941 and early 1942. 
Several years later, Kaltenbrunner would claim that he was barely involved in the Holocaust and other crimes committed by the regime, that effectively he stepped into Heinrich's shoes when the gears of the genocidal program were already in operation and that he did not contribute to what was happening in any tangible fashion. This is not true. For instance, it was long after Heinrich's assassination and following Kaltenbrunner's appointment as his successor that the Reich Security Main Office established the policy of Schutzhaft, or protective custody. This directed that anyone who was designated as being in protective custody in Central and Eastern Europe would be quickly transferred to the concentration camp system. Its purpose was to speed up the processing and thus murder of Europe's Jews, Romani and other groups. Moreover, directives to the commandants of the main death camps of Auschwitz-Birkenau, Treblinka, Sobibor, Chielno, Majdanek and Biergetz to continue the mass executions using Zyklon B and carbon monoxide were received directly from the Reich Security Main Office throughout 1943 and 1944. The end result of all of this was that Kaltenbrunner was the head of the Reich Security Main Office during the most intense period of the Holocaust and other genocidal policies. While the final solution had been agreed upon by the hierarchy in 1941, and experiments using Zyklon B had been carried out at Auschwitz that autumn, it was not until January 1942 that Heydrich had passed on details of what was to occur to senior Nazi bureaucrats at a conference outside Berlin. Steps were taken to begin initiating it in the months that followed and from the summer of 1942, it intensified until the Nazi genocide operation was at its most extreme in 1943 and 1944. For instance, it was in the spring of 1943, after Kaltenbrunner succeeded Heydrich, that most of the 60,000 Jews in occupied Greece were deported to Auschwitz and killed there. It was in the summer that the Jewish ghettos across the Baltic states and Belarusia were liquidated and all of their inhabitants transferred to the concentration camps and near certain death. Similarly, it was only after Germany effectively took over northern and central Italy in the autumn of 1943, months after Kaltenbrunner became head of the RSHA, that the identification, arrest and deportation of Italy's Jews to the death camps commenced. Kaltenbrunner, whose pronouncements at various points in the 1930s and 1940s indicate his own personal extreme anti-Semitism, described the, quote, eradication of the Jews in Italy as a matter of special interest to him. There is no doubting the centrality of Kaltenbrunner to the Holocaust and the genocide of other groups by the Nazis. In accepting the position as the head of the Reich Security Main Office in succession to Heydrich, Kaltenbrunner was placing himself in an exposed position, for the war was turning dramatically against the Nazis by the time he was promoted in January 1943. The invasion of Russia had stalled in the winter of 1941 outside Moscow and Leningrad. As it did, the war became a conflict of attrition on the Eastern Front, with the Russians mounting a much stouter defense in 1942. Their sheer numbers made it clear by that summer that Hitler needed a major victory if he was to stave off defeat. But a massive campaign in the autumn of 1942 to try to take the southern Russian city of Stalingrad and with it access to the strategically vital oil fields of the Caucasus did not go as planned. By the early winter, the German 6th Army had been surrounded by the Russians and was slowly being starved into submission. Just weeks after Kaltenbrunner took over the RSHA, they surrendered at Stalingrad in the first massive defeat of German arms during the war. Thereafter, the Russians began inexorably pushing the Germans back westwards, while after defeating the Italians and Germans in North Africa, the Western Allies opened a southern front in Italy in the summer of 1943. It was now a matter of when, not if, Germany would be defeated. And as the defeat of the Nazis became inevitable, people like Kaltenbrunner must have surely known they would have to answer for their crimes in years to come. In his first year in charge of the Reich Security Main Office, 
Kaltenbrunner became a major patron and advocate for a man who would develop a fearsome reputation amongst the Allies by the end of the war. This was Otto Skorzeny, an Austrian-born member of the SS. Kaltenbrunner recommended Skorzeny for several missions in 1943, and as head of the RSHA, he may have been pivotal in the selection of Skorzeny to lead a special operations mission in Italy to rescue Benito Mussolini from his Italian captors after the fascist government in Rome had overthrown him and offered to surrender unconditionally to the Western Allies. Scorzini led the infamous Gran Sasso raid, in which Mussolini was rescued by German special operatives, led by Scorzini from a mountaintop hotel where he was being held captive in central Italy. With the Italian leader rescued, Scorzini and his men extracted him back to northern Italy and he was installed as the puppet ruler of the Italian Social Republic, which continued the war against the Allies from northern Italy for the remainder of the war. Kaltenbrunner's faith in Scorzini had been rewarded and he became the go-to German Special Operatives Commander for the remainder of the war. In the late autumn of 1943, Kaltenbrunner and Skorzeny became central to a highly secretive initiative. This was codenamed Operation Long Jump and resulted from the Germans acquiring intelligence that the three main leaders of the Allied war effort, the Prime Minister of Britain, Winston Churchill, the President of the United States, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and the dictator of the Soviet Union, Joseph Stalin, were due to meet in a major Allied conference in the city of Tehran in Iran in late November 1943. Kaltenbrunner was placed in charge of a top-secret plan to assassinate the three leaders. He quickly chose Skorzeny as the man to oversee the actual carrying out of the operation. In the weeks that followed, a special training school was established in Copenhagen, and there were plans afoot to send several units to Tehran when the conference started. The details remain shadowy to this day, but Kaltenbrunner and Skorzeny seem to have also planned on trying to take Roosevelt alive in order to bring him back to Germany as a bargaining tool in negotiating peace terms with the United States. The entire plan, though, was fatally undermined when an undercover Soviet agent, Nikolai Kuznetsov, obtained details of it from an SS officer, Ulrich von Ortel, in Ukraine weeks before the conference was due to start. Thus, Kaltenbrunner's efforts came to nothing, and the operation was abandoned. It was also during his time as the head of the RSHA that Kaltenbrunner became notorious for his stance towards homosexuality. Homosexuality had been illegal in Germany prior to the Nazis claiming power in 1933. However, the laws had only been loosely applied, and few individuals were prosecuted. That all changed from the mid-1930s onwards, as the Nazis made it a priority to persecute homosexuals. Eventually, between 1933 and 1945, over 100,000 people were arrested on charges of homosexuality of which roughly half were convicted. Many were sentenced to years in prison. As head of the Reich Policing Services from January 1943, Kaltenbrunner attempted to develop even more extreme policies, petitioning the Reich Ministry in the summer of 1943 to have a compulsory sentence of castration imposed on any males found guilty of homosexuality. In the end, he withdrew his proposal not because he had changed his mind, but because it seemed more plausible that the Gestapo could implement this independent of the courts. Additionally, many of those who were so convicted in the months that followed were often coerced into volunteering for chemical castration by telling them that it was a choice between this fate or being sent to the concentration camps. It is estimated that upwards of 800 men who were convicted of homosexual acts were castrated before the war ended. Kaltenbrunner was also one of the central figures in one of the most brutal episodes of the entire Holocaust. This occurred between the spring and late summer of 1944. Early that year, Hitler had decided to take a more interventionist line in Hungary, a country which had been allied with Nazi Germany throughout the war but one which had played a largely passive role in the final solution 
and other genocidal policies. There were three quarters of a million Jewish people in Hungary, so when Germany effectively took greater control of the country in the spring of 1944, a massive campaign to extend the Holocaust into the region was initiated. Kaltenbrunner and his old friend Eichmann were the two pivotal figures in what followed. Indeed, when the Hungarian regent Miklos Horthy was informed at a meeting with Hitler in Austria early in 1944 that Germany was taking greater control over Hungarian affairs, Kaltenbrunner and Eichmann travelled with Horthy back to Hungary on his train. Between March and July 1944, upwards of 400,000 of Hungary's Jews were arrested and sent to the death camps. The vast majority ended up at Auschwitz, where over 2,000 Hungarian Jews were being killed every day in May and June 1944. More would have been killed here at this time if the crematorium had the facility to burn more bodies. Kaltenbrunner was one of the central architects of this industrial-scale slaughter of Hungary's Jews. By the time the worst of the arrests and deportations were coming to an end in Hungary, Kaltenbrunner was called to Berlin. On the 20th of July 1944, there had been an attempt to kill Hitler at his military headquarters in Western Poland that was very nearly successful. This had been led by the military commander Klaus von Stauffenberg and involved a network of fairly senior and middling military officers. Their plans to launch a coup in the aftermath of the assassination failed as a bomb which had been intended to kill Hitler and several other leading members of the regime only wounded the Führer. The revolt was suppressed in the hours that followed. As chief of the security forces, Kaltenbrunner was called to Berlin to lead the investigations into how deep the plot ran. Weeks of investigations led to the arrest and conviction of thousands of individuals, many of them simply for knowing somebody who was implicated in the conspiracy. Eventually, approximately 5,000 people were executed in reprisals, and thousands more were sent into the concentration camp system. For his role in this, Kaltenbrunner was awarded the Knight's Cross to the War Merit Cross with Swords, the Blood Order, which was usually only awarded to those who had participated in the Beer Hall Putsch all the way back in 1923, and the Golden Party Badge, an award given to the oldest and most trusted members of the Nazi Party. By now, Kaltenbrunner was at the height of his power within the regime, as his personal standing with Hitler had soared. Thus, in December 1944, Himmler determined to promote him to the rank of General of the Waffen-SS. There were additional reasons for doing so which were tied to the general course of the war. In the summer of 1944, the Western Allies had opened the long-awaited Western Front in France with the D-Day landings in Normandy. By mid-autumn, Paris and Antwerp had been liberated and the Allies began building up their forces in the east of France for a drive into Germany that winter. In the east, the situation was even worse. The Russians had pushed the Germans back into Poland by the autumn of 1944, and despite efforts to hold the line both there and in western Ukraine, by the end of the year, they too were massing their armies in western Poland for a late winter offensive into eastern Germany. It was at this juncture that Himmler began awarding SS officers such as Kaltenbrunner the title of general, the hope being that once the war was over, they would be considered military officers rather than police officials, and would consequently be subject to international laws regarding the treatment of military prisoners. Kaltenbrunner was also one of many senior Nazis who, as the war effort became utterly doomed for Germany, tried to establish channels to determine what exact terms German surrender to the Western Allies, rather than the Soviet Union, could be negotiated on. The belief by this time was that the Western Allies would treat Germany far more leniently than would the Soviet Union, a nation which had been left devastated by the German invasion and where approximately 27 million people lost their lives during the war. To that end, late in 1944, he established contacts with the International Red Cross based out of neutral Switzerland. In mid-March 1945, he met with the president of the organization, Karl Jakob Burkhardt, 
at Vorarlberg in Western Austria. These negotiations, however, ultimately led nowhere, though Kaltenbrunner was not implicated for any treasonous behavior in attempting these negotiations, and many senior Nazis had also been seeking to establish what the parameters of surrender might be through various diplomatic lines in late 1944 and early 1945. There was one last desperate act for Kaltenbrunner during the war. On the 18th of April, even as the Allies were spreading out all around Germany, Himmler appointed Kaltenbrunner as commander of the Southern Armies. By this stage, this involved some disparate forces which were still holding much of Austria and parts of Hungary, Croatia and adjoining territory. Not because the forces here were holding out against Allied attacks, but simply because they faced little hostile action. The Allies seeing little strategic benefit in securing these countries when the real target was Germany and Berlin. Thus, rather than overseeing a major military campaign here, Kaldenbrunner spent the last weeks of April and early May making some provisions for the remaining Nazi soldiers and SS members under his command to begin a guerrilla campaign against the Allies once the area was occupied. He also became involved in a peculiar dispute with the Nazi governor of Upper Austria, August Eigrube, over the fate of a huge cache of 6,500 artworks which had been assembled over the years in the region for the purposes of erecting a museum to Hitler near his hometown of Braunau am Inn. Eichröber wished to destroy the entire collection, which included works by Renaissance masters such as Michelangelo, Jan van Eyck and Jan van Meer, and which had been looted from across occupied Europe. Kaltenbrunner prevented him from doing so, in a peculiar conclusion to the war in Upper Austria. Kaltenbrunner was not alone in his efforts to negotiate the terms of a German surrender in late 1944 and early 1945, and others such as Himmler and Hermann Göring were involved in similar efforts. None of these were successful, however, in large part because Hitler was determined to fight on until the end. This was despite the inevitability of defeat by early 1945. The Soviets had crossed into eastern Germany by this time and were advancing on Berlin, while the Western Allies had begun occupying the Rhineland in Western Germany at the same time. Both sides were anxious to be the one to capture the German capital, but it was the Russians who had the geographical advantage. Thus, while the Americans, Canadians, British, French and others was spreading out to take Bavaria and other regions in the spring of 1945, the Russians surrounded Berlin. The battle for the city began in mid-April, with the Nazis arming old men and teenagers to defend the city. It did not last long, and on the 30th of April, with Russian gunfire and tanks nearing the city center, Hitler killed himself in the Reich Chancellery bunker. His nominated successor, Josef Goebbels, did likewise the following day, leaving the negotiation of a formal surrender to the Allies to be worked out by the new President of Germany, Admiral Karl Donitz. A formal announcement of the end of the war in Europe was made on the 8th of May, 1945. By the time the surrender was formalized on the 8th of May, Kaldenbrunner was on the run. He had briefly flown to Berlin in mid-April for a meeting with Hitler to have his post as commander of the German armies in southern Europe confirmed and to discuss his strategy for proceeding in the coming weeks, after which he returned to Austria. He was there when news of Hitler's suicide and then the end of the war reached him. As it was clear that high-ranking Nazi officials and senior members of the SS would be arrested by the Allies Kaltenbrunner eloped with his deputy commander in Austria, Arthur Scheidler, and several other SS members into the Austrian Alps, where they hoped to avoid detection, hiding in a mountain cabin with false identity papers. On the way, Kaltenbrunner threw his official seal as head of the RSHA into an alpine lake, from which it was recovered by a tourist in 2001. The small party of SS soldiers did not operate under the radar for very long. On the 12th of May 1945, they were apprehended and arrested by members of the US 80th Infantry Division 
after reports had circulated in the nearby town of Alt Ausse that some men were hiding in the cabin on the mountainside. When they were apprehended, their false identities were soon unraveled, but Kaltenbrunner would not have avoided positive identification for very long anyway. His profile as head of the Reich Security main office was too high, and his facial scars too identifiable for him to have avoided arrest. Kaltenbrunner and those he was arrested with would soon face trial. In the closing months of the war, the Allies had keenly debated exactly how they should proceed in terms of dealing with Germany and its people once the war concluded. Sober heads prevailed, ones which argued that to impose blanket penalties and punishments on the German population, such as had been done in the form of indemnities after the First World War, would possibly create new resentments in Germany and would also be fundamentally unjust. Many Germans had nothing to do with the crimes of the Nazis. A political party which had only ever received just over 35% of the vote in any national election in Germany. Moreover, ordinary Germans could hardly be held responsible for the atrocities which had been committed at concentration camps which were clandestinely established in occupied Poland. As such, the Allies came to the conclusion that they would only seek to prosecute the leaders of the Nazi party, other officials and Germans who had actively facilitated them in fomenting the war and committing widespread crimes against humanity, and the entirety of the SS, the organization that had run the concentration camps and been responsible for an appalling litany of crimes across Central and Eastern Europe between 1939 and 1945. Kaltenbrunner fell into two different categories of those who were to be prosecuted. He was a high-ranking member of the Nazi party, particularly in Austria where he had aided in the establishment of the concentration camp system and served as police chief of Vienna and latterly as a senior military commander. Additionally, he was a member of the SS and had actually risen to become its second most senior figure, junior only to Heinrich Himmler. Furthermore, events that occurred in the weeks following Kaltenbrunner's arrest made him an even more significant figure when it came to the prosecution of German war criminals. On the 21st of May 1945, Himmler was arrested in northern Germany near the Danish border, where many Nazi leaders had fled as Berlin was being captured by the Russians. He was quickly identified and interrogated, but just two days later, on the 23rd of May, he committed suicide by swallowing a cyanide capsule at a detention center near Lüneburg. Thus, suddenly, Kaltenbrunner became the most senior surviving member of the SS. With both Himmler and Heiderich dead, he was the figure who would be included as the main SS defendant in the trial of the leading members of the Nazi regime, which was to be held before an international military tribunal at the city of Nuremberg in southern Germany. The Nuremberg trial commenced in mid-November 1945. It lasted through to the early autumn of 1946. The length of the trial is explained by the fact that the prosecution wanted to make clear to the whole world the extent of the Nazis' crimes. While there were also two dozen defendants involved, though several were missing individuals who were to be tried in absentia. Of them, Hermann Göring was the most senior, while others included the Nazi foreign minister Joachim von Ribbentrop, the former deputy leader of the Nazi party Rudolf Hess, and the armaments minister and Hitler's architect Albert Speer. Kaltenbrunner was initially absent from the trial, as he received treatment for a brain hemorrhage. When he was able to attend in person, he claimed his signature had been falsified on documents which implicated him in the committing of war crimes and that his position as head of the RSHA was symbolic. Unsurprisingly, the court did not believe him, and he was found guilty of war crimes and crimes against humanity and sentenced to death. He was brought for execution with the eight others who had been sentenced to death in the trial on the 16th of October 1946, and Kaltenbrunner's last words before he was hanged were used to further the claim, yet again, that he had no knowledge of the crimes committed by the regime. 
afterwards, the bodies of those who were executed were cremated and scattered in the river Isa near the Austrian border. Ernst Kaltenbrunner is something of an enigmatic character. Unlike many of the others whom he stood trial with at Nuremberg in 1945 and 1946, he was a somewhat peripheral figure within the Nazi regime at the outbreak of the Second World War. By way of contrast, Hermann Goering was one of the most senior figures in the Nazi party and Hitler's declared successor for much of the war. Wilhelm Keitel was the overall commander of the German armed forces and Joachim von Ribbentrop was the German foreign minister who orchestrated the infamous Molotov-Ribbentrop agreement with the Soviet Union. Kaltenbrunner was a regional SS police officer in Austria in the autumn of 1939, a relatively senior one within the Vienna hierarchy, but not someone who would have been expected to ascend to a major position in the years that followed. His promotion as head of the Reich security main office was owing to a peculiar set of circumstances. Firstly, Reinhard Heydrich, the occupant of the position, was assassinated, the only senior Nazi official to be successfully killed during the war. And then Heinrich Himmler made a peculiar decision to appoint Kaltenbrunner as his successor, despite the availability of some other more likely candidates, such as the head of the Gestapo, Heinrich Müller. Many were surprised that Kaltenbrunner was appointed to the post. Perhaps owing to his rather strange rise from obscurity to become the second most senior official within the SS, Kaltenbrunner has remained one of the most shadowy and little discussed characters within the Nazi regime. But there is no doubting his ideological fanaticism. He was a zealous follower of Hitler and he proved as ruthless a head of the Reich security main office as Heydrich had been. As a result, the final solution, which Heydrich had overseen the initiation of across the SS-run concentration camps shortly before his death, was energetically overseen by Kaltenbrunner and individuals whom he managed through the RSHA, such as his childhood friend Adolf Eichmann. His anti-Semitism and ideological adherence to Nazism was considerable, and it was under Kaltenbrunner's oversight, with Eichmann's aid, that the mass murder of over half of Hungary's 750,000 Jews was orchestrated in the space of just six months in 1944. Moreover, Kaltenbrunner's outlook in other areas was barbaric, notably his desire to have an official policy of castration implemented across the Reich for those found guilty of homosexuality. Once the war ended, Kaltenbrunner yet again found himself seemingly promoted to a position few would have expected. This was as a defendant at the headline trial before the International Military Tribunal at Nuremberg from the autumn of 1945 to the autumn of 1946. With both Himmler and Heydrich dead, Kaltenbrunner was the most senior member of the SS left alive to stand trial. Given his record as head of the Reich Security Main Office since 1943, he was certainly an adequate replacement to be sentenced to death in 1946. What do you think of Ernst Kaltenbrunner? Was he every bit as brutal a head of the Reich Security Main Office as Heydrich, or was he simply a functionary who continued the processes which had been put in place by his predecessor? Please let us know in the comments section and in the meantime, thank you very much for watching. The man known to history as Paul Josef Goebbels was born in the town of Reit in West Germany on the 29th of October 1897. He was born into a modest family and his background was quite unremarkable. His father was Fritz Goebbels, he worked in the local wick factory and eventually rose to become a foreman there. His mother, Katharina Maria Odenhausen, was half Dutch, the daughter of a blacksmith. Katharina had a close connection with her son, and she and Josef remained close throughout his life. Both Josef's parents were devoted Roman Catholics, though later in his life Goebbels had to persistently refute allegations they were partly Jewish. The family was solidly lower middle class, enough that a family piano was purchased in 1909 
a symbol of their upwardly mobile aspirations, but Fritz Goebbels was earning just 4,000 marks annually and had no liquid assets. Consequently, the young Josef did not come from any significant wealth, and his early life was characterized by efforts to attain a greater financial and social position. Goebbels suffered from ill health as a child. He had a club foot that he acquired in his early years, following a bout of osteomyelitis. A swelling of the bone marrow, this left his leg deformed for the remainder of his life, and he also had lung problems, and so much of his later psychology was shaped by insecurities about his health problems and lack of athleticism. This was compounded by his rejection for military service when he sought to enlist in the German army at the height of the First World War. His later writings are suffused with statements which make it clear that he was attempting throughout his life to compensate for his physical deformity through his literary and political ambitions. The world in which Joseph Goebbels reached his teenage years and then young manhood in was one of turmoil. In the summer of 1914, conflict enveloped Europe when a regional diplomatic crisis in the Balkans expanded to lead to a war involving all of Europe's major powers. On one side were arrayed Britain, France, Italy, and Russia, with the United States joining these allied powers in 1917. On the other, the German Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and the Ottoman Turkish Empire formed an alliance known as the Central Powers. As a native of Western Germany, Goebbels would have spent his early years watching German soldiers passing through on trains towards the Western Front in northeast France, where the bulk of the fighting took place in horrific trench warfare between 1914 and 1918. Consequently, his spurning by the military in his formative years was a difficult experience for the young Goebbels. Germany eventually lost the war in November 1918 and was forced into a highly punitive series of peace treaties the following year. Generally referred to under the umbrella terms of the Treaty of Versailles, the German Reich was stripped of a huge amount of its territory which was granted to other countries and made up much of the new country of Poland, formed to the east of Germany after the war ended. Under the terms of the Treaty of Versailles, Germany was also forced to pay punitive monetary remuneration to France and Britain for its alleged fault in causing the war. Furthermore, Germany was forced to reduce its army to a tiny contingent of men and was prohibited from remilitarizing the Rhineland region of Western Germany. The terms were negotiated by the government of the Weimar Republic, which was formed in Germany following the dissolution of the Second German Reich or Empire named after the town in central Germany where the new republic was formed early in 1919. In time, Weimar would become a derogatory term for those who had negotiated Germany's humiliating surrender to the Allied powers, and the architects of the peace became known as the November criminals. Goebbels' life in the years that followed was highly formative for him. For a while, he considered entering the priesthood, but his commitment to his parents' Catholicism cooled eventually. He also spent periods of time at multiple universities at Bonn, Munich, Würzburg, and Freiburg, before eventually earning a PhD in German philology from Heidelberg University in 1921 at just 24 years of age. He would later publish his work, just one of 14 books he had written by 1940. Following his time at Heidelberg, Goebbels attempted to establish himself in the early 1920s variously as a journalist, novelist, and playwright, but he was broadly unsuccessful in his endeavors. Somewhat like Hitler, who had aspired to become a watercolor artist in his early years, Goebbels had sought a career in the arts and literature through his writing, but was frustrated in his efforts. As this occurred, he became increasingly disaffected in the course of 1923 and 1924. Like many other young men who were disillusioned with life in post-war Germany, Goebbels found himself drawn to a new political party in Bavaria, which had earned a reputation for controversy in a short period of time. The National Socialist German Workers' Party, or Nazi Party, had been established in Munich in 1920. Its goals were the overturning of the humiliating terms of the Treaty of Versailles, which had ended the war, German rearmament, and re-expansion of the German state into Eastern Europe. 
From its earliest days, the Nazi party was also an extremely anti-Semitic party and envisaged the total exclusion of the Jewish community from German life. It was led by a young Austrian called Adolf Hitler. Under his leadership, the Nazis attempted a failed coup d'etat in Munich on the 8th of November 1923. The Beer Hall Putsch, as it became known, was quickly snuffed out on the 9th of November by the regional authorities. Hitler and some of his closest associates were tried for treason in March 1924 and imprisoned. The abortive revolt possibly drew Goebbels to the Nazis. He had been moving increasingly in right-wing political circles throughout 1924. His radicalization at this time may also have been owing to the occupation of the Ruhr area of Western Germany by French and Belgian troops between January 1923 and August 1925 in response to Germany defaulting on its war reparations payments. On the 22nd of October 1924, the Goebbels family home in Reit was searched by Belgian police, and the following day Goebbels himself was interrogated by the occupation police. It is hardly coincidental that two weeks later, in November 1924, he wrote and published an article in a newspaper, the Volkische Freiheit, in which he called for Hitler's early release from prison. Hitler was indeed released early, on the 20th of December 1924, by which time Goebbels had joined the Nazi party, beginning the association which would dominate the remainder of his life. Goebbels' role in the Nazi party grew in the years that followed. We know a great deal about his life from the mid-1920s through Goebbels' own writings. Starting in 1923, he kept a series of extensive diaries unbroken for 22 years down to his death in 1945. These diaries were taken to Russia after the war and have only become fully available since 2008. Stretching to 32 volumes in the modern print editions, they provide a uniquely detailed insight into the life, career and thoughts of one of the leading members of the Nazi leadership. They also provide what one of the foremost historians of Nazi Germany, Ian Kershaw, has deemed a vitally important source of insight into Hitler's thinking and action particularly in his ascent to power in the 1920s and early 1930s. The diaries give extensive details of Goebbels' career in the initial years of his membership of the Nazi party. In his early days, he was under the patronage of Gregor Strasser, a leading member of the party who led a branch of the Nazis that leaned more towards socialism and anti-capitalism in opposition to Hitler's right-wing faction. And owing to Strasser's influence, in 1924, Goebbels was appointed as a spokesperson for the party in the Rhineland region where he originally hailed from. His role as a propagandist for the party also began at this time, as he was set to start work as a writer and editor for the party newspaper, the Volkische Beobachter, or the People's Observer. During these years of the mid-1920s, Goebbels found himself increasingly drawn into an internal struggle within the Nazi regime over the ideological future of the party. This was driven by a split between Hitler, who favoured a hard-line anti-Semitic, nationalist approach with only a limited emphasis on socialism, and Strasser. Goebbels' diaries reveal that he sympathised with both sides. He was drawn to the more socially grounded outlook of Strasser, but he increasingly favoured Hitler from late 1925 onwards, having read Hitler's anti-Semitic biography, Mein Kampf, or My Struggle, which Hitler had written while serving his prison sentence for the failed Beer Hall Putsch in 1924, and the first volume of which was published in 1925. Following multiple meetings with the charismatic Hitler at a party conference held in Bamberg in northern Bavaria on the 14th of February 1926, Goebbels became a committed adherent of the Nazi leader. It has been speculated that Goebbels was an extreme narcissist, and needed a figurehead or leader of some sort from whom he could gain affirmation and approval. This would certainly explain the obsession he developed with gaining Hitler's esteem in the mid-1920s, an obsession which would characterize their relationship over the 20 years that followed. Goebbels' support for the leader bordered on zealotry, and from this point forward, Goebbels began his long association as one of Hitler's closest allies. In recognition of his rising position within the party, Goebbels was appointed as Gauleiter, or regional commander of Berlin, within the Nazi party in August 1926, a position he would hold until his eventual death in 1945. 
In Berlin, in an effort to promote the party in the capital, Goebbels developed many of the propaganda strategies which became hallmarks of the Nazis in the years ahead. These involved using large posters of vibrant red and black ink, often emblazoned with the swastika, the Nazi party's symbol, and with stark political messages. Goebbels also founded a party newspaper called Der Angriff, or The Attack, in the capital, combining his propaganda strategy with violence and intimidation. Goebbels also had the Nazis' uniformed paramilitary body, the SA, engage in attacks and violence in beer halls in Berlin in the months that followed his appointment. As a consequence of all this work, Goebbels won election to parliament in the Reichstag elections held on the 20th of May 1928. His election was especially surprising as the Nazis generally performed poorly in these elections, particularly in the cities, and their power base was largely confined to the Munich region of Bavaria and some parts of the countryside by 1928. The attitude of the new Reichstag deputy towards parliamentary democracy was stark, having stated, we are entering the Reichstag in order that we may arm ourselves with the weapons of democracy from its arsenal. We shall become Reichstag deputies in order that the Weimar ideology should itself help us to destroy it. Goebbels' statements that the Nazis could undermine the German Republic from within Parliament itself may have seemed fanciful given the party's election result in 1928, but all of this began to change in 1929. After years of rapid economic growth in the 1920s, the United States stock market began to overheat and collapse in the autumn of 1929. Starting in September, share prices began to fall, culminating on the 25th of October with the largest one-day selling off of shares in US history. What became known as Black Friday was the peak of the Wall Street crash. It ushered in the Great Depression, which would see economies all over the world impacted in the years ahead. Still suffering from its war debt and other political and economic problems, Germany was particularly susceptible to the problems created by the Wall Street crash and the Great Depression. And in the years ahead, as the German economy contracted and millions of Germans lost either their jobs or their savings, the Nazi party with its message of resentment and xenophobia would grow in popularity. The first major electoral boom occurred in 1930. An election was called in the spring for the 14th of September 1930. Goebbels was central to the Nazis' electoral campaign, shaping the party's message around opposition to the terms of the Versailles Treaty which had ended the First World War, and the humiliating terms of which Germany continued to suffer under. Thousands of meetings were held countrywide. In the resulting election, the Nazis went from being a minor party which had actually lost support in the 1928 election to the second largest party in Germany, with nearly one in five voters supporting them. This translated into 107 seats in the 577-seat Reichstag. Only the centrist Social Democratic Party won more seats, taking 143. The Social Democratic Party were consequently in a position to lead the government. Significantly, the Communist Party of Germany came in third in the election, winning 77 seats. As such, the extremist parties won a great share of the vote in this election. As the effects of the Great Depression hit home in Germany, the rise of the Communists also allowed the Nazis to depict themselves in the years ahead as a bulwark against a potential Communist takeover of Germany. As one of the Nazis' chief propagandists, Goebbels was central to its efforts to exploit fears over a communist surge in the years ahead. Between 1930 and the next Reichstag elections, the Berlin Gauleiter was developing new methods of disseminating the Nazi message. He began experimenting with the new medium of silent films, something which would play a central role in spreading the Nazis' ideology and wartime propaganda in the 1930s and 1940s. The radio was also exploited effectively by Goebbels. When Hitler ran unsuccessfully for the office of German president in 1932, Goebbels oversaw the broadcasting of regular radio messages, detailing the Führer's almost daily plane journeys around Germany to torch-lit parades, where he stirred up increasing support amongst Protestants, middle-class business owners, and women. These were groups in German society who increasingly favored the Nazis. As the German banking system neared collapse in 1931, 
and efforts by the centrist administration in Berlin to negotiate German debt relief with Britain and France failed. Although Hitler lost the 1932 presidential election to Paul von Hindenburg, a German hero of the First World War, the Nazi leader, buoyed by Goebbels' propaganda and election strategizing, had nevertheless performed very well, coming a close second to von Hindenburg. It was inevitable that this newfound support for the party would translate into greater electoral success when a new Reichstag election took place. New elections were imminent by 1932. In their efforts to ensure that both the Nazis and the Communists were kept out of government, a coalition of centrist parties had been operating minority governments for months. When the first election since 1930 was held on the 31st of July 1932, the Nazis became the largest party in Germany for the first time. This was largely owing to socio-economic circumstances. The unemployment rate in Germany had reached nearly 30% by 1932. People's savings had been obliterated. The banking system was on the verge of total collapse, and the centrist governments had seemed incapable of arresting the situation, despite successfully negotiating to have the majority of Germany's war reparations debt cancelled. By expertly manipulating popular resentment and anger at the prevailing economic conditions, the Nazi party won 230 seats in the July 1932 Reichstag elections. Thus, the Nazis, along with Goebbels, a major driving force behind their propaganda and election campaigns, had ascended to become the dominant party in Germany by the summer of 1932. Nearly two out of every five voters had supported Hitler and his party. However, they lacked a majority in Parliament, and negotiations with some of the more centrist parties to establish a coalition broke down in the autumn of 1932. Consequently, Germans had to return to the polls in November 1932 for the second time that year. The Reichstag elections held on the 6th of November 1932 were the last free and fair elections held in Germany prior to the establishment of the German Third Reich. Although the Nazis lost votes, they yet again emerged as the largest party, winning 196 seats and one in three votes. The elections of November 1932 continued the parliamentary stalemate, yet a solution was in the making. For several months, an uneasy alliance, but an alliance nonetheless, had been developing between the Nazi party and some centrist political forces, along with the powerful industrial lobbyists who ran German business. The latter were wary of the Nazis, but were prepared to countenance supporting Hitler and the party Goebbels had become the leading propagandist for if the Nazis could prevent the rise of the parties of the left in Germany. As such, the industrialists and centrists agreed to do business with the Nazis in 1932, in an effort to prevent the further rise of the Communist Party and their allies on the left of the political spectrum. The spectre of Soviet Russia, where the Communists had risen to power following the Russian Revolution of 1917, hung large over Germany in 1932. Inadvertently, it would facilitate the rise of Hitler and the destruction of the Weimar Republic. Following extensive negotiations, a coalition of the Nazis, center parties, and industrialists was finally concluded on the 30th of January 1933. Hitler became Chancellor of Germany, the head of the government, and the Nazis were given three of the 11 cabinet positions. Goebbels was frustrated not to receive one of these positions, but he would not have long to wait to mark the event. He oversaw a huge torch-lit parade in Berlin on the night of the 30th of January 1933, attended by approximately 60,000 supporters of the Nazis. It featured brigades of SS and SA members, the paramilitary branches of the Nazi party, and would prefigure the military parades which would become ubiquitous in Germany for the next 12 years of Nazi rule. The new government moved quickly to consolidate its power. Punitive measures to repress the Communist Party and other parties of the left were quickly implemented in February 1933. A fire at the Reichstag on the 28th of February was then used as a pretext for passing emergency legislation which briefly gave the government additional powers and a snap Reichstag election was called for the 5th of March. Voter intimidation and fraud was employed in the resulting campaign, but the Nazis were still only able to win 44% of the vote 
which translated into 288 seats in the Reichstag. This, however, was enough. On the 23rd of March 1933, the Nazis excluded the communists and others from the Reichstag and intimidated several other parties in order to ensure that an enabling act was passed by an overwhelming majority through both houses of the parliament. This enabling act decreed that the German chancellor and his government could effectively suspend the government and rule by decree for a period of four years. The passage of it through the Reichstag effectively spelt the end of the Weimar Republic and the establishment of a single party Nazi rule in Germany. Goebbels did not have to wait until the passage of the Enabling Act to acquire the ministerial position he had long sought. On the 14th of March 1933, Hitler appointed Goebbels as head of the newly created Reich Ministry for Public Enlightenment and Propaganda. Over the next 12 years and for the duration of the German Third Reich, Goebbels would enforce Nazi ideology throughout Germany and Europe through his ministry. Goebbels' thoughts on propaganda and its uses were perhaps best expressed in a speech entitled The Art of Propaganda, which he made before the political education seminar of the Nazi party in Berlin on the 9th of January 1928. Here, he stated, Propaganda shows that it is good if, over a certain period of it, it can win over and fire up people for an idea. If it fails to do so, it is bad propaganda. If propaganda wins the people it wanted to win, it was presumably good. And if not, it was presumably bad. No one can say that your propaganda is too crude or low or brutal, or that it is not decent enough. For those are not the relevant criteria. Its purpose is not to be decent or gentle or weak or modest. It is to be successful. Thus, Goebbels' view was clear. The end always justified the means when it came to state propaganda, and any methods, however crude or deceptive, could be used if they furthered Hitler's and the wider Nazi party's ideological goals. A sense of the scale of control which Goebbels hoped to exercise over German life through his ministry can be glimpsed by examining the organizational structure of his department. It was divided into multiple branches, which variously dealt with broadcasting, the national and foreign press, films, censorship, the arts, music and theatre, mass rallies, race issues, indoctrination of German youth, and counteroffensives against anything which was deemed to be foreign or domestic propaganda directed against the Nazi state. Over the next 12 years, from its headquarters across from Hitler's own offices in the Reich Chancellery, Goebbels would shape the ideology of the Nazi party and the Third Reich. No one did more to shape how the German people perceived the Nazis and their governance of Germany. Goebbels' propaganda methods were immensely varied. One of his first major acts was the massive repression of German art and culture. Writers and artists who were considered anti-German in their actions were silenced and their works destroyed or suppressed. Goebbels was also central to a series of mass book burnings which swept through Germany shortly after the ascent to power of the Nazis, the foremost occurrence being on the 10th of May 1933. That evening, German students in Berlin oversaw the burning of over 25,000 books which were deemed un-German. These included works by Karl Marx, Erich Maria Remarque, Albert Einstein and Sigmund Freud. Goebbels was central to the events in Berlin on the 10th of May and gave a speech before thousands of people in which he encouraged the crowd to reject the moral corruption which such books instilled, suffusing his oration with the anti-Semitism which was the trademark of the Nazi party. He stated at the event in Berlin that the era of Jewish intellectualism is at an end. These events showed how far Goebbels had drifted from his earlier life. The PhD student and would-be writer of 1921 had become the overseer of mass book burnings and cultural destruction. Unsurprisingly, in the years ahead, many prominent authors such as Thomas Mann began to leave Germany. Goebbels continued in these years to mold German culture to the goals of Nazi ideology. Using the Reich Chamber of Culture, which was established in September 1933, the arts were subordinated to the Nazi cause. For instance, new films being produced in Germany henceforward 
often had a Nazi message, sometimes a subtle one, but one which aided the Nazi cause. Much of this sought to portray Hitler as the savior of Europe, against the threat of Bolshevism and communism taking power in Germany and elsewhere on the continent. Goebbels' control of the German film industry became absolute in March 1937, when the German film industry was nationalized and came virtually entirely under his ministry's control. Around this time, he stated his views on how cinema could be used as an art which expresses an attitude through its national socialist character and by taking up national socialist problems, but should do so in a way which did not appear deliberate and remains in the background. Even more consequential was Goebbels' exploitation and control over the national press and methods of communication. Germany had more papers than almost all other European countries under the Weimar Republic, but under Goebbels' ministry, the Nazi party effectively took control over the major newspapers. Journalists were briefed by Goebbels' ministry and often had what they printed dictated to them by the party apparatus. Journalists who diverged from the Nazi message were often intimidated or arrested. His control of and exploitation of the new and emerging types of mass media was even more comprehensive. Under his leadership, the Ministry for Public Enlightenment and Propaganda distributed millions of radios to Germans. This was the mass medium which Goebbels preferred for indoctrination of the German people. In the first year of full Nazi rule alone, over 50 of Hitler's speeches were broadcast on radio. The emerging medium of film was also exploited in this way. Loudspeakers were set up in public places throughout Germany so that state messages could be drilled into people in public places. Goebbels was also central to the organization of the huge Nazi party rallies which were held throughout Germany in the years ahead. The most infamous example was the 1934 Nazi Party Congress rallies at Nuremberg, the events of which were immortalized in the propaganda film of the same, directed by Leni Riefenstahl, The Triumph of the Will, which won many film awards around Europe in the 1930s and has been called one of the most effective pieces of political propaganda ever made. The effect over time of this constant affirmation of the Nazi message was immense. In their rise to power, the Nazis had never been able to attain the support of more than about a third of the German people. In the last free Reichstag elections in November 1933, the party had gleaned only one third of the votes. However, by the late 1930s, in large part owing to Goebbels' propaganda work, the Nazis had become more popular countrywide and faith in Hitler's leadership was immense. As a result, when a referendum was held on the 19th of August 1934, to appoint Hitler officially as Führer or leader of Germany, with the combined offices of Chancellor and President, it was passed by an overwhelming majority of 88% in favor, a result which was only partly fraudulent, indicating the growing popularity of the Nazis, and in the months and years after their rise to power, there is little doubt that Goebbels' work as a propagandist was highly successful after the Nazis seized power in the 1930s. At the same time, Goebbels' own political power was growing in the 1930s. He was generally disliked by his colleagues in government. Indeed, an article in Life magazine in 1938 noted that Goebbels likes nobody, is liked by nobody, and runs the most efficient Nazi department. Despite his aloofness towards most of his colleagues, he was one of Hitler's closest confidants. When Hitler decided to combine the offices of German Chancellor and President of Germany, following the death of the President Paul von Hindenburg in August 1934, it was Goebbels who made the announcement by radio to the German nation on the 2nd of August. As well as this, Hitler had become close with Goebbels' family. On the 19th of December 1931, Goebbels had married Magda Ritschl. They had numerous children in the 1930s, and the family became referred to as the first family of the Reich, Hitler having remained a bachelor without children. Other signs of Goebbels' prominence in the regime followed. For instance, he was appointed as president of the organizing committee for the Summer and Winter Olympics, when they were held in Berlin in 1936, a major role which put him center stage in Germany for an international event. 
Goebbels was also involved in the growing persecution of Germany's Jewish population in the years following the Nazis' ascent to power. His anti-Semitism was long-standing and was one of the reasons why he had been attracted to the Nazi party and Hitler in the 1920s. Yet, there were also contradictions to Goebbels' anti-Semitism. In his student years, he had a close relationship with several Jewish teachers for a time, and he dated Elsa Janka, a Jewish schoolteacher, for several years in the early 1920s. He even considered marrying her. Despite these contradictions in his attitudes towards German Jewry, Goebbels quickly became one of the most enthusiastic persecutors of Germany's Jews following the Nazi ascent to power in 1933. In October of that year, he was responsible for passing the Reich Press Law, through which all Jewish editors were removed from working at German newspapers and other print outlets. Throughout these years, there are repeated references in his diaries to efforts to de-Jewify German culture. When a set of laws known as the Nuremberg Laws were passed on the 15th of September 1935, effectively prohibiting Jews from holding German citizenship and from marrying Germans, Goebbels had propaganda pieces published in outlets such as the newspaper Der Stürmer, justifying the prohibitions and attacks on Germany's Jews. His propaganda continued to feed the Nazi state's growing anti-Semitism in the years ahead as the first concentration camps were set up in Germany to house political prisoners, including many Jews. In early November 1938, Goebbels was central to the worst anti-Semitic pogrom in Germany prior to the outbreak of the war. On the 7th of November 1938, a Jewish teenager, Herschel Grinspan, shot a German diplomat, Ernst vom Rath, at the German embassy in Paris. Vom Rath died two days later on the 9th of November, Later that evening, Goebbels gave a speech at a commemorative event marking the 15-year anniversary of the Beer Hall Putsch of 1923, in which he made it clear that spontaneous acts of violence and attacks on Jews and their property would be tolerated by the government in response to vom Rath's death. A later report stated that Goebbels' speech had clearly been intended to indicate that, while the Nazi party and the government did not wish to be seen as perpetuating retaliations on the Jewish community, it was essentially stating that they should be organized and carried out on an unofficial basis. What followed was an orgy of violence on the night of the 9th of November 1938. Kristallnacht, or the Night of the Broken Glass as it has become known, saw the Nazi paramilitary forces and gangs of German citizens attack Jewish businesses, homes and synagogues throughout Germany. Approximately 100 Jews were murdered in the hours of violence, over 200 synagogues were ransacked or destroyed, and as many as 7,000 Jewish businesses had windows broken or worse damage inflicted. Perhaps as many as 30,000 Jews were also detained on fabricated charges and confined to the new concentration camps which were proliferating around Germany. The psychological effects were even worse. The Jews thereafter in Germany were aware that they were a people under perpetual attack. It is estimated that several hundred Jews committed suicide in the days and weeks following the pogrom, and many Jewish families began to consider leaving Germany. However, Kristallnacht was a portent of worse to come. While Goebbels was one of the most ardent supporters and actors in Germany's growing anti-Semitic policies, he was less enthusiastic about the Nazi state's drift towards war in the late 1930s. The Nazis had long been committed to re-establishing German military power, in contravention of the heavy restrictions placed on the size of the German army and air force under the terms of the Versailles Treaty. From 1933 onwards, Hitler and the Nazi leadership began expanding the German air force, the Luftwaffe, and the German army, the Wehrmacht, and on the 7th of March 1936, German troops were sent into the Rhineland region of Western Germany, which had been established as a demilitarized zone under the terms of Versailles. Further aggression followed in the years ahead. On the 12th of March 1938, Germany annexed Austria, uniting the two German-speaking countries under Nazi rule. 
The Anschluss, as it has become known, made clear Germany's aggressive intentions in Europe and the other European powers were increasingly fearful of war from early 1938 onwards. However, Britain's Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain tried to pacify Hitler through concessions in the months ahead, particularly as the Nazis began pressing a claim to the Sudetenland region of Czechoslovakia in the autumn of 1938. On the 14th of September 1938, Goebbels published an aggressive editorial in the Volkischer Beobachter promoting German claims to the region, owing to the large number of ethnically German people living there. Eventually, in early October 1938, Germany was ceded the Sudetenland in return for a guarantee that Hitler would otherwise respect Czechoslovakia's independence. This was breached in early March 1939, as Germany invaded Czechoslovakia. In the days ahead, the country and neighboring Hungary were variously either annexed by Germany or formed into satellite vassal states. Thus, by the spring of 1939, the Nazis had established themselves as masters of all of Central Europe. But Britain and France were now clear that Hitler and Germany could not be pacified. As a consequence, when the Germans invaded Poland on the 1st of September 1939, Britain and France declared war on Germany two days later. On the 3rd of September 1939, the Second World War had commenced. In its initial stages, the war was a resounding success for Germany. Poland was quickly overrun and divided up between Germany and Soviet Russia in the autumn of 1939 with whom a non-aggression pact had been agreed, despite the ideological differences between the fascist Nazis and the communist Russians. The following April, Denmark and Norway were invaded and quickly conquered. Then, on the night of the 9th of May 1940, after months of military build-up in Western Germany, the Wehrmacht received orders to invade France through the Low Countries of the Netherlands, Belgium and Luxembourg. Over the next five weeks, there followed a complete military collapse of France. Paris was captured on the 14th of June 1940, effectively ending the military campaign. And on the 25th of June, an armistice was signed as a preliminary to establishing a puppet government in France. Germany had effectively conquered Western Europe. Britain had only barely managed to pull its army out of mainland Europe and back to Britain in time undertaking a daring naval evacuation of over 300,000 troops from the port town of Dunkirk in northern France between the 26th of May and the 4th of June. Consequently, Britain was able to continue in the war and Germany would have to undertake a protracted effort to weaken its resolve through bombing campaigns in 1940 and 1941. The Blitz, as this campaign became known, was ultimately unsuccessful. Despite these early successes, Goebbels was less enthusiastic about the prospects of war in 1939 than many of the other senior members of the Nazi party. At times, he was entirely realistic. For instance, an entry in his diaries in April 1940 noted, We must achieve victory in the course of this year, otherwise the material superiority of the opposite side would become too strong. A war of many years would also be difficult to maintain for psychological reasons. Nevertheless, he was central to the war effort. The Reich Ministry for Public Enlightenment and Propaganda was effectively responsible for shaping the state's message about the war effort and what German citizens were told about what was happening in 1939 and 1940. From the start of the invasion of the Low Countries and France in May 1940, Goebbels wrote and published editorials which were broadcast nationally on German radio and often published in newspapers. For instance, between May 1940 and the spring of 1945, Goebbels published 218 editorials in the newspaper he had founded, Das Reich or The Empire. This was published weekly, so Goebbels' writings glorifying the war effort and denouncing Germany's enemies were rarely absent from any edition of the paper. As the war progressed, Goebbels also increasingly exploited the medium of film to glorify the German war effort at home and abroad. Films of the German armies progressing through Poland and France became staples of German life. 
though these depictions of German valor would have to be increasingly doctored from late 1941 onwards as the German army began to suffer increasing setbacks, and as it did, Goebbels' job increasingly became about managing the expectations of the German people. What was needed from the spring of 1942 onwards was resolve in a war that would not be over soon, and which was almost certainly doomed to end in German defeat. Goebbels was also central to the increasingly barbaric methods being used to persecute the Jews of Germany and occupied Europe. On the 30th of January 1939, Hitler had delivered a speech in the Reichstag, which Goebbels had been involved in writing, in which it was declared that, if Europe was cast into war, the Jewish people would be held responsible by the Nazi state and the annihilation of the Jews of Europe would be undertaken. In the years ahead, this threat was put into action. Following the conquest of Poland, a huge ghetto, largely populated by Poland's considerable Jewish population, was established in Warsaw in October 1939. The following month, Polish Jews were legally required to wear armbands or yellow stars to indicate they were Jews. This stipulation would eventually be imposed in Germany by Goebbels' express order in September 1941, and on the 20th of May 1940, a concentration camp was established at Auschwitz in southern Poland, a place which would become the epicenter of the Holocaust which followed in the years ahead. However, the most terrible moment in the Nazi state's persecution of the Jewish people did not come until 1942. On the 20th of January 1942, at a conference at Wannsee, a Berlin suburb, it was effectively decided by the Nazi party to begin exterminating the Jews of Nazi-occupied Europe. The final solution, as it has become known, resulted in the Holocaust of approximately 6 million Jews between 1942 and the end of the war in 1945. There is no doubting the significance of Goebbels' role in the persecution of Europe's Jews, the development of the final solution, and the Holocaust in general. In a radio address he made on the 16th of November 1941, as a more extreme approach towards the Jews was being developed within the Nazi hierarchy, Goebbels made his views clear. In an outlandish address, he claimed that the Jews were responsible for the war which now enveloped all of Europe and much of the wider world. The Jews, Goebbels asserted, were receiving a penalty that is certainly hard, but more than deserved. Going on, he stated that the Jews must be removed from the German community, for they endanger our national unity. This is an elementary principle of racial, national, and social hygiene. Who cares about their difficulties? There is no doubting that Goebbels' anti-Semitism was extreme by the early 1940s. This manifested itself further in the production of anti-Semitic propaganda films during the war years, such as The Eternal Jew, a film made in 1940 in which Jews were depicted as parasites who were undermining social and political order. These efforts by Goebbels to sway public opinion against the Jews of Germany and Europe was largely responsible for creating an environment in which hundreds of thousands of people were at least partially complicit in the murders of millions of Europe's Jews in the years that followed. Moreover, there is no doubt that he was entirely aware of what was occurring at Auschwitz and the other extermination and labor camps of Eastern and Central Europe. Having received the details of the Wannsee Conference in early March 1942, Goebbels noted in his diary that he assumed about 40% of the Jews in these camps would be put to work producing armaments and other war material. But in a chilling turn of phrase, he stated that the other 60% would almost certainly be liquidated. There is no doubt that Goebbels was one of the central architects of the sustained policy of anti-Semitism in Nazi Germany and in the Holocaust itself. Indeed, as the Jews of Berlin were being deported to concentration camps from the capital in the early summer of 1942, Goebbels urged Hitler to speed up this process. He mused at this time that it might even be better to liquidate them in Berlin itself as this would be more efficient than shipping them to the camps. As the final solution was being developed, German fortunes in the war were declining. In the summer of 1941, Hitler turned his attentions away from Britain and Western Europe towards the east. It was now time, he believed, to confront Bolshevik Russia 
and acquire Lebensraum, or living space for the German people in Eastern Europe. On the 22nd of June 1941, Operation Barbarossa was initiated, and an army of three million Germans invaded Russia. In the weeks that followed, the Soviet Empire in Eastern Europe crumbled as the poorly trained and equipped Russian armies were devastated by the oncoming German forces. By the autumn, the Soviet dictator Joseph Stalin was contemplating negotiating peace terms, whereby the Soviet state would cede much of Eastern Europe to the German Third Reich. But at this point, Hitler's ambitions got the better of him, and envisaging a total victory over Bolshevism, he directed further drives towards the major Russian cities of Leningrad, Moscow, and Stalingrad. This was to be the fatal moment for the Third Reich. As the Russian winter of 1941 set in, the German army's progress eastward slowed, confronted by a Russian army that suffered enormous casualties, but which had a seemingly never-ending stream of manpower, and improperly supplied with winter clothing and arms which could not withstand the Russian winter, the German Wehrmacht began to experience significant setbacks on the Eastern Front. Goebbels became central to these events in many ways. For instance, on the 17th of December 1941, he was placed in charge of the drive in Germany to collect winter clothing, to be sent to the Eastern Front as a matter of urgency. By the spring of 1942, a stalemate had set in on the fronts near Leningrad, Moscow, and Stalingrad, with the latter city experiencing one of the bloodiest and most catastrophic sieges in modern warfare. More and more resources were pumped into Stalingrad as the winter of 1942 neared, and the region became the crucible of war, in which the confrontation between Nazi Germany and Soviet Russia would be decided. When the siege eventually ended in victory for the Soviets in early 1943, the result of the war was sealed. The Russians henceforth were now on the offensive and began the long, inexorable campaign westwards towards Berlin, reconquering on their way all of the lands of Eastern and Central Europe that the Nazis had occupied between 1939 and 1941. This reversal in fortunes for the Third Reich was further compounded in the years ahead, as a southern front was first opened in Italy when a combined British and American force invaded Sicily on the 10th of July 1943, and then a western front was established when the Western Allies invaded France on D-Day on the 6th of June 1944. Goebbels took on an ever more important role in the war effort from 1942 onwards, as these escalating military reverses began. Recent research has highlighted how several members of the Nazi leadership became increasingly incapacitated from 1942 by various illnesses and even drug addiction, particularly so in the case of both Hitler and the head of the Luftwaffe, the German Air Force, Hermann Göring, the latter of whom was heavily addicted to opiates. As Hitler sank into a miasma of delusion about German war prospects and needed ever greater amounts of painkillers to alleviate various ailments, more and more of the day-to-day -day direction of government in Berlin fell on Goebbels' shoulders, particularly as Hitler was increasingly ensconced in a military bunker in Poland. Goebbels was one of the most clear-sighted of the German leadership. Hitler was broadly delusional about the prospects of victory until late in the war, but as early as 1942, Goebbels was aware of the unlikelihood of victory, now that the Russian campaign had stalled in 1941, and the German army was unlikely to win the war on the Eastern Front. This was made clearer in the winter of 1942, when the tide was turned in Russia with German defeat at the Battle of Stalingrad. As a consequence, from the spring of 1943, Goebbels began arguing for what he termed total war, by which he meant that all of the state's resources would be employed to the maximum degree possible to fight the war. At a meeting of the Nazi faithful at the Berlin Sportpalast, a huge sports stadium in the capital, on the 18th of February 1943, Goebbels laid out his belief about what was needed in what has been deemed to be his most famous speech. Germans would have to live a Spartan, exhausting way of life henceforward, Goebbels asserted in his speech, which was broadcast nationally on radio. He argued that Germans would have to work 14 or 16 hour days to keep up the war machine, 
But this was necessary to keep Europe from falling almost entirely under the control of Bolshevik Russia. Having stirred up the thousands of attendees who had been selected for their Nazi credentials, he ended by asking the frenzied crowd, do you want total war? Although Hitler was won over by the idea of total war, he would take until the 23rd of July 1944 before he officially appointed Goebbels as Reich plenipotentiary for the total war effort. This was just three days after a failed attempted coup by senior members of the Wehrmacht, which had sought to assassinate Hitler and end the war. Shocked by the coup effort, Hitler committed himself to Goebbels' extreme plan for total war just days later. With this new position, Goebbels was charged with overseeing the deployment of all parts of society to facilitate the army's efforts. The position was a major confirmation of Goebbels' seniority in the Nazi leadership, with the promotion essentially being an acknowledgement that Goebbels had supplanted Hermann Goering as Hitler's second-in-command of the Nazi party and was now his ostensible successor should he die. Goebbels' efforts to put his ideas on total war into effect in the weeks and months ahead met with mixed results. He focused first on increasing the numbers of men entering the armed forces. The numbers of the rank and file in the German Wehrmacht had fallen drastically in 1942 and 1943, owing to huge casualties on the Eastern Front. And, with the opening of additional fronts by the Allies in France and Italy, the German army was stretched extremely thin by 1944. To combat this, Goebbels increased the age limit to which German women were required to work in German factories, producing war material of all kinds from 45 to 55. This had the benefit of freeing up many men who had been working in the factories for active service on the front. Yet in the end, these measures were not effective. The German state was simply too under-resourced and not possessed of sufficient manpower by 1944, and the additional men who were conscripted into the German army were simply replacing those who were dying or being captured on a daily basis as the Russians advanced from the east and the Americans and the British from the west and the south. Ultimately, total war achieved little other than the further impoverishment of the German people and the conscription of old men and boys into the German army in the last desperate stages of the war in the winter of 1944 and the spring of 1945. Yet Goebbels never wavered. The last of his 218 wartime editorials in Das Reich called for resistance to the very end, even as the Soviet armies closed in on central Berlin. In January 1945, the Soviet forces crossed into eastern Germany and the Americans and British simultaneously advanced into the Rhineland in western Germany. Following a bitter struggle in the Ardennes forest of Belgium and Luxembourg in December 1944 and January 1945, German defeat was clearly just months away, and Hitler and the Nazi leadership were now hoping that a falling out might occur between the English-speaking allies and the Russians, which might work in Germany's favor. This never came. And in the spring of 1945, the only question was whether the Russians advancing from the east or the British and Americans from the west would seize Berlin. Despite these setbacks, Goebbels' commitment to total war never wavered. It was expressed most forcefully in the final weeks of the war in an article in Das Reich magazine published on the 22nd of April 1945 entitled Resistance at Any Price. Here. Goebbels' fanaticism and willingness to let everything in Germany be destroyed in defense of the remnants of the Reich is laid bare. The war has reached a stage at which only the full efforts of the nation and of each individual can save us. The defense of our freedom no longer depends on the army fighting at the front. Each civilian, each man and woman and boy and girl fight with unequaled fanaticism. No village and no city may give in to the enemy. Indeed, perhaps it was his unwavering fanaticism and commitment to the Nazi cause in the final days of the Third Reich which led Hitler to appoint his propaganda minister as his successor when the Führer took the decision to end his life 
on the 30th of April 1945. Goebbels' few hours as head of the German state were a ghastly conclusion to his own life. On the 1st of May, a day after Hitler's suicide, he sent an offer for a ceasefire to General Vasily Chuikov, the head of the Soviet army's assault on Berlin. When this was rejected, he decided to follow his master's example. Later that day, Josef and Magda Goebbels had their six children sedated with morphine before killing their children by force feeding them cyanide. Once they had lost consciousness, Josef and Magda then headed upstairs where they committed suicide themselves in the garden of the Reich Chancellery. Thus died the mastermind of so much of the Nazi party's ideology. Few individuals were as critical in shaping the Third Reich as Josef Goebbels, both prior to the party coming to power and as Reich Minister for Public Enlightenment and Propaganda. In the years ahead, he shaped how the Nazi message was presented to German citizens and the wider world. The visual image we have of the Nazi party as being visually dominated by huge parades with massive Nazi banners in red and black is almost entirely owing to how Goebbels choreographed and designed these events and the public view of the Nazis. From 1939, he was the decisive figure in deciding what information on the war effort was provided to German citizens and how it was presented. He also pushed for an increasingly fanatical all-out war as plenipotentiary for total war. Moreover, he was one of the central individuals in the evolution of the final solution and Holocaust of Europe's Jews. A zealous adherent of Hitler's, Goebbels was perhaps the most clear-sighted of the Nazi leadership about the prospects of German victory in the Second World War, and yet his fanatical adherence to the Führer and the tenets of National Socialism led him to favor dragging Europe to the brink of utter destruction. Given how close his ideology was to Hitler's own, it was perhaps unsurprising that the Führer appointed him as his successor in April 1945. The woman known to history as Magda Goebbels was born on the 11th of November 1901 in the capital of the German Empire, Berlin. Her father was Oskar Ritschel, a prominent building contractor and engineer, and Magda's mother was Augusta Behrendt. Magda's parents were not married when she was born, and although they subsequently did marry each other, the union did not last long and they divorced before Magda was four years old. Consequently, she did not have any siblings growing up and, as we will see, her younger years were considerably disrupted by her parents' divorce at a time when marital separation was still relatively uncommon. Following her parents' divorce in 1905, Magda was quickly packed off in 1906 to Cologne, the city at the heart of Germany's industrial region in the Rhineland in the west of the country. Her father had relocated there for work and her mother seems to have been unable to support Magda and sent their only daughter to live with him there. However, this arrangement too only lasted a brief time, for in 1908 Augusta Behrendt married Richard Friedlander, a member of a family of wealthy Jewish merchants who lived in Berlin and who specialized in leather goods. Richard's family had extensive business connections throughout Western and Central Europe and he had lived primarily in Brussels since the late 1890s. Thus, when he and Magda's mother married in 1908, they relocated to the Belgian capital. Augusta quickly requested that Magda be sent to live with her, a petition which her father assented to. Additionally, Richard Friedlander soon adopted Magda, and she took his name. Thus, the woman who would later become known as the First Lady of the Third Reich grew up with a Jewish surname. However, she was educated at the Ursuline Convent at Fielfurde near Brussels, thus ensuring that she was raised primarily as a Roman Catholic. While some have suggested that later contact with her biological father in Western Germany may have led her to inculcating some Buddhist thought, a peculiarity at a time when Asian religious and philosophical systems were considered a subject of exclusively academic inquiry in Europe, rather than anything one might adopt elements of in their own lives. Magda's youth was once again interrupted in 1914. After years of growing tensions between the great powers of Europe, 
War erupted in the late summer that year, after a regional political crisis in the Balkans escalated into a pan-European war. It soon reached even further afield, and would become known as the First World War. In Europe, it pitted Magda's native Germany, the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the Ottoman Empire, against Britain, France and Russia initially, though the latter would soon be joined by Italy and the United States, tipping the balance against the Central Powers as the alliance led by the governments in Berlin and Vienna became known. Because of their German ethnicity, Magda, her mother and her adopted father were forced to leave Brussels following the outbreak of the war. Belgium had been invaded by Germany just days after the conflict erupted as a way of striking against France without having to go through the extensive French defences in eastern France. As a result, the Friedlanders returned to Berlin, though the marriage did not survive the chaos caused by this latest shift in their affairs. By the end of 1914, Augusta and Ricard had divorced and Magda was once again raised for a time by a single mother. Back in Berlin during the war, Magda became friends with Lisa Arlosarov, a member of a family of Ukrainian Jews who had migrated to Germany in 1905 following an anti-Semitic pogrom against the Jewish community in their part of what was then the Russian Empire. They eventually settled in Berlin and were ordered to stay there or face deportation as Russian-born citizens when the First World War erupted. Through Lisa, Magda would soon meet her brother Chaim, a passionate socialist and Zionist who was increasingly in favour of the idea of the Jewish people returning to the Levant and establishing a new Jewish state in Palestine. As the war was drawing to a conclusion in 1918, and it became clear that the central powers of Germany, Austria, Hungary and the Ottoman Empire would lose, this desire to establish a new Jewish state in a region which had formed part of the Ottoman Empire, but which would now possibly become available for this Zionist project, became more plausible. Eventually, in the course of the late 1910s, Chaim and Magda entered into an intimate relationship further suggesting that Magda was not possessed of the severe anti-Semitic feelings which many Europeans were in the first half of the 20th century. While Magda was seemingly not anti-Semitic, at least not in her youth, many in Germany were, and the loss of the First World War in November 1918 provided a conduit for this anti-Semitic feeling to expand further. As the war came to an end, Germany and many other countries across Europe descended into chaos. In Germany's case, this took the shape of a number of regional insurrections to try to establish communist or ultra-nationalist governments in cities like Berlin and Munich. Many of the latter were suffused with anti-Semitic views, parties such as the German National People's Party and the German Workers' Party. They also wished to overturn the post-war settlement, much of which had been imposed on Germany by the main victors in the war, Britain and France. Far from being magnanimous in victory, the governments in London and Paris had imposed crippling terms on Germany through the Treaty of Versailles, which brought the war between their nations to an end. Not only was Germany stripped of large amounts of territory, primarily in the East, but massive war reparations payments, which would take decades to pay back, were imposed and Germany was further reduced to a second power status by having major restrictions imposed on its military and being forced to accept the occupation of the industrialized Ruhr and Rhineland regions of Western Germany by French and Belgian troops. All of this led to several years of pronounced political unrest in Germany between 1919 and 1923, much of it driven by war veterans disillusioned by events and willing to see Germany's plight being the result of a vast conspiracy perpetuated by an alliance of Jews and communists. Magda was, however, insulated from the unrest, which was striking much of Germany in the early 1920s, for in 1920 she had met Gunther Quandt, a German industrialist. Quandt was nearly twice Magda's age, having been born in 1881, but he was very rich. The Quandt family acquired a number of lucrative contracts to supply the German military with uniforms and other materiel during the war. And once the conflict ended, Gunther had used the capital generated during the mid-1910s to acquire stakes in a number of companies such as BMW, a car manufacturer which was originally founded in 1916 to develop airplane engines for the nascent German Air Force. He and Magda married in 1921 after a short courtship and within a few months a son named Harold was born on the 1st of November 1921. 
It was, though, an ill-fated union. Magda, in her early twenties, soon drifted away from Gunther, who was in his early forties, and often away from home on business. Moreover, Quant had two biological children from his previous marriage and had also adopted three children after a deceased friend had passed. As altruistic as Gunther's actions might have been, Magda resented having to suddenly raise six children while her husband travelled Germany and Europe. Magda and Gunther's marriage continued to deteriorate in the years that followed. By the mid-1920s, she was handing over much of the responsibility for raising the children to their extensive household staff while she engaged in a busy social life. Once the political turmoil of the early 1920s subsided in Germany, Berlin emerged as the cultural capital of the continent and as a smart, well-educated young woman with no financial limitations, Magda was anxious to enjoy what the city had to offer. She was also soon engaged in extramarital affairs, which were relatively easy to cover up while her husband was out of town. The subterfuge could not last forever, though, given her husband's extensive business connections around Berlin. Thus, eventually, in 1928, Gunther learned of one of her relationships with a student nearer her own age. He promptly initiated divorce proceedings. In order to finalize the split quickly in 1929, he agreed to a large financial settlement which effectively meant that Magda became a financially independent and newly divorced young woman at the age of 27. The divorce agreement also stipulated that Magda would raise the only biological child she had with Gunther, Harold, until he was 14 years old in 1935, after which he would be sent to learn the family business under the tutelage of his father. Magda's first marriage was not the only thing which was collapsing in the late 1920s. While Germany's politics had been tortuous back in 1921, when she had married Gunther, it had recovered substantially in the mid-1920s, entering a period of new prosperity and social cohesion, driven by an international economic boom, one which has led economic historians to characterize the 1920s as the Roaring Twenties. As Germany's war reparations payments became manageable, the economy stabilized and people returned to work, the support that groups like the Freikorps and other ultra-nationalist organizations had enjoyed in the immediate aftermath of the First World War dried up. A sign of this was seen in one of the most prominent groups in southern Germany, the National Socialist German Workers' Party, or Nazis. These were founded in the city of Munich in Bavaria back in 1920 and had gained a substantial enough following in the area during the tumultuous years of the early 1920s. However, when they attempted an insurrection to seize control of Munich in November 1923, it failed to ignite popular support and was quickly suppressed. Moreover, when their organization was re-legalized in 1925, they could only ever obtain a minuscule vote in German national elections. The days of extremist politics seemed to have left post-war Germany. 1929 changed all of that. Right around the time that Magda's divorce from Quant was finalized, the economic boom of the 1920s came to a crashing halt as the stock markets on Wall Street in New York City were hammered throughout the autumn. Within weeks, a seismic ripple was spreading across the Americas and Europe as economies were shaken to their core. The Great Depression, a period of several years in the early 1930s when tens of millions of people lost their jobs, their life savings and their economic prospects, followed. Germany, which still had its massive war reparations payments to contend with, was particularly badly impacted, and as the economic damage spread, Germans began once again turning to the extremist politicians they had once viewed as plausible contenders for power ten years earlier. Incredibly, when new Reichstag elections were held in September 1930, the Nazis increased their share of the national vote from just over 2.5% in 1928 to over 18%, making them the second largest political party in Germany. By 1931, they were growing to unprecedented heights, and every German seemed to be considering joining the Nazis or attending a party rally to see what their leader, Adolf Hitler, had to say about Germany's plight. Magda was an early convert to this new political party. She had begun taking an interest in the Nazis in the summer of 1930, attending meetings in Berlin. It was here that she first heard Joseph Goebbels, the head of the propaganda wing of the party and the regional leader of the Nazis in Berlin, 
for several years, speak at an event. She was evidently taken by his gifts as an orator and began volunteering at Goebbels' office in the capital. Under an entry for the 7th of November 1930, Goebbels noted in his diary that Magda was reorganizing his papers in his office. He had clearly taken a liking to her, and they began casually seeing each other, but this does not appear to have turned into a committed courtship until February 1931, while talks of their possible marriage had begun by the late spring. That Easter, they visited Hitler in Bavaria, while Joseph started to try to cultivate a relationship with Magda's son from her marriage to Quant, Harold. As their courtship developed that summer, Magda's large apartment in Berlin even became a meeting point for some of the higher-ranking members of the Nazi party, with Hitler visiting there on occasion. It was the beginning of her entry into the world of the party, which would soon come to dominate Germany. Magda and Joseph's relationship was certainly not without its problems. As early as April 1931, ominous signs were developing. They argued regularly from the very earliest days of knowing each other. A familiar pattern emerged in this. Magda would go missing for a while, not returning his calls as she visited friends or was otherwise indisposed. Then Goebbels would become incredibly jealous and controlling. All of this was compounded as he became aware of the fact that her first marriage had come to an end on the back of Magda's infidelities. He would find it difficult in the months that followed to overlook this, and matters were not helped by the fact that Hitler himself seemed to have taken an interest in Magda after meeting her on several occasions. How much of this was real, and how much of it was Goebbels imagining, is hard to say, but the relationship continued to be strained into the autumn of 1931, with his jealous outbursts creating tension. Yet these episodes were punctuated by weeks in which everything went smoothly, and in September they determined to move the date of their proposed marriage closer. Part of the reason for this, as biographers of Goebbels have noted, was that a peculiar arrangement was developing whereby Hitler was as anxious to have his propaganda chief and Magda marry as Joseph or Magda themselves were. For Hitler, whose sexual relationships were always of a peculiar nature, the couple would act as a kind of alternative first family within the Nazi hierarchy, removing the necessity of him marrying any time soon himself. Whatever the exact reasons for all this, we do know for sure that Magda and Joseph determined to marry sooner rather than later that autumn and moved the date forward to December 1931. Magda personally asked Hitler to act as the witness at their wedding, to which he agreed. Despite all this, several blazing arguments occurred between her and Joseph in the late autumn, one brought on by Joseph's discovery that Magda had been born out of wedlock an issue which still carried a significant social stigma in the 1930s. On another occasion, Joseph was introduced to Magda's ex-husband Gunther Quandt, who had also decided to join the Nazis in the early 1930s, and whose business dealings would benefit enormously from becoming a member of the party in years to come. Goebbels expected to dislike him, but was surprised not to. Instead, a few days later, it was a few ill-thought-out words between he and Magda which triggered yet another argument. One would think that the signs were clear that the marriage should not go ahead, but Hitler wished for them to marry, and by the early winter, Magda knew that she was pregnant, and so it was that on the 19th of December, Magda and Joseph Goebbels were married at a Quant family estate, which Magda had acquired the use of in her divorce settlement in Severin in Mecklenburg. Hitler acted as a witness, with Goebbels' sister Maria acting as a bridesmaid, Married life would prove just as tempestuous as their courtship and engagement had been. Magda and Joseph were married just as the Nazis were nearing the precipice of power in Germany. The party membership had continued to grow exponentially in 1931 and into 1932, but without fresh Reichstag elections, its new popularity could not be translated into dominance of the political system. That opportunity finally presented itself in July 1932, when new national elections were held. In these, the Nazis emerged as the largest party in the country, garnering 37% of the vote and winning 230 seats in the Reichstag. Still, the centrist parties tried to prevent their rise to power, cobbling together a minority government of technocrats. However, this could not function effectively 
and as the economic situation continued to deteriorate, an impasse was reached by the start of 1933. That January, an agreement was struck amongst elements of the centre-right of the political establishment whereby Hitler would become Chancellor of Germany and several ministerial briefs would be granted to senior Nazi political figures. The idea was for a broad coalition to try to temper and control the Nazis in government, but this proved farcical. Within weeks, Hitler, Goebbels and others monopolized power in the hands of the Nazis by engineering an artificial political emergency and using it as the basis for the passage of laws allowing them to rule by decree. By the summer of 1933, the German Republic was effectively dead, and in its place, a one-party fascist state ruled by the Nazis had emerged. The ascent of the Nazis to power in the first months of 1933 completely changed the dynamics of Magda's life. In mid-March, Joseph was appointed as Minister for Public Enlightenment and Propaganda, he was now in charge of a vast array of aspects of German life. At its heart, the ministry's goal was to indoctrinate the German people into the ideology of Nazism, with its goals of reaching back to a mythical time when the German people had been pure and immensely powerful. In order to do this, Goebbels and his officials were determined to highlight that Nazism's success was confronted by many enemies, particularly the Jewish people and the Communists, who were in league with each other to try to destroy Germany. Through the Ministry of Public Enlightenment and Propaganda, Goebbels would deploy everything from radio broadcasts and films in the cinema to posters and newspaper slogans in the years ahead to try to mould the German people into Nazism's image, uniting the nation for a coming war of revenge for what had happened in the First World War. This position made Goebbels one of the most powerful figures in Germany overnight, and Magda became an influential figure herself within Berlin society as a consequence. While her husband was running the propaganda wing of the Nazi state, Magda became something of a poster woman for Nazi ideology towards women. This was backward-looking. It argued that the place of German women was in the home, raising the Aryan soldiers for the wars to come to ensure German domination of Europe. Thus, for instance, German women were precluded from working in certain sectors of society such as higher education from the mid-1930s onwards, and this was gradually expanded in the years that followed to include senior roles within the medical field, nursing excluded, and within politics. Admittedly, though, it should be noted that this was hardly unique in Western society at the time, and many supposedly developed countries still did not even allow women to vote in the 1930s. However, there is no doubting that the Nazis had a regressive attitude towards women's rights. Instead of working, the idealized Nazi German woman should focus her energies on being a wife and mother, and facilitating her children's education and her husband's career. Magda was prominent in promoting this ideal. Shortly after the Nazis seized power, she stated, quote, German women were excluded from three professions, the army, as elsewhere in the world, the government and the judiciary. If a German girl must choose between marriage or a career, she will always be encouraged to marry because that is what is best for a woman. Thus, Mrs. Goebbels became a figurehead of Nazi ideological attitudes towards women from early on in the regime's time in power. She was also considerably involved in the National Socialist Women's League. This was established in October 1931 in response to claims that the Nazis did not appeal enough to female voters. However, once the party seized power, it evolved into an instrument to promote Nazi ideological ideas concerning women's role in society. It fostered the Nazi ideological view of women and organized lectures and events to promote these. Magda appeared at many events of the League as the figurehead of the Nazi female leadership. The League also published a magazine, the National Socialist Women's Monitor, which bizarrely interspersed articles offering advice to German women on housekeeping and motherhood with pieces designed to promote the idea of Germany acquiring new lands in Eastern Europe and the development of a greater Germany. Magda Goebbels featured in several issues over the years. Overall, the reach of the League was extensive, with over two million German women being members by the late 1930s and with the National Socialist Women's Monitor having a circulation of 1.9 million copies by that time. 
All of this amounted to Magda becoming a kind of pseudo-First Lady of the Third Reich during the 1930s. Many of the senior members of the Nazi regime were either not married or had home lives which did not lend themselves well to being under the public gaze. Hitler himself was a bachelor. From the time that he became Chancellor of Germany, he was involved in an increasingly committed relationship with a photographer named Eva Braun, but the relationship was strained in its own way. Braun was over 20 years younger than the Nazi leader, and she had attempted suicide at least once early on in their courtship. As such, Hitler determined not to marry her during the 1930s, and they did not have children. In the face of this, Magda was often conceived of by German society at the time as a kind of surrogate first lady, and indeed by the late 1930s, she was the recipient of a steady stream of correspondence from women all over Germany, petitioning her on a range of matters in much the same way in which a first lady would often be within other countries. This impression of Magda was also partly driven by the prominence which she had as a mother within the regime. The Goebbels ended up having six children in the first nine years of their marriage. Magda had already been pregnant when she and Joseph were wed, and in 1932 she gave birth to their first child, a daughter named Helga. Five more children followed, one son and four more daughters. These were Hildegard in 1934, Helmut in 1935, Holdina in 1937, Hedwig in 1938, and finally Heidrun in 1940. Each child's name started with an H, and it has been speculated, probably with complete accuracy, that Magda and Joseph elected to adopt this convention in an act of sycophancy towards Hitler, whose name started with H. As they grew up, the Goebbels' children became surrogate first children within the Third Reich, in much the same way that Magda had become a pseudo-first lady in the absence of Hitler being married. Already by 1937, Helga and Hildegard, the two eldest of their children, were being photographed at Nazi party events and this tendency only increased over the years. Often it had a deeply sinister edge. For instance, in 1939, Joseph Goebbels filmed his children in a playful family scene which was subsequently used in a Nazi propaganda video to promote the idea that handicapped or disabled children should be euthanized. Later, when the Nazis enveloped Europe in war, the Goebbels children were used dozens of times per year in films and photo opportunities to show how normal life was continuing in Germany despite the conflict in France and Eastern Europe. Throughout these years, as they were rising to become the face of Nazi family values, Joseph and Magda were also benefiting financially from his rise to power. On top of his ministerial salary and other prerequisites, Goebbels received an extensive allowance from the Nazi party which Hitler had personally sanctioned. This allowed them to finance the purchase of a large mansion in the exclusive suburb of Wannsee outside Berlin. By 1936, a motorboat, a Mercedes sports car and a limousine had been added to the mix. Then, Joseph sold the future contract rights to publish his extensive diaries to the Nazi party's publishing house, Air Verlag. The contract stipulated these would be published 20 years after his death, in return for which Goebbels received a one-off payment of 250,000 Reichsmarks and 100,000 marks every year thereafter. With all of this newfound wealth, Magda was able to begin ostentatiously decorating the villa in Wannsee and the house became the scene of many lavish parties held for the Nazi top brass in the capital from the mid-1930s onwards. A summer home on the riverine island of Schwanenwerder, not far from Berlin, was also acquired, while in addition, Joseph acquired a smaller house in the capital. In time, other homes were acquired elsewhere across Germany. The family needed for nothing when it came to their children and enjoyed the robust trappings of wealth which Joseph's position afforded them following the Nazis' seizure of power. Yet all was not marital bliss. The primary reason why Joseph obtained a second house in Berlin was to use it for his very many extramarital affairs, a large number of which were with the actresses who were employed in his propaganda films. One in particular became a cause of scandal. In 1937, Joseph began seeing Lida Barova, a Czech actress who had moved to Berlin a few years earlier. By this time, the fights which had punctuated the Goebbels' relationship at regular intervals from before they were ever even married had begun to weigh on both parties, 
and often when he was home from his admittedly extensive work commitments, he and Magda would sit in silence rather than risk the possibility of a new argument. Magda was not innocent herself in any of this and she had also had an affair with a zealous Nazi, Kurt Ludeker, in 1933, before he fled Germany shortly afterwards, having come under suspicion by the party for his links to the leadership of the SA. The paramilitary wing of the Nazis, whose top figures were purged in 1934. These affairs were problematic, but when Joseph started seeing Barova, he went so far as to be seen in public with her. For one of the country's senior ministers, it wasn't long before word of this got around, and Magda became aware of what was happening. When she did, she turned to Hitler for help, and on the 15th of August 1938, met with him to discuss the situation at length. The following day, the Führer had a meeting with Joseph, whereat he demanded that he end the affair. But, in a rare act of defiance, Goebbels didn't do so, despite agreeing to. Things only became more strained thereafter. When Kurt Hanke, one of Goebbels' senior staff members, became caught up in the quarrel between his superior and his wife, Magda and he ended up having a brief affair themselves. By the late autumn, Hitler had decided to make a dramatic intervention. He effectively put Hanke on leave and sent him away from Berlin. While he had the secret police, including the Gestapo, start following Barova constantly around the capital. By the end of the early winter, she was so disturbed by this that she stopped making public appearances and fled back to Prague a few weeks later. To smooth over public opinion, a family photo of the Goebbels and their children, with Hitler standing between Magda and Joseph, was taken in October 1938 and widely distributed. The idea was clear. The perfect first family was healed once again, but the reality was far different. From the winter of 1938 onwards, Magda and Joseph were increasingly distant from one another. He was often away from Berlin for work, and when he was there, she often retreated to various houses, which they had acquired elsewhere in Germany, or to rural spas to recuperate from a number of serious health problems which were plaguing her, not least owing to the stress of six pregnancies in less than ten years. Thus, while the scandal of Joseph's relationship with Barova had abated, Magda's marriage to Joseph could never be said to have been a happy one thereafter, not that it ever had been, although the public image said otherwise. While Magda and Joseph's relationship was declining to new lows, Nazi Germany was beginning an inexorable drift towards war. A war of revenge to reverse the outcome of the First World War was always a central aim of the Nazis from the very inception of their movement in the early 1920s. Once they seized power in 1933, they began preparing for this eventuality. Firstly, the country began to remilitarize extensively from early 1935 onwards, when Hitler and other senior figures within the German armed forces, the Wehrmacht, made it clear that they intended to begin conscripting in the region of half a million soldiers. This was a clear and egregious breach of the terms of the Treaty of Versailles, which had brought the First World War to an end, and which stipulated that Germany henceforth was to restrict its armed forces to 100,000 men. Additionally, Hermann Goering announced the creation of a new air force known as the Luftwaffe, which was also a direct violation of the Treaty of Versailles. Finally, in the spring of 1936, the German armed forces moved into the Rhineland, which had been demilitarized since the mid-1920s when French and Belgian occupying forces had left the region. By this time, Hitler and his closest allies, such as Goebbels, were beginning to consider that they might bring forward the proposed start date of a new European war from the early 1940s to sometime in the late 1930s. The spring of 1938 witnessed a rapid escalation of the aggressive Nazi foreign policy, part of Nazi ideology centered on the creation of a greater Germany, one which would necessarily include the German-speaking and ethnically German peoples of Austria and parts of Czechoslovakia and Poland. Indeed, as soon as the Nazis had seized power in Berlin in 1933, they had begun actively seeking to overthrow the far-right Austrian nationalist regime in Austria. Eventually, this culminated in a campaign of massive public pressure on Austria in the spring of 1938, aimed at forcing the government in Vienna into accepting a union with Germany. Magda would have been preoccupied by this, as Joseph's work in late 1937 and into 1938 
focused increasingly on leading the propaganda drive to accept the Anschluss, or union, of the two countries, one which was finally completed in March 1938, when German tanks rolled into Vienna and succeeded in bloodlessly forcing through a referendum on the matter. In the months that followed, propaganda efforts switched to the Sudetenland region of Czechoslovakia, a region in the west of the country where the majority of people were German-speaking. When an international conference was convened in Munich that September to decide on the fate of the Sudetenland, Joseph and Magda remained in Berlin. But Joseph's wave of propaganda videos released from the capital as Hitler was overseeing the conference did much to galvanize public opinion in support of the annexation of Sudetenland. A few days later, the British and French capitulated as Germany continued to expand to dominate Central Europe without ever firing a shot. In the weeks that followed the Munich Conference and the annexation of the Sudetenland, Magda was privy to Joseph writing a new book rapidly. The proposed title was Adolf Hitler, A Man Who Is Making History, and the propaganda minister intended for it to be published in 1939, but it was blocked, presumably by Hitler himself, who did not wish for it to appear. While Magda would have been surprised to see her husband's efforts in this respect frustrated, there was no doubt that Hitler was to go on to make history in all the wrong ways in 1939. Unsatisfied with the Sudetenland, the Nazis effectively invaded Czechoslovakia in the spring of that year and carved it up into different occupied territories which effectively became part of the growing Third Reich. By now, Britain and France, who had insisted at Munich that there could be no further land concessions to Germany, were beginning to rearm in preparation for a war with the Nazis which was now inevitable. They did not launch it following the annexation of Czechoslovakia, but when the familiar claims on a neighbor's territories emerged in the weeks that followed concerning Poland, both London and Paris made it clear that any breach of the Eastern European nation's sovereignty would also effectively be a declaration of war by Berlin on the Western European nations. Thus, when Hitler ordered the German military over the eastern border into Poland on the 1st of September 1939, Britain and France responded by declaring war on Germany two days later. The Second World War had commenced. Magda and Joseph continued to benefit from their close relationship with Hitler in the early stages of the war. Joseph's propaganda was especially necessary on the home front in 1939 and 1940, as the Nazi regime sought to galvanize the German people in support of the war effort and depict Germany's enemies as constituting an existential threat, and in some strange way, the aggressor in the conflict. Magda was happy to make public appearances in line with the continuing perception of her as the leading female figure within the regime. Her and Joseph's marriage remained icy throughout this period. Following Hitler's intervention during the crisis of 1938, the marriage developed largely into one of convenience. By 1940, they had six children together. Both benefited enormously from a material standpoint from being in the Führer's good graces, and once they accepted that Hitler would not tolerate any further public infidelities or any possibility of them divorcing each other, the pair accepted a kind of muted marriage arrangement. Indeed, in Joseph's diaries, there is a marked decline in the references to arguments and fights between himself and Magda from the late 1930s onwards. Thus, once both accepted the situation, a curious calm seems to have settled over the relationship, one which had never been there previously, even during their courtship. While Magda's marriage to Joseph continued to oscillate between periods of stability and major tension, Germany's fortunes in the war, which it had cast Europe into in the autumn of 1939, could not have been more positive. Poland had been quickly overrun and conquered in the course of September and early October 1939. Thereafter, the Nazis had prepared for a swift conquest of Western Europe in 1940, but even Hitler was surprised at the speed with which his tank divisions and land troops were able to conquer the Low Countries and France in May and June of 1940. Denmark and Norway had already been swiftly occupied through targeted military operations in the spring, so that by the late summer of 1940, only Britain stood against Nazi Germany in Europe. It too might have been conquered if the Nazis had continued with their air and naval bombardment of the country, which was initiated in the autumn of that year. But early in 1941, 
Hitler became determined to switch his attentions eastwards and initiate a war with Nazism's great ideological enemy, the Bolshevik Communists of the Soviet Union. In the summer of 1941, Operation Barbarossa, the largest land invasion in military history involving three million German soldiers, commenced, and it proved enormously successful to begin with. By the early winter of 1941, German divisions had advanced to near Moscow and Leningrad. There was now a real possibility that the war would end in Nazi domination of the continent of Europe. As all of this was occurring, Magda took on a leading role as a symbol of how Nazi women at home in Germany should behave while their husbands and sons were fighting on the fronts or leading the war effort from military headquarters elsewhere. For instance, she trained as a Red Cross nurse shortly after the war began and appeared in many photo opportunities in the months that followed to emphasize this role. Much was also made of the fact that her eldest child, her son Harold, from the marriage to Gunther Quandt, was serving as a pilot in the Luftwaffe. Moreover, because Hitler was not married to his partner, Eva Braun, and it was consequently not appropriate, given the standards of the time, for her to entertain visiting dignitaries and heads of state and their wives, the responsibility for doing so often fell to Magda and the Goebbels. This was a time-consuming endeavor in the early 1940s as the new heads of puppet regimes and vassal states which had been created across Europe were required to travel to Berlin and bend the knee, figuratively speaking, to the Nazi leaders in the capital of the Reich. A much more controversial issue concerned the Nazi state's changing attitudes towards the Reich's Jewish population and how Magda responded to this. When the Nazis seized power in 1933, there were approximately half a million Jews living in Germany. This was a relatively small percentage of the overall population, and the favoured policy of the party during the remainder of the 1930s was to make life as uncomfortable as possible for these 500,000 German Jews, with the ultimate goal of forcing them to leave the country. Thus, under the Nuremberg Laws, Jews in Germany were broadly robbed of their citizenship and an immense amount of rights, Pogroms followed, and violence and indiscriminate arrests of Jews in the country were escalating massively in 1938 and 1939. And then, things went even further. A huge proportion of Europe's Jews lived in Poland in the 1930s, over three million. Consequently, after the annexation of Poland in the opening months of the war, more extreme attitudes began to develop, and by the summer of 1941, it had been decided by Hitler and others that a policy of mass murder or genocide would be initiated. Millions of Jews from across the Reich were to be detained and transported to a series of death camps in Poland and surrounding regions, and there they would be gassed to death. The Holocaust of Europe's Jews would eventually result in the death of approximately six million people. As the wife of one of the most senior figures within the Nazi regime, Magda cannot but have been aware of what was now unfolding in Poland and elsewhere. There is a striking element to all of this when we consider her background. Magda had been raised for several years in her youth as an adopted daughter of Richard Friedlander, while she had also briefly dated Chaim Arlotharov, a leading Jewish Zionist in her youth. She seems not to have been possessed of any anti-Semitic feeling herself, and once, when asked about the persecution of the Jewish people by the Nazi regime, she simply stated that it was Hitler's wish and that her husband had to go along with it, although this was a complete distortion of Joseph Goebbels' own committed anti-Semitism. But what is striking is that Magda did very little to intervene to save the lives of any Jewish people she had known. She might possibly have provided anonymous aid to the Franks family, who had themselves provided help to Magda and her mother way back in 1914 when they were travelling to Berlin from Brussels after they had been deported from Belgium at the start of the First World War. But for her former adoptive father, Richard Friedlander, she did nothing. She had ceased to have any contact with him years earlier. He was eventually arrested and is believed to have perished in a Nazi concentration camp in 1939. In many ways, the Holocaust was initiated because the Nazis had come to believe that victory in the war was now inevitable. The endless succession of striking military victories, which occurred between September 1939 and the autumn of 1941, had convinced Hitler and his acolytes that they would soon be triumphant across Europe. Then they would have no one to answer to for their genocidal approach to the Jews. 
But this hubris was soon countered. Even as the final plans for the Holocaust were being put in place, the war in Russia was beginning to turn against the Germans. That winter, the Nazi armies failed to take Moscow and Leningrad, and slowly the full might of the Soviet Union was mobilized against the German invasion. In tandem, the United States entered the war on the side of Britain and the Soviet Union in December 1941, following an unprovoked attack on the American Pacific Fleet at Pearl Harbor in Hawaii by Nazi Germany's ally, the Empire of Japan. Faced with this combined alliance, the war effort began to turn in 1942, and by early 1943 had shifted dramatically. That spring and summer, the Russians turned the tide and started pushing the Germans back into Ukraine and Poland, while the Western Allies opened a southern front in Sicily after winning the battle for control of North Africa. Moreover, the United States had agreed that victory over Nazi Germany in Europe would take priority over the campaign in the Pacific against the Empire of Japan. It was all very ominous for the Nazi regime. As this succession of reverses occurred from the winter of 1941 onwards, Magda's relationship with Hitler and the Nazi cause in general entered a period of contradictory fluxes. On the one hand, for her, as for so many others in Germany, the sheen of invincibility that had once surrounded the Führer and the Nazi mission in the early stages of the war had very much been tarnished. The best efforts of her husband's propaganda machine aside, on more than one occasion, she was seen to be openly dismissive of Hitler's views and statements while at social events in Berlin. While in 1944, she was willing to state in public that the Nazi leader had become delusional in many of his views on the war. A dangerous statement to make in public in an authoritarian state where secret police were everywhere. But by then, Magda had her reasons for some personal bitterness at the war situation. Her eldest child from her first marriage, Harold, had been captured while fighting against the Allied invasion of Italy and was being held in a prisoner of war camp from which he would not be released until 1947. Magda would never see him again. Yet in stark contrast to these more negative sentiments were occasions on which Magda could display a zealous commitment to the Nazi cause. When Joseph gave a famous speech at the Sportpalast in Berlin, on the 18th of February 1943, in which he had whipped up the crowd and asked them fervently if they wanted total war, Magda dutifully attended with their two eldest children, Helga and Hildegard. Moreover, whatever her misgivings in private might have been, she continued to visit Hitler regularly when he was in Berlin and remained one of his closest female confidants. All in all, her response to the declining war situation and towards Hitler was changeable and difficult to decipher. If Magda did have a growing disillusionment with Hitler, then it was not unfounded. By 1944, the Führer was an increasingly delusional figure, one who rejected the sound strategic thinking of many of his generals in favor of dubious military strategies he favored himself. He continued to cling to the ideological belief that the Western Allies would soon have a major falling out with the Soviet leader Joseph Stalin and his ministers. Once this occurred, Hitler reasoned, Britain and the US would find common cause against the Bolsheviks and Communists of the Soviet Union. This never occurred. Instead, in the summer of 1944, the Western Allies finally opened a Western Front in northern France, which Stalin had long requested them to do, in order to draw German forces away from Eastern Europe, with three fronts now operating on the continent, one in Eastern Europe, one in Italy, and one in France, the Nazis began to rapidly relinquish control of the lands they had conquered since 1939. By the spring of 1945, the British, Americans, Canadians and French were spreading out across western Germany, occupying the Rhineland. But it was the Russians, who had moved over the River Elbe in northeastern Germany, which were the more pressing issue for families like the Goebbels. In the late spring of 1945, having surrounded Berlin, they began the last battle to take the German capital. Many senior Nazis contemplated fleeing Berlin at this point, but Magda and Joseph Goebbels ensconced themselves in the center of the city with Hitler. As the Allies entered Germany, the Goebbels had removed their children from one of their country estates to Schwanenwerder Villa outside Berlin. From there, the sound of artillery and bombings could soon be heard far off in the distance 
and the children were brought into Berlin itself. On the 22nd of April, as the Red Army was massing around Berlin and entering the main suburbs, the six children were brought to the Führerbunker in the center of the city, a bunker below the Reich Chancellery. This was effectively the command center of what was left of the Third Reich. Hitler and his main staff had moved in here in January 1945. By late April, it had become a desperate place where a somber Hitler received final visits from some of the most senior Nazi party members. In many instances, he merely dismissed them, asserting that they had failed him. However, the Goebbels were not amongst these. Zealously, Magda and Joseph were to remain here underground in central Berlin with the Führer until the very end. For his loyalty, Hitler changed the order of succession in a completely futile gesture, appointing Goebbels as his successor and renouncing Hermann Goering, who it had long been understood would succeed should Hitler die. What followed in the last days of April and the 1st of May are relatively well known in the broad sense, but why they occurred with regard to the Goebbels family is perhaps less understood. Hitler had determined to take his own life rather than falling into the hands of the Soviet Union. Joseph Goebbels seemingly had a similar view, and in a cryptic message he had broadcast on German radio in late February 1945, he seems to have alluded to the idea that his children's lives would not be worth living if the Nazi cause perished. On the 15th of April, as the noose tightened on Berlin, he had published an article in the paper Das Reich, in which he again questioned if life would be worth living when the Third Reich finally fell. Thus, it appears that for months leading up to the siege of Berlin, Joseph had been contemplating the possibility of suicide if the miracle of a falling out between the Allies did not occur and the Nazi regime was completely defeated. Whether he had discussed this or not with Magda is also unknown, but she herself seemingly alluded to plans to commit suicide and for her and Joseph to kill their children in the process in the final weeks of the war. Moreover, when several senior figures within the regime offered to help smuggle the children out of Berlin, Magda refused all offers. All of this suggests a plan which, while it might not have been entirely committed to, was at least premeditated and thought out as a possible option if the worst should happen. Whatever the motives or the background might have been, we do know precisely what did occur. As artillery bombardments were heard ever closer to central Berlin and as the Führerbunker began to shake from explosions above, Hitler decided to marry his long-term partner Eva Braun on the night of the 29th of April. The following day, the Nazi leader and his bride committed suicide. For a brief time, Magda's husband now became the leader of the Third Reich as German Chancellor. His tenure of that office is really remembered for only one event in which Magda was the central protagonist. On the 1st of May, the six Goebbels children, Helga, who was 12 years old, Hildegard, who was 11, nine-year-old Helmut, eight-year-old Holdina, and Hedwig and Heidelin, who were just six and four years old respectively, were killed. Exactly how this occurred has been a matter of extensive debate. Some accounts later held that an SS dentist, Helmut Krunz, injected each of the children with morphine and that cyanide capsules were then crushed in their mouths once they had lost consciousness. Others suggest that Hitler's physician in his last weeks, Ludwig Stumpfegger, gave the children morphine or some other sedative in sweetened drinks, and they were then killed once this had an effect. But what is usually agreed is that it was Magda Goebbels who killed six of her seven children on the 1st of May 1945, most likely by administering cyanide herself. Thereafter, Magda and Joseph proceeded upstairs to the garden of the Reich Chancellery where they committed suicide. They appear to have swallowed cyanide pills and left orders with the SS guards with them that once the poison started to take effect, they were to shoot them, repeatedly if necessary. Their bodies were then doused in petrol and set alight. Just a day later, Soviet troops entered the Reich Chancellery and found the charred remains of Magda and her husband still lying in the garden. The SS members there had apparently ignored orders to bury their remains once they had burned their corpses. The surface of the Reich Chancellery building was secured that afternoon, and so it was not until the 3rd of May that Russian troops went down into the Führerbunker and discovered the six children lying dead in their beds, dressed in their nightclothes with ribbons in their hair. 
their bodies were taken away for autopsy. It remains unclear to this day where or if they were buried by the Soviet authorities. The location of the remains of Magda and Joseph is also unknown. They, like those of several others from the bunker, were buried and exhumed again, several times over in the months that followed, as the Soviet leader Joseph Stalin appears to have changed his mind repeatedly about what should be done with them. As with their children, it is unclear where the remains of Magda and Joseph were buried or their final ashes deposited. Magda Goebbels was one of the most prominent figures involved in the Nazi regime. Having become interested in the party in 1930, in the aftermath of her first divorce, she quickly became involved with Joseph Goebbels and by 1931 was considering marriage to him. But the relationship was tempestuous from the beginning, and when they married in December of that year, it seemed as much at the behest of Hitler than out of any real desire to wed. The rise of the Nazis to power brought social status and wealth. Outwardly to German society, the Goebbels were the epitome of the perfect German family in the new Germany, with their brood of Aryan children and seemingly picture-perfect life. Furthermore, in the absence of Hitler having a wife, Magda became a surrogate first lady, appearing regularly in Nazi propaganda, often with her children. But behind the facade was a deeply troubled marriage, one in which both Magda and Joseph engaged in a string of affairs. When one of these became a potential source of scandal in 1938, Hitler intervened and made it clear that divorce was out of the question. In that sense, it was an unusual poster first family. Magda's ideological approach to Nazism was just as contradictory. Here was a woman who had been partially raised by an adoptive Jewish father, who had dated a Jewish man in her youth, and who was clearly not possessed of much anti-Semitism, who in the 1930s nevertheless became the unofficial first lady of the most anti-Semitic government to ever exist. Her attitude towards Hitler and the war could be similarly ambivalent, criticizing the Führer in front of friends, but acting as one of his closest female confidants at the same time. But most inexplicable of all was the perverse loyalty she displayed towards Hitler in the final days of the conflict. Rather than escaping with her six children from Berlin, which she could have done, she elected to bring them to Hitler's bunker, and on the 1st of May, the day after Hitler committed suicide, Magda Goebbels murdered her six children aged between 12 and 4 years of age before she and Joseph killed themselves. For Joseph, there can have been no hope of any fate other than arrest, trial and execution in the aftermath of the war. But Magda would have probably escaped with a few years in jail, while her children were not guilty of any crimes. As such, her heinous act at the last moment was born not of necessity but out of the fanatical and inexplicable loyalty which so many Germans developed towards Hitler and the Nazi cause. What do you think of Magda Goebbels? How can the contradictions in her personality and her decision to kill her own children be explained? Please let us know in the comment section and in the meantime, thank you very much for watching.